speaking for us heathens to love freedom one reason my guns clean and i read books take a deep look into history they don't teach us the evidence is being purged from libraries so lies carry more weight they try to hide the core strength people living without the trivium unaware of the gift their ancestors have given them it's been hidden but to get the facts you know you gotta get your whip hat and coat and dig like indiana jones Before you can take the power back i don't know where the power's where at, the power at? tragedy and hope before you can take the power back i don't know where the power's where at, the power at? Tragedy and hope, MK Ultra. Something maybe we might should know about. Building seven. Something maybe we might should know about. John O'Neill. Something maybe we might should know the about. The Israeli. Something maybe we might should know about. USS Liberty. Something maybe we might should know about. Four Agreement. Something maybe we might should know about. Bohemian Grove. Something maybe we might should know British about. British East India Company. Something maybe we might should know about. Operation Mocking. Something maybe we might should know about. Operation Paper. Something maybe we might should know about Ruby Ridge. Something maybe we might should know the about Opium Wars. Something maybe we might should know about Before you can take the power back. I don't know where the power's where at. Power at. Tragedy and hope. Before you can take the power back, I don't know where the power's where at. The power at. Tragedy and hope. G. Edward Griffin. Rock, rock on. Rock on. Anthony Sutton. Rock, rock on. Rock on. Frederick Bastia. Rock, rock on. Rock on. Richard Grove, rock, rock on. rock on. James Corbett, rock, rock on. Rock on. Gary Webb, rock, rock on. rock on. John Taylor Gatto, rock, rock on. Rock on. Gary Besmanov, rock, rock on. Rock on. Eustace Mullins, rock, rock on. Rock on. Alexander Solzhenitsyn, rock, rock on. Rock on. General Smedley Butler, rock, rock on. Rock on. Carol Quigley, rock, rock on. Rock on. Before you can take the power back, I don't know where the power's where at. The power at. Tragedy and hope. Before you can take the power back, I don't know where the power's where at. The power at. Tragedy and hope. Welcome, Truth Seeker. It's not easy to discern truth from fiction on Holodeck Earth. Grand Theft World is a fire hose of illumination and inspires the hearts and minds of truthers seeking freedom in a world environment of manipulation and control. Richard Grove and Tony Myers take a deep dive into the people, places, and events that have shaped our world through a lens of critical thinking to polish the gems and sort the chaff to reveal the true machinations behind world events. Piece by piece, podcast by podcast, a portrait of reality emerges that we can use to take educated action in the fight for consciousness, truth, and freedom. Grand Theft World episodes include clips from the brightest and best podcasters and articles every week. A weekly special guest brings their expertise and knowledge. Join the vibrant GTW community of researchers and like-minded peers to collaborate on solutions and how we can truly create change. Take your first step on this adventure. Join now. Welcome to the Grand Theft World podcast, hosted and sponsored by the members over at GrandTheftWorld.com. This week in Grand Theft World news history, it is with a heavy heart that I have to report to you that Jacob Rothschild has left the building, as they say. And though he has left the building, he has left, or his family has left, uh, a, a terrible mess in the Middle East. And we're going to learn how his great uncle, penned 67 words that later became British official policy, giving away land that they didn't have to other people who moved there that caused a big ruckus. And we're going to continue to look into that tonight. But hearing Jacob Rothschild explain his family's history is something that I've often pointed out ever since the centennial in 2017 of the Balfour Declaration. You can go to Balfour100.com. You can see the five drafts, which start with Lord Rothschild's draft of what he wants, how they approved it and sent it back to him. And then you can see how those 67 words in 
history were created because there's a there's a video there and i've tried to get people to watch this video for years and years and years and only this past week has the world really taken notice of hey they they started it and there's a lot of evidence to that and it's in their own world words so it's a very uh prominent story this week and it's very important for this week's time capsule but wait we also have to cover the israeli government understands that muslims celebrate ramadan every year for a month and it involves fasting during the day and israel wanted to help out with ramadan and make sure that people are fasting not just during the day but kind of around the clock for the past 150 days and this past week they attempted to do an aid delivery that went a little sideways uh, it's called the flower massacre because it wasn't even just like food. It was just bags of flour that were being brought into Gaza. And uh, the IDF, which was delivering the flour, felt threatened in their tanks uh, from the starving people. And they started firing warning shots. And then they started firing shots into the people. And then they took a lot of time this week to give the world a good dose of Hasbara and deny it, deny it, deny it, even though all their stories contradict and very uh, prominent people in the government have kind of let the cat out of the bag uh, and Reuters reported it. So we have to take these conflicting stories and we have to resolve them. What actually happened? We're looking at that story. Also, tonight we have to cover the story that we started last week. Uh, it was during this show that we saw uh, the man on fire, the person known as Aaron Bush now in his uh, sacrificing protest of the genocide in Gaza. And uh, there's several reports on that. We could take a look into that because it caused, again, a lot of controversy from people saying this is a, a culture of men mental health and wokeness to, you know, there's legitimate things going on that aren't being talked about in society. And that was one poor man's way of getting the attention that he needed. And it's not the first person to self-immolate over this conflict. There was an unsuccessful person who did it in the Israeli embassy in Atlanta a month ago and got very, very, very little media attention. We didn't even cover it on the show because it didn't make it to our radar that that was going on. Uh, last but not least, remember in Spaceballs how they went plaid? Like they just went beyond the pale. They went beyond what was considered possible. Well, the, this, the, the Spaceballs, they've infected the New York Times and uh, they had to use the power of the Schwartz to convince people that Hamas had done these systematic gang rape situations. And I'm talking about Anat Schwartz, a former IDF intelligence person who the New York Times hired, who had no experience in journalism. And she brought along her kind of boyfriend, fiance's type uh, nephew, you could call him. And they wrote this story with Jeffrey Gettleman that went around the world. A couple of stories, actually. A lot of Hasbara that has led to the body count of Palestinian women and children, not just starving and suffering, not just displaced and homeless, but dead. Because of this type of egregious, hyperbolized untruths that have been left unchecked in our society. So, without further ado, let's kick it off with Luke Radowski's report from earlier today. This is coming from wearechange.org and thebestpoliticalshirts.com. And then we will get into tonight's first story, which is a very encouraging story about your loved ones or maybe even you. If you have cancer, you want to stick around and get this first story in on the other side. We'll be right back to kick it off. We're California criminals. Of course we're going to get away with it. <laughs> we're California criminals. We're not poor. We're just stealing because we can. <laughs> we're California criminals. Jail? Never heard of her. <laughs> we're California criminals. We're going to steal your Tesla because we care about the environment. We're California criminals. We don't need weapons because you, oh, you literally can't stop us. <laughs> we're California criminals. I wish I could steal Newsom's heart, but I feel like we already did. <laughs> we're California criminals. The only time we see cops is when we're watching this. <laughs> we're California criminals. Of course we're going <laughs> I like how she stole the phone and then uploaded the video later. And why would it people be doing that when the government incentivizes it? Welcome back beautiful and amazing human beings. My name is Luke Radowski here of wearechange.org, and there's a lot of absolutely crazy and wild news to get into today, as, of course, the election is being shaken up, but it's looking like it will go the way that a lot of people think it will, as, of course, we have a very big cultural movement that is being sparked up by Cat Williams and Joe Rogan with their latest podcast episode, which has been absolutely freaking incredible, and 
and really goes deep down the rabbit hole like we will here on this independent media broadcast. As, of course, there's a lot of news that we are going to be getting into here on this particular video. If you like the shirt that I'm wearing, you can get it on thebestpoliticalshirts.com. And the clip that we played in the beginning of this broadcast was shot by the amazing Brent Pella who is on Twitter. We, of course, will be linking his YouTube video down in the description below as he does absolutely incredibly funny work that deserves to be shouted out. Subscribe to his YouTube channel as, of course, we definitely need more comedians poking fun at the absolute absurdity of our current day life. And the people who are able to make us laugh during these very difficult times deserve more praise than ever. As, of course, the situation is not all right to the point where even now, there are rumors that Democrats could even be voting against Joe Biden on Super Tuesday, a day with many primary elections, which Donald Trump is expected to, of course, win, as he just defeated Nikki Haley in the Idaho Republican caucus, as well as the Michigan Republican Party convention, as it's pretty clear that he will be the Republican nominee, even though there's a lot of unfair play against him. Now, will people actually stand up against the current president of the United States because of his support of military funding and aid internationally? Well, that's a question that, of course, we are going to be paying close attention to, as, of course, we are going to be doing many live streams, many reports about this particular topic, as it definitely sets the way for the future of this country, as, of course, a lot of people are pissed off especially with the latest CDC declaration that is saying the, you know, the, the, the big sickness that was going around the last three years. Yeah, it's pretty much the equivalent of the flu. Here's the guide on how to deal with the flu. Good luck, folks. This, as it's also fair to say that the Biden administration and its allies are definitely going to be doing their best to fortify this election, as the Biden administration now is being accused of using taxpayer funds to help his campaign with student voter registration, which overwhelmingly, according to some polls, will be going towards the Democratic Party. This says the Democrats also have a lot of help from individuals like Mark Zuckerberg and also online big tech titans like Facebook and Google. As Sergey Brim recently addressed the larger controversy with Google's artificial intelligence that uh, discriminated against white people. And he blames everything on a quinky dink, as of course it's fair to say that there has been a larger discriminatory agenda at play here almost all throughout major swaps of the internet, its algorithms, as of course a lot of people are starting to question what's really happening in this country as we are getting more polarized, we are getting more divided, as even mainline television shows like MSNBC have programs where they describe white rural voters as a, quote, threat to American democracy. And as this election shapes up, it definitely does seem like there will be a recall of this current administration as the former president of the United States steamrolls his way ahead to an election that probably will be more tumultuous than ever. And that's why we made a lot of shirts for this upcoming election on thebestpoliticalshirts.com. And the corporate media doesn't like communities, doesn't like people coming together, as, of course, they play up on a lot of divisive nonsense like they are right now after Joe Rogan just interviewed Cat Williams, which, according to Newsweek's latest article, is sparking fury because Joe Rogan asked Cat Williams why black people like to small smoke menthols when Cat Williams made that declarative statement. And again... Uh, who cares? It was it was a non sequitur. It, 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 it didn't dominate the conversation. It wasn't a major vocal point of the conversation, but there was a lot of other things that were that were critically important. As, of course, Joe Rogan invited Cat Williams on the show after Cat Williams publicly declared that Joe Rogan would never want him on the show. Joe Rogan then responded to Cat Williams literally saying, Joe don't want me. Joe got six comedians that never been funny he wants to push out. As Joe Rogan responded to that saying, I love Cat. He's one of my favorite comedians and I'd love to have him on. And then he had him on. This after the controversy was created on the Club Shay Shay podcast episode that now has 61 million views as of two months ago on YouTube and definitely sparked a lot of very interesting conversations and controversies about individuals like P. Diddy, Mr. Weinstein, Mr. Kelly, Mr. Jackson, 
as it's fair to say that Cat Williams didn't hold anything back and was very prophetic, especially when it came to the larger P. Diddy situation that he, of course, spoke about. And on the Joe Rogan episode two months later, Cat Williams uh, also didn't hold a lot back because, of course, I thought the conversation was, was fascinating. It was extremely rich. It was thought-provoking, and it was a lot more than just talking about menthol cigarettes Newsweek. As, of course, Cat Williams got into a lot of different issues, especially how immigration is desperately aff affecting people in the black community more than almost any other community. He got into how the extreme left is just as vicious as the extreme right in our political circus. And his statement that it's the people in the middle that make America great is something that, of course, is a message that is counterproductive to the larger messaging of the corporate media. But one of the biggest statements that Cat Williams made was about the larger spiritual aspect of our entertainment industry that is usually correlated with a lot of rituals that include dressing up men in dresses. And he got into the larger kind of energetic, demonic, spiritual, religious aspects of this, describing them as, quote, Baphomet rituals, going as far as to even describe how this is Hollywood's agenda that is not meant for entertainment, but for pure propaganda purposes. Now, if you look at a lot of the lore, a lot of the kind of knowledge of Baphomet, it does correlate with a lot of what's happening in the mainline entertainment industry that they are trying to, of course, normalize. This, according to my own personal opinion, and probably the opinion of Cat Williams, who had some very interesting remarks about this entire matter. As, of course, this is what he had to say about it. That's what makes information so powerful is, you know, you don't care how people feel about the ritual. It's about does following the ritual work. Yeah. And so you can fool yourself into thinking there isn't one, but the evidence will be clear. So like when I, when I was like, uh, oh, these guys are wearing dresses. And everybody's like, oh, he keeps talking about people wearing dresses. No, it's that not. Is it's, a weird thing. it's not like that. Look at it from a different way. Look at it. Show me one person that ever wore a dress in Hollywood unsuccessfully. <laughs> <laughs> That's how you understand what a ritual is. Mm -hmm. Bringing up some uh, very important points that I think are definitely worth contemplating and looking at, as of course, some people say that this is just conjecture. This is just connecting the dots that shouldn't be connected. Some people are saying that this is just an absolute ideological stretch here. But let's be honest here. Cat Williams has been talking about this for a, a very long time, almost in a kind of prophetic way, as his comments even left uh, Joe Rogan speechless, as some people are saying that he was even kind of pulling back on this conversation that, according to some people, was getting too close to the larger truths out there that there needed to be a larger pullback effort on. Now, now I don't know if that's particularly true. That's just some of the chatter out there. But it definitely did seem like this was a, a, an out-of-the-ordinary conversation that was definitely far more complex, far more down the rabbit hole. And I think only someone inside of this industry like Cat Williams could expand on as, of course, largely what he was talking about here is a sign of an awakening kind of spiritual war that does involve religion, does involve personal beliefs. As Jason Whitlock on social media responded to this entire matter as an encouraging sign. And I would definitely say so especially when the conversation turned towards God and Cat Williams had this to say. The fact that there is a God is the biggest conversation worldwide. But the truth of the matter is there is more reason for you to believe there is a God than there is for you to not. The fact that it was already set up on this planet for there to be medicines for us to find mm. and to utilize. And yeah. You see what I'm saying? It's yeah. like, it's not like, oh, yeah, so he made a cow. No, to make a cow, it means you had to also have made grass. And it means you would have had to have invented a whole new eating system for this animal, which was cud. And that means you would... You would then have to have given him three stomachs to be able to, and you would have to have known that he was going to then emit a gas that was going to be necessary and on the planet. Like, mm, yeah. like none of these things Fertilizer are, 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 right. The seeds. fact that everything goes together is how you know. 
This as a lot of people are saying that there is a larger spiritual awakening out there and a start of a spiritual war. Do you believe that this is the case, that this is happening right now? Well, let me know down in the comment section below. Press, press one if you agree with him. Press two if you disagree. I think that's how that works. All right, so uh, a lot of things covered there. Uh, it was mention of the the Diddy saga that's going on. Uh, Sean Combs, P. Diddy, he's got something going on. It's very R. Kelly-ish. It's very Jeffrey Epstein-ish. It's very much uh, in line with a lot of the other things that you know going on out there. I have not seen the Joe Rogan, Cat Williams thing. I had no uh, time for such entertainments this past week. I was busy studying reality, but I will catch up on that uh, as well. And uh, yeah, that's a good overall start of the reporting from uh, things going on presently. That was today's report. So now we're going to go back in time. We're going to look at other things that happened uh, this past week. What did you think of that first clip, Tony? Yeah, it was uh, quite a week. Um, <clears throat> I've been following the Jason Whitlock saga for a little bit now because he's been going after the sports sort of personality, sports media personality. Is he that like, ESPN guy? He was, and he left to start his own thing, essentially calling out many of the ESPN people he worked with. He was sort of like, you can call him like a, an investigative journalist for sports media back in the day. He wrote Was he the guy like two columns. weeks ago who said like, we can't be given $50 million to immigrants? And my point at the time is like, bro, we just gave like two hundred million to, or two hundred billion or something to. Yeah, he's Ukraine. on like Glenn Rock. He's not or Glenn Rock. Glenn Beck's. Okay. Like uh, Blaze I don't TV. Know who he is. So he's. Oh, uh, Jason Whitlock. He was a sports. I know journalist. what ESPN is because I watched it twenty years ago. I know that it exists, and there's many channels of it now, but I don't know the people. Yeah, he was a sports journalist. Um, very famous. Wrote some very famous columns. Um, back you know. Pussy Glore is very and his uh was a series of Ian articles Fleming he wrote fan. about uh about the individuals that are compromised uh, and dude you know like Tiger Woods and and obviously he also uh, had a very interesting um uh what do you call it a critique or no a review of Joe Ponansky's book essentially just whitewashing the whole Joe Paterno saga and he called oh, a lot of question into that so he he became famous you know he was already pretty well known before that but he's uh anyways he went on Crowder like three or four years ago and said, I'm done with ESPN. They're, they're crazy. He's like, what's going on is literally satanic. He is a Christian. He is like a, you know, um, uh, sort of a, I don't know what denomination, but he's a, not a Catholic, but he's a Christian denomination. He supports sort of a biblical worldview. But if you can like let that melt away and just focus on some of the things he's saying, he's done a good job of actually in the wake of Cat Williams, what everyone thinks about him, because he calls out a lot of issues in the black community and the loss of you know, the, the family and, and the male figures and all these sorts of things that aren't true and important, but he's polarizing. He's very polarizing, even within his own community. But he's pointed out some truths in the wake of Cat Williams' appearance on uh, Club Shay, Shay Shannon Sharp show that ended up being pretty interesting and caused a firestorm. Um, and I didn't know that was media. Shannon Sharp's show, bro. I know yeah, there's Club a Shay thing Shay. called Club Shay Shay. I have watched a clip from it. I know who Shannon Sharp was a, a football player for, like he was a wide receiver for the Giants 20 years he ago. He right? was a tight end. Yeah. yeah. All right. And thank you for explaining for the Club Shay Shay, Shannon Sharp. That's Shannon actually Sharp. good branding. And so, yeah, that's, and there's been essentially a lot of fallout because he started calling out some major media figures that are essentially parroting the woke establishment narrative and they seem to be propped up a lot of their background seems to be fake or falsified or completely invented in some capacities so, and he's been going after these people and it's been interesting to see the fallout of it because it's been ended up taking the whole sports media by storm but it's also getting a lot of people in sports media to talk about a lot a lot of the more broader topics um that normally you wouldn't see percolate in the sports media space so it's been very fascinating no no, no, no doubt so no doubt being fascinated with that all right so uh i'll look to maybe someday get caught up with that story we'll see yeah, how that works it, out. it may at some point it may bleed over to what we do so it's kind of getting to that angle a little bit we did play mm -hmm. jason whitlock one time with royce I forget his last name but he talked about the british crown bringing in drugs so jason whitlock has people oh, on. right on yeah um and royce is on alex Jones anyone who knows about the british crown smuggling drugs let's have oh, a yeah. coffee that's what yeah, i say yeah. And they're so I forget his last name. He's actually really well spoken, but he goes on Alex Jones a lot. Um, so I'm not, but I'm right. not quite sure in his recent takes. Anyways, that's sort of like the milieu in which he operates.
the milieu in which he's swimming around. All right, so I'm going to mention uh, this real quick up in the show before we get to these clips and all the other stuff that's going on tonight, the roller coaster of emotions and logic and reason and irrationality that is the news for the week. I want to tell you about Autonomy Season 12. No, sorry, I'm thinking too far ahead. This is Season 11. We're doing Season 11. It's got 12 weeks in it. We do it twice a year. It's intense training for adults who want to make change in their lives and grow in the light direction. We have an early bird special. Looks like this. It's uh, universityreason.com forward slash early bird. And if you want to see just the landing page, it's getautonomy.info forward slash ignite. Now, I say those things quickly because I'm not really expecting anybody to write it down unless they're super interested, in which case, getautonomy.info forward slash ignite or universityreason.com forward slash early bird access i think it was let's just double check early bird is the forward slash now if you're interested we're doing enrollments for the next couple of weeks we're kicking off at the end of this month we have seven thousand people interested we have three thousand people somewhere in the midst of, of completing their obstacle course and getting through and qualifying for uh the blueprint strategy call and there's 900 people on that list so we're going to find 100 people who are right for autonomy this season. My question to you is, are you looking for that type of rapid growth, intense growth with a whole bunch of people that are excellent and getting more excellent every day? Then if so, I just showed you the answers. Cool. All right. With that, uh, also be sure to check on the Grand Theft World site because the upper banner right here, you get the recent offers. You get the recent summits and replays that you might have missed. So that we did VIP three. We did the underground history of America. We did uh, how my brain works. Uh, you'll have to find that someplace else now because it's been changed. But uh, the point is lots of new content going on there. So this is the place to look for the new activities. So every now and then, once a week, check in Grand Theft World, catch the replay, check out the history blueprint get your membership, all this good stuff. You guys can still get two months free membership. So friends, family, people you work with that you think might be, you know, interested in growing in the light direction, getting their, uh, getting fact up with you, maybe a little bit, getting their facts straight. These are uh, important investments of time if you want to improve your future. And with all that being said, our first story tonight is... It's unusual. We don't usually cover this type of content. And the way it comes to you is through like on a scale of one to 10, this has like nine out of 10 synchronicity because here's how it happens. Someone who's close to us came to visit us the other day. And he said that the day before he was at this amazing lab at Boston college that belonged to this guy named Dr. Seafried. And he's working on the Otto Warburg cancer treatment hypothesis. And that would look something like this. I studied Otto Heinrich Warburg. He studied cancer. He's part of the Warburg family. He wrote a paper called The Prime Cause and Prevention of Cancer by Dr. Otto Warburg. We have the Warburg hypothesis. And he worked at the Kaiser Wilhelm Institute of Eugenics, among other places, so his work, though very interesting, didn't go in the direction that the eugenicists kind of wanted to take everything. They wanted to take everything to DNA and genetics for cancer. And Otto Warburg had discovered long ago that cancer in human bodies starts when your cells go from respiration with oxygen to fermentation, which is a more ancient biological process. Warburg was not able to complete his work. So he had like this first half of a cancer treatment insofar as you have to starve the cancer of sugar, glucose, these sort of things. But there's a missing component and that missing component is more tricky to figure out. And the missing component comes from something called, uh, I think it's glutamine. It's an amino acid. And if you deprive your body of it completely, it wrecks your immune system. But as you're about to hear from this doctor, Dr. Seafried, if you pulse modulate and take it away for 24 or 36 hours at a time and then restore it, cancer cells are very fragile and they tend to not survive. So Seafried has a book 
The book is very expensive on Amazon. I'm not encouraging you to get his book, though. I bought his book because I got the paperback of last year's version. It's expensive because it's used as a textbook in college. And Wiley, the publisher, is a publisher of like such, you know, expensive books for college students. If you want to read it for the, you know, use and knowledge of your family, of yourself, I, I would say like get the book of the same title from not this year. And you have pretty much the same hypothesis. He's been working on this for 40 years now. So I've got this friend here. He's just seen this doctor, uh, talk to him about his research. And that's a real, you know, interesting synchronicity because I already knew about Otto Warburg. So it's like, you got me at hello. Tell me what else they've figured out. What's the protocol? Like, how does humanity take this large step of being able to have effective treatments to extend people's lifespan. That's the way you can say it. And so in the midst of having that conversation, I look down at my phone and there's a, there's this video from Jimmy Dore and Jimmy Dore three hours ago had just interviewed Dr. Seafried. And I said to my buddy, is this the guy you were with yesterday? And it's like his mind's blown because he just learned about Seafried like a week ago. And then called Seafried and went and met with him, right, to, to learn about this research and to see how one could help bring this to the public. This is a very exciting opportunity. So I'm going to show you the first five minutes because we don't have an hour right now to play the whole interview. I want to show you the first five minutes so you can meet Dr. Seafried and so you can understand. He's a man who's serious, who has studied his, this is his life's work. He's worked on it for 40 years. My my friend had met his entire staff and went through all the facilities and stuff like that. And I'm not saying that to vouch because he's not raising money or looking for anything, right? The Seafried. But he wants people to know about this research because unless more people know about it and, want, and kind of figure out how to get it, they're going to continue doing what they've been doing to our our relatives for generations. And it's not a pretty story when you look into the origins of chemotherapy and radiation. You go back to like... Human experimentation tests during World War II, Unit 731 in Japan, like all these kind of crazy experiments on vivisection and stuff like that, that played into like how they treat cancer. And it's not a very healthy way. They've been battling it my entire life. People have been running for the cure for cancer when such things could have existed much sooner had the research not been covered up because it basically it's a metabolism energy problem of the cells and it has nothing to do with the genetics the cells get damaged because of this other metabolism problem and as long as it's like raiders of the lost ark they've got billions of dollars digging in the wrong place and here's somebody who diligently has been doing the work and walking the walk and so i wanted to take five minutes before we move on to other topics like jacob rothschild and his death uh i want you guys to meet dr seafried and then we have a quick top of the clip from tim cast because there's a canadian rule that wants to take away people's free speech not that they had any in the first place but they want life in prison for people who say things that they don't like and that could go sideways and slippery slopey real quick so let's go to these first two clips and uh we'll be right back Okay, very excited for our guest today. Uh, he is Thomas Seafried. He's a professor of biology, genetics, and biochemistry at Boston College. He received his PhD from the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. Well, uh, I went to Illinois State, and so did I. Oh no, yeah, I got my master's degree there. Oh no, kidding. That's yeah. uh, while his postdoctorate fellowship studies were in the Department of Neurology at the Yale University School of Medicine where he served as an assistant professor in neurology. He sits on several editorial boards, including those for nutrition and metabolism, neurochemical research, and the Journal of Lipid Research, and ASN Neuro, where he is the senior editor. Dr. Seafried has over 150 peer-reviewed publications and is the author of the book right here, Cancer as a Metabolic Disease on the Origin, Management, and Prevention of Cancer. Welcome to the show, Professor Thomas Seafried. I appreciate you being here. Well, thank you very much, Jimmy. It's nice to be here. So I was uh, introduced to you. I was on a plane ride. I was, it's so funny. Uh, I was in, uh, on vacation in Hawaii, and I was talking to Ed Dowd, who's done a lot of work on excess deaths, and he comes from the financial world. And we we're talking about all the lies we've been told about medicine and things that we can't, we can't really wrap our minds around how it's been so corrupted by money. 
And he looks at me and he goes, he goes, I, I bet there's a cure for cancer out there. And uh, and I was just like, oh, come on. They wouldn't hide that. Well, on the way home on that plane, I heard I, I come across this video on YouTube and it's this professor and he's talking about how he's been dealing with cancer. And it sounds to me like he's got a pretty good hold on how to deal with it. So how tell me uh, what is your ideas on cancer and how to treat it? Because you treat it by starving it. So talk about how you do that. Yeah, well, thanks, Jimmy. Well, listen, <clears throat> about having a cure for cancer. Um, you know, I, I don't profess that at all. Uh, I think we have better ways to certainly manage cancer better, better than what's currently being done. I, I, I consider the term cure is kind of arrogant. Um, it's been kicked around for so long as if it's going to be uh, something like a cure for measles or uh, or a common cold or something like this. I think we I think we should look at it as more of a, a more logical management based on the science. Uh, whether 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 that leads to a complete uh, a resolution of someone's cancer, um, uh, that's all well and good. Uh, I mean, we can have that with the current strategies that we're using right now. We have so-called millions of so-called cancer survivors, um, uh, but they also pay a serious price sometimes for their for their survival, in the form of many other comorbid character traits that they would have gotten from the treatments. Um, you know, our approach is based on the hard science of what, what the nature of cancer is. Um, and it took, I, I'm standing on the shoulders of Otto Warburg, uh, who in the 1920s uh, defined what the nature of cancer was. And um, he was the dominant force in this field for, for decades and decades in Germany. He's one of the, the great thinkers and doers of the 20th century. Um, but he was thrown under the bus, so to speak, uh, when uh, Watson and Crick discovered that uh, DNA is the is the code for for uh, for our lives and for genes, and they found mutations in cancer cells, and everybody ran off chasing that, and pretty much left Warburg uh, behind. Uh, but you know, we we were seeing really remarkable effects um, with uh, calorie restriction and metabolic therapy. I, I, when the term starving them, um, you know, I guess you could use that term to with, with some caveats. Um, what, where our research and that of many others have shown that these tumor cells cannot live a very long without the sugar glucose or the amino acid glutamine. Warburg knew glucose was the prime fuel for cancer, but he knew nothing about the glutamine issue. And he also did not know about what we call now the third form of energy for cancer, and that's a amino acid fermentation based on the amino acid glutamine. So uh, we can clear up a lot of the mystery and a lot of the problems that Warburg had and bring the, bring the entire cancer field back onto the right track where it should have been uh, 70 or 80 years ago. Let's jump to the story from the National Post, my friends. If you do not remain vigilant, and perhaps if Donald Trump does not win, our country could turn into their country. And uh, you know what that means. New liberal online harms bill to make online hate punishable by life up to life in prison. Bill C-63 aims to force social media user, social media user uploaded adult, adult content and live streaming services to reduce exposure to online content deemed harmful. That's right. Hate speech. If your hate speech is particularly egregious, you could go to life in prison. So uh, congratulations, Canada. You have become one of the most authoritarian, disgusting states on the planet. Not the worst, but fairly bad. Fairly bad. <laughs> they say that it also amends the criminal code to create new standalone hate crime offense that would allow penalties up to life imprisonment to deter hateful conduct. Wow. As well as raise the maximum punishments right, for hate it. propaganda up because they're just, it's just nuts. All right, so how do you stand up against something like that? Like they had the the truckers protest, the farmers protest, these sort of things. It's like people in Canada, all those farmers, they don't have pitchforks. They're, you know, there's a way to take care of that problem. But, you know, on a serious side, that's a that's a challenge to free speech. Now, they don't really have free speech in Canada and they also don't have the right to self-defense in Canada and the first amendment and second amendment really go together hand in hand. So that's a problem. However, if one rhetorically 
had to arm themselves. You could just downstream their arguments, take them places downstream from that argument to show them the slippery slope. Like, well, what are you going to, because first off, hate speech is a, is a bogus term that is made up outside of this country for purposes of coming into this country and taking away our free speech. So they do it in Canada, they do it in Britain, they do it other places first, and then they want to bring it here, just like uh, the disarmament of citizens. They, you know, they have some school shootings in Australia, they give up their guns. They have school shootings in, in England and Ireland, they give up their guns. Over here, those uh, self-reliance tools of hunting, those are part of our lifestyle and our history, and they are uh, part of the Americana. They are a last resort against tyranny. What is your first resort? learning how to think critically and having active literacy skills to be able to speak back, to be able to assemble others in peaceful groups, to assert your power and have local accountability from your leadership such that they would never dream to threaten you with hate speech, which is arbitrarily, uh, you know, just added wherever they want to just persecute some political prisoner. And that is, that is not justice. That is not freedom. That is not human rights to be able to Anything make some can threats. be hate speech. Anything can right. be right. That's the problem. That's the problem. It's it's totally, it's a prescriptive, pejorative, utilized in order to, uh, based on one's whim or feeling, or you looked at someone the wrong political way. Political wind of the day. Yeah, exactly. And so there, there's no part, there's no essential definition of what hate speech is, and that's on purpose. It's always in a perpetual, perpetual state of equivocation, and that's on purpose in order to cast a wider and wider net over people. They deemed to be, I don't know, um, dangerous or, you know, da danger to themselves, the state, the culture, whatever, you know, it's completely arbitrary and the antithesis of logical. <laughs> yes. Yes. I should and say that's uh, whatever one thinks about what, whatever one thinks about Jordan Peterson, this is what he warned about in 2016, bill C 16. Now we're about bill C 63. And there, this is the end result of that. Everyone thought he was crazy back then. Right. There's no way it's going to get here. It's not even been 10 years and we're here. Yeah. 10 years later, he's in re-education camp. Right? <laughs> right, right. I thought they had gone over the line the when, irony, they took, man. when they took Grammy award winning Lauren Hill of the Fugees who had her first solo album was called, uh, the miseducation of Lauren Hill or something like that. And then they sent her to re-education. The re-education of Lauren Hill was like oh, her, Lauren, late, her last album, right? <laughs> it's not funny. I oh, mean, so but these people do things. It's, it's like, it's oh, like you got man. the Keystone cops, but they got real guns. Like this is the whole problem. There's right. like people who are playing that they have power over you. Because some other group of people got together and signed some. No, that's not how self-reliance works in the real world. That's how you get preyed on by a predator in and the real that, world. And for many Canadian friends of ours, one of some of the most self-reliant people I've ever met. I mean, yeah. it's just Toronto. It's some of the major city centers that exist. I mean, Toronto being maybe the most conspicuous, but also in Quebec and British Columbia. There's a couple major city centers around. Um, it's really near the border of America, the Canadian American border that represent a majority of the population, unfortunately, like, but in the outskirts around those major city centers are very uh, educated, tough, resilient individuals, you know, that, you know, live in some of the harshest terrain and find a way to manage that. So no doubt, I don't think it's representative of the entirety of um, Canadian culture. It really represents just the major city centers of Canadian culture, and which unfortunately also has the major population as well, but it's not the entirety. And what's not going, or it's going unnoticed is how much they're, you know, uh, sort of uh, polarizing or, you know, um, not not giving any sort of representation to those that don't make up those cities on purpose, of course, because that doesn't fit their narrative. Plus, Canada is also good for showing people uh, that the world's not overpopulated, because if you were to fly from Toronto to Vancouver, <laughs> you would see for hours and hours and hours, nothing but just like trees. The same in America, bro. When I drove with my right, wife exactly. back from Utah uh, to amazing amount of property space on this planet. They want everyone to think it's like, let's crowd into 15 minute cities. That's their trick. That's what they want you to do. And when I say they, I, of course, I mean, they, them, those who can be easily named. And we're going to talk about them in a minute. But before we move on, I wanted to close the loop on uh, Dr. Seafried. 
This is the video from which we were playing. It's 50 minutes long. It's titled Breakthrough Cancer Treatment Using Keto Diet from Doctor uh, from Boston College Doctor, but his name is Thomas Seafried. So if you were looking for that for yourself, for a loved one, you want to sit and watch that with them and think about the potential because like you might not have all the ingredients in the recipe, but once you understand how the organism that's disrupting your family works, it's a lot easier to work together in a healthy way to manage that treatment. And there's though, also, we should mention there's, I'm not against the man in any way, but no, it's no. not a simple black and white. I'm it's not, not a doctor. just go no, on no. ketogenic diet. And there's also, he's not but denying that's not the reality the of genetic the, mutation either. There, he's just saying there's another aspect to it. Though. There's a pharmaceutical involved to pulse regulate the glutamine. Right. And if they, you go on a ketogenic, it does nothing because your blood glucose stays well, the same. Your body is still consuming. It has to still produce glu blood glucose. And this, the cancer is going to feed on that regardless of whether being on a ketogenic or not. You, this, this is one of the main problems that's been an issue for decades in regards to this research. But he has right. a unique mechanism he's talking about. Yes. So I don't want to give people just a change diet. That's going to sit. No, 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 no. I'm just saying, listen to interview. So I'm yeah, not telling is, you anyone. We're not, not doctors. doctors. Right. Exactly. You've heard it before. We're not doctors. I am telling you, if you wanted to be educated on the topic and you understand how it works, and then right. you understand there's a key piece and they're trying to keep that piece off the table. It's much like ivermectin or hydroxychloroquine during the, the COVID flu pandemic thing that went through, right? So there could be useful things. And those useful things might be a few grant processes or paper, pro paper processes away. You have to figure it out. Like there's, you have to, there's a little bit of reading between the lines, exactly. but if you don't learn to read between the lines, you're left with the standard of care, which has a horrendous outcome for most people's immune systems and the quality of life. So with all that being said, uh, be this, well, yeah. be educated. Yeah, check it out. I mean, it's an interesting hypothesis and it's worth uh, considering all options and obviously consult your doctor um, in regards to these matters. Consult many doctors. And feel yeah, free to bring your research because they don't have time to read the. That's what he says in there. Yeah, he's like, exactly. this is all there, but no one has time to like put stuff together. And he's just been working on it and figured out something that works on. He his challenge is bring him a type of cancer that this doesn't work on, and they have yet to find it. And no one has been able to overturn his papers, and they all go in a line step by step proving his hypothesis. So yeah, I'm like, not. It's I, for is... serious consideration. It's for consideration. I've seen a yeah, lot of these not claims in the past, and I've seen. I know of people who've tried it and failed. So I it just be put it into perspective, you know, it, there's a lot of, there's a lot we don't understand and he may have a piece of the puzzle and there still may be a lot that we, he doesn't understand and we don't fully buy you a they, copy they, of his book. They found cop, they, they found cancers that feed on fat as well. So it's, it's a sure. problem. It's a, it's a, it's cancer is one of the most sophisticated and complex diseases known to mankind. That's but we could have been a lot further along with resolving this issue than Maybe. what we have inherited through the Rockefeller medical establishment, forcing everything to just be through the lens of genetics and DNA only and keeping people away from the prime mover that actually makes our cells metabolize and make energy to make us alive. Because I don't think they want us to really understand that, but they would want to keep that to themselves. So we're going to move forward because uh, now we have a story coming up that needs a little preface because in order to cover Jacob Rothschild's death and the accoutrements and data that comes with his passing like uh there's the picture of him with marina abramovich that came into scrutiny this week so it's like here's abramovich at the rothschild foundation royal archive lecture and we're going to watch a minute of the lecture because there i couldn't find anything clippable in the lecture to be like oh here so we're just going to be like that happened and you're going to see rothschild foundation funded marina abramovich at the royal uh, uh, art gallery Royal Archive, where that painting uh, by Sir Thomas, what's his name? Uh, Satan summons his legions uh, is. So that that's like a real thing in history. We're going to cover it. But before we can cover it, we're going to look at a video called How Israel Was Created. Because in here, you're going to start to see hints of where it's like in our society, Israel as a topic has been talked about for 70 years without anybody in the mainstream media ever mentioning here's kind of like the two you know uh, an english branch and a french branch of a family that got together for a colonization project just like that english family had colonized south africa and rhodesia and a couple other places right so there's a pattern of colonization there's a pattern of apartheid among their specific creations and when you start to see 
with more clarity and detail the big picture than what's going on today and for the past five months is going to make a whole lot more sense. And it's much easier now for you to explain it to other people because it's no longer innuendo or, you know, conspiracy theory. It's like, here's the evidence, here's the evidence, here's the evidence, here's the evidence. And it paints out a much different picture than what people are allowed to talk about in the mainstream media. Uh, this is one of the closest things to like giving you legit coverage of this topic. So we're going to start this out. And then uh, we're also going to see how how it all started from uh, Jacob Rothschild's perspective. So that's what this is setting up. Let's go to this clip. This is from AJ+. Plus. On November 2nd, 1917, Britain's Foreign Secretary, Arthur Balfour, wrote a letter that would set off a conflict still being fought more than 100 years later. Okay, His pause. Majesty's government viewed Sorry. with faith like already, already, I got to stop the video. I can't even like start to take notes uh, because that's disingenuous to the actual facts. Now, either the people at Al Jazeera Plus, they don't know the history and lineage of the document, or they just assume that Balfour, it starts with Balfour writing the declaration, right? As I will show you after this video, Lord Rothschild wrote the first version. He then sent it to the British government and Cecil Rhodes's Milner's kindergarten acolytes of that whole plan that were funded by Rothschild. Uh, they rewrote it. And then Balfour gives it back to Lord Rothschild in almost, almost the exact thing he asked for. That's an important part of the story. When you start the story with the British, you know, some people call Balfour racist. I'm like, again, how racist was he when he's working on the receiving end of that, that endeavor. Right. So even right here where it's like Lord Rothschild gets his letter from Balfour, they're not giving you the context that really is the decisive factor in the matter. When you see on Balfour100.com that we're going to show you after this clip, Lord Rothschild's first draft, this is where the state of Israel starts on his desktop. And he's powerful enough to take that note, send it off to the queen of the King's government. They process it and give it back to him. And then the British go and colonize that area for 20 plus years and then say, you know, you bomb a hotel, we'll give you a country. That's basically a gist. There was a little Nelson Rockefeller sh uh, shenanigans in there toward the end. But uh, those are the broad strokes. OK, let's go ahead and continue to play this video. On November 2nd, 1917, Britain's Foreign Secretary, Arthur Balfour, wrote a letter that would set off a conflict still being fought more than 100 years later. His Majesty's government view with favor the establishment in Palestine of a national home for the Jewish people and will use their best endeavors to facilitate the achievement of this object. When Balfour wrote of his government's intent to create a Jewish homeland in Palestine, 90% of the people living there were not Jewish. Just 31 years later, most of them were gone. <laughs> <laughs> this is the story of the British promise that led to the destruction of Palestine and the creation of the State of Israel. Let's start with the obvious question. Why were the British making promises about other people's countries? Short answer, empire is one hell of a drug. This was World War I, and the British were making lots of promises. In addition to promising a Jewish homeland in Palestine, they promised Arab leaders independence if they rose up against Britain's enemy, the Ottoman Empire. The Arabs did. Hollywood even made a movie about it. Arabia's for the Arabs now. That's what I've told them anyway. That's what they think. That's why they're fighting. Oh, surely. A month after Balfour's letter, British troops took Palestine, ending 400 years of Ottoman rule. The people who lived there were Arabs, mostly Muslims, but there were Christian and Jewish minorities too. There was also a tiny number of European Jews who in the late 1800s had started building small colonies there. At a time when many Jews were suffering horrific persecution in Europe, they felt Palestine could be an escape. The idea of building up a Jewish presence in Palestine became known as Zionism, but it stayed a fringe movement among European Jews. Many of them felt they shouldn't have to leave their countries to avoid persecution. 
But Zionism as a political movement took a big step forward with an Austrian man called Theodor Herzl. And this guy is a very important name in this story. In 1896, he published Der Judenstaat, or in English, The Jewish State. In it, he said, the only way for Jews to avoid Europe's anti-Semitism was not just to leave, but to have their own country. And Herzl didn't just write. The next year, he organized a conference in Basel, Switzerland, the first Zionist Congress. The attendees agreed on a program which sought, among other things, to establish a Jewish homeland in Palestine and promote Jewish settlement. From here on out, the Zionist movement became very active, setting up funds to promote Jewish immigration to Palestine, companies to buy land there, and recruiting representatives to advocate for their cause with different governments. A few days after the conference, Herzl wrote this in his diary. At Basel, I founded the Jewish state. In five years, perhaps, and certainly in 50 years, everyone will perceive it. He was only off by one year. Okay, so that is a lot of history, but it's important because the Zionist movement is a critical part of the story going forward, especially after it found a friend in the British government, where a lot of high-ranking officials supported Zionism, sometimes for unexpected reasons. Prime Minister Lloyd George, for example, was a Christian zealot who believed gathering the Jewish people in Palestine would bring Jesus Christ back to Earth. Others, like Balfour, believed that getting the Jewish people out of Europe and into their own country would be a good thing. Herzl was pretty visionary when he wrote that the anti-Semitic nations will become our allies. Meanwhile, the Zionists assured Britain that their future country would be a reliable ally. So that's the backstory of how European anti-Semitism, Zionism, and British imperialism all led to the Balfour Declaration, this British promise to build a homeland for Jews in Palestine. Now we're going to look at how Britain did that. World War I had been a conflict between rival empires, and the winners set up the League of Nations to distribute the losing side's territories between them. They called it the Mandate System, putting territories once controlled by the Ottoman and German empires under the, quote, tutelage of advanced nations until they became independent. Hmm. Britain was given the mandate over Palestine, but the Palestinian people were never asked what they wanted or what independence would look like to them. Listen to what Balfour wrote to one of his colleagues. For in Palestine, we do not propose even to go through the form of consulting the wishes of the present inhabitants of the country. Instead, it was the Zionists who were consulted about what their vision for Palestine was. And so the mandate ended up incorporating not just the Balfour Declaration, but several clauses requiring Britain to ensure the establishment of a Jewish home in Palestine. British rule was very accommodating to the Zionist project. The Jewish community in Palestine grew with big waves of immigration. They had their own schools and factories and even their own militia, the Haganah. And they were led by the Polish-born David Ben-Gurion, the leader of their representative body, the Jewish Agency. To the Palestinians, it was clear that Britain wasn't delivering them independence. It was delivering their country to other people. In 1936, they went on strike. British forces tried to break the strike with arrests, torture, mass punishment, and executions. Leaders were exiled, weapons confiscated, and houses blown up. Palestinian fighters attacked British and Jewish targets, while British and Haganah forces would carry out joint raids on Palestinian villages. Something had to change. The British government sent a commission called the Peel Commission to figure it out, but their proposed solution was typical. Just draw another British line on the map, divide the country, give this part to the Jews and this part to the Palestinians and make that part of Transjordan next door. Oh, and because the Palestinians were a majority in the country, 250,000 of them would have to be removed by force to make the Jewish state viable. Remember, these were the proposals that were meant to calm things down. Spoiler, they didn't. Instead, the revolt continued until 1939 by which time about 10% of Palestine's adult male population had either been killed, injured, arrested, or exiled. The British government really needed a solution. So here comes another report. The commission is studying the 20-year-old Jewish settlements in British-mandated Palestine. 
The 1939 White Paper created a conflict between the British and the Zionists for the first time, because it rejected partition and said the solution was for Palestine to gain independence within 10 years, with everyone living there sharing it together. Crucially, it also imposed severe limits on Jewish land purchases and immigration. To the Zionists, this felt like a betrayal. In response, some set off bombs across the country, killing dozens of Palestinians. But soon, everyone was distracted by something much bigger. More than 60 million people were killed in World War II, including 6 million Jews murdered in Nazi death camps. Jewish survivors fled Europe, with a large number of them trying to find safety in Palestine despite the British limit on Jewish immigration. This set off a more direct confrontation between the Zionists and the British, with Palestinians often targeted as well. The Zionists knew two things. Militarily, they were stronger than the Palestinians. And Britain was exhausted by World War II, so it wouldn't have the stomach to keep fighting in Palestine. They were right. In 1947, after 30 years of occupation, Britain announced it was quitting Palestine and asked the newly formed United Nations to clean up its mess. All right, 1947 and 1948 are the most pivotal years in this story. So let's take a look at how things are lining up. During British rule, Jews had gone from 10% to 30% of the population and owned about 6% of the land. Under Ben-Gurion's leadership, the Jewish agency was pretty much functioning as a government for the Jewish community. And the Zionist militias had tens of thousands of soldiers, modern weapons, and officers who'd already fought in World War II. On the other side, the Palestinians hadn't been allowed to develop their own administration or military. But as they waited for the UN solution, they were still the majority all over the country. In November 1947, the UN, then only made up of a fraction of the world's countries, voted to partition Palestine. This plan marked off 55% of the country for a Jewish state. But the UN never explained how it could be a Jewish state when half the people in its territory were Palestinian. To nobody's surprise, Palestinians, and in fact all Arabs, rejected the UN's plan. Ben-Gurion and the Zionist leadership accepted, but they saw an opportunity. With the British on the way out, the Zionists knew they would have the strongest military in Palestine. Their forces were instructed to seize more territory than they'd been awarded by the UN and to do what was necessary to reduce the number of Palestinians in it. In cities like Haifa, the militia set off car bombs in Palestinian neighborhoods. They attacked villages and forced residents out. Haganah troops have driven the Arabs out of the beleaguered city, taking many prisoners. After inspecting parts of Western Jerusalem that have been emptied of Palestinians, Ben-Gurion said, In many Arab neighborhoods in the West, you do not see even one Arab. If we persist, it is quite possible that in the next six or eight months, there will be considerable changes in the country and to our advantage. One of the events that helped speed up these changes took place on April 9th, 1948, when the village of Dir Yassin was attacked. A British government report to the United Nations describes the scene. 250 people were killed in circumstances of great savagery. Women and children were stripped, lined up, photographed, and then slaughtered by automatic firing. The story of what happened at Dir Yassin set off panic all over the country. As news spread, people fled, fearing they would be next. Historians have recorded dozens of similar massacres during this period. Each time, they would result in entire communities fleeing. By the time Britain ended its mandate on May 15, 1948, 250,000 Palestinians had fled. The night before, David Ben-Gurion announced the founding of the State of Israel with himself as its first prime minister. He was standing under a giant portrait of Herzl, 51 years after Herzl had predicted this very moment. The Zionist militias came together as the newly formed Israel Defense Forces, but the fighting wasn't over. With the British out of the way, soldiers from several Arab countries entered Palestine. But the Israeli army was better equipped, better organized, and unlike the Arab armies, had a unified command and backing from several European countries. 
Israeli forces pushed into places that the UN had assigned to the Palestinian state, like the towns of Lidda and Ramle. 50,000 people were forced to flee from there, many on foot, in what became known as the Lidda Death March. After being emptied, the towns were given Hebrew names, Lod and Ramla. Like in many other empty towns, the buildings and homes were taken over by the new Israeli state and given to Jews. By the time the UN secured an armistice, three quarters of the Palestinian people had become refugees. In Arabic, they call this the Nakba, literally the catastrophe. The new state of Israel made up 78% of what had been Palestine. The remaining parts were annexed by Jordan or taken over by Egypt. A year later, the UN passed a resolution calling for all Palestinian refugees to be allowed to return home. They never have been. Palestine had been erased. In the decades since, attempts to resolve this conflict have again tried to partition the land. With each successive attempt, the territory offered to Palestinians in their historic homeland shrinks even more. Ironically, Israel is still struggling to maintain the population advantage it gained in 1948 when it forced all those people out because in 1967 it occupied the West Bank and Gaza, bringing all the Palestinians living there under its rule. And so today, the population of Jews and non-Jews in this land is roughly equal. But those living under occupation have no rights, no citizenship, and no prospect of independence. The Nakba era tactics of settlement, home demolitions, and expulsion are still used against them. Israel has taken the land but wants nothing to do with the millions under its rule. International, Israeli, and Palestinian human rights groups say this system is a form of apartheid. To see if that's an accurate description of Israel more than a hundred years after Balfour's promise, watch this video here. So as you heard, it all started on 10-7. And you have to study all these things in a vacuum because <laughs> facts like what were just laid out there are pretty objective and can be checked out. The Nakba existed. And let's just ref let's go back to that Tim Pool clip, this whole uh, taking free speech, criminalizing it, lifetime in prison, go to the gulag, you know, do not pass go, go to jail type of thing. What if the phrase, what's your evidence? is framed as a hate crime. You, you could say about 10-7, what's your evidence? Well, it's a hate crime. You're not allowed to ask those questions. What about the Holodomor? What's your evidence? Oh, you're, it's a hate crime. <clears throat> you, you can't ask that, right? So these sort of things have a very slippery slope and going downstream. I mean, Nakba is already, you're not allowed to talk about it in Israel. You're not allowed to probably talk about it in Germany. You're not allowed, maybe, to talk about it in Canada in a couple of weeks. And then, since everyone else isn't allowed to talk about the catastrophe, and you, the, as you heard, the catastrophe didn't just start in 1948. It was going on well before 1948. And that's going to tie into uh, the demise of Jacob Rothschild. And, uh, Tony, what did you think of that first set of clips? Yeah, I mean, it's <clears throat> that was one of the best summations. Kitty, come on. Uh -huh. God. High production the best value with a cat <laughs> right. in the picture. Here. I'm going to have to get rid of that. Got that. Um, that's going to be the most rewound. Like That's the probably. part of this clip everyone wants to see is the cat jumping around. Can't stand that cat. I'm chewing my wires. Um, it's one of the best summations of the history of the conflict, especially in regards to, I thought they did a really good and fair treatment over what happened with British Mandate Palestine in regards to the resolution plan. Yeah, one eighty one. Often UN also, it's called the UN partition standards. plan. Yeah, I thought they did a really good job. You know, stating that first, first. Well, we already did this uh, many times, but first, there was um, the United Nations was sort of fresh and new on the heels of World War II, off the heels of World War II, and it did not represent most of the nations around the world. Although it did represent most of the powerful nations around the world, as we've already showed many time on this show. Um, even though it's written in a, a fictional tale, there's evidence behind the fact that Nelson Rockefeller was blackmailed to get this. The, I think they used the Central and South American votes. That was crucial because that's what that was the impetus needed for the Zionist leadership to said there's enough within the within the how do we call this within the 
uh, cardinal of cardinal of or the college of like nation states, the most powerful nation states, we are giving a green light to manifest our destiny as a country. And in doing so, with the British leaving, there is no organized Palestinian resistance. There's no organized army. There's no organized institutions of governmental bodies, anything on the, on the Palestinian side. But there were on the Zionist side. And that set the conditions for, although it was never ratified, yes, the Palestinians never ratified it. That gave all sorts of justification to manifest the destiny, Zionist destiny, that is. And they certainly did so. And they did so with the cooperation and support of those powerful nations, even if they made up one third of the nations of the world, most of which, though, are the most powerful ones that just came off winning World War II, so to speak, quote unquote. After they and, had just won World War One and redrawn the maps to do that Palestine right. colonization. Like Pico and Balfour, right. those two maps. Right. And that's yes. based on really, it was, one, it was based on anti Semitism. It was also like in regards, we don't really, as we heard with the, uh, was it Dave Lloyd George? It was also based on, um, uh, oil. Mo mo the majority yeah. of it had to do with resources, first and foremost. It also had to do with re you know, military uh, strategy, strategic military, oh, outposts, yeah. all these sort Creating, of things, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. There's also like if people go back and watch the Melissa and Aaron Dykes production, um, I think it's the great game. You'll see like a lot of it was forced dialectics across the entire world to create, you know, all these nations that are pitted against one another, either because of political identity, communism versus capitalism, these sorts of issues, or ethnic identity, which is kind of what we're seeing with Zionism in Palestine. Yeah, it's an and, and, and they, Yeah, exactly. So there, and that's that was done on purpose in order to create this this sort of Hegelian dialectical hell all across the world, easy to control when people are always pitted against one another. In other words, but it's not an ethno state created by the people they claim to represent, which is a really interesting ethno yeah, state true. when you get into it. Uh, real quick, the reference on who blackmailed Nelson Rockefeller to get those United Nations votes. Answer is two Haganah agents who work for David Ben-Gurion. That comes from John Loftus interviewing one of the Haganah agents who was in the room and blackmailed Nelson Rockefeller. You can find that in this book. Oh, I gotta restart my camera. All right. I'm going to just show you like this. I'm going to do Jay Dyer style. I got this book. The witness tree. I thought and it was called read, the witness tree, but I didn't want to say. If it. you if you read to the back, it's got the references for how all the pieces of the story work. So that's the that's it's the complicated fiction. research and intelligence told in a narrative form. So he he partnered up with Brendan Halley to take his research and make it like palatable, so you could actually want to read it. It also has to do with how Alan Dulles and his brother John Foster whacked the guy that their sister Eleanor was dating because he was a Israeli Zionist and they were a little anti-Semitic, the Dulles family. So there's all sorts of good stories in here right. based on real research and history of John Loftus, but also, let me see. It reminds just... me a lot of what Lincoln did. I think with Kansas and some of the Midwestern states, he knew they were still highly racist, but he, he was able to play them in such a way to allow for emancipation to still take place as a political expediency. So there's all these ways. It reminds me also of the way British slavery ended. Essentially, became economically not viable anymore. It's not so much that they had a change of heart. It's a very famous movie about that we watched many well, years they, ago. Well, they had a change of heart on the island while they kept a whole world of slaves right. working for them for a long time. No one ever talks <laughs> about that either. If we have time tonight, we're also going to look at uh, Israel in the crosshairs. Does peace have a chance? This is foreign affairs. These are kind of the people who were there to help make these ripples in the first place. So I don't think peace has a chance. If you're going to follow their opinion, you're going to get their results. And uh, that can be something we we check into as well. All right. So now uh, Jacob Rothschild and his family's role in creating that mess that we just heard about. So it's not just his family. They had a banking power, international banking power. They partnered up with a worldwide biggest empire in history. Together, banking and military, you could do a lot of things out there. But wait, as Ron Papillo used to say, there's more. If we got America in, you'd have all these resources, you'd have all this young blood, new bodies to throw at these problems, and they could kind of sit back and take a, you know, a retirement seat while America goes out and becomes the property manager for the big empire. So it's not that America is imperialist or had uh, designs on other countries. And uh, it was really 1898 Spanish-American War. Rudyard Kipling, a, a good Freemason, close time friend of Cecil Rhodes. He said, America, you got to get into these imperial entanglements. You have what's called, he wrote a poem called The White Man's Burden. There was a whole bunch of propaganda, cartoons and such. Uncle Sam must jo join John Bull in bringing civilization to the people of color around the world. Again, these are not American ideals. They are British Empire ideals. How did they get back into our country? 
the Eastern establishment, opium monopoly, the Boston Brahmins, they never left. They never stopped having power. They never stopped training people at their universities. And that plan has always continued. I did a whole lecture on it. It's called the underground history of America. If you go to grandtheftworld.com right here, you can still get it. And you can learn that whole story because that's what this whole story is. Eventually that power structure attacked our education system to dumb us down, to anesthetize us from uh, their bite. It's like what mosquitoes do where you can't feel it. So they dumbed us down and we can undumb ourselves down. It's called education. And you can learn about it right there in grandtheftworld.com. Now, the reason we're here right now is to look at this. This is the Balfour 100 official centennial site. And on here, there's Jacob Rothschild and there's the interviewer. And this is on YouTube as well. And that's where they're embedding it on this site. See, it says click here to watch an exclusive interview with Lord Rothschild. Now, this is the Lord Rothschild who just passed away. And what he's doing is in this interview, he is being interviewed on the topic of the Balfour Declaration, which is 67 words that led to the creation of the state of Israel. And this site is the commemoration site for it. And it has menu items. Now, anytime you go to a site, if you want to consume everything on the site, you pretty much go through the menus, click the stuff, you read the stuff, you process and comprehend what it's telling you. Now, not many people do this, and I'm not going to spoil the video because it's, it's covered in several reports that are excellent. I'm going to show you in a minute, but I do want to show you here are the highlights and there's more video and you can learn more. And it's interesting what uh, B.B. and Theresa May uh, have to say on these topics, not just uh, uh, Jacob Rothschild right here. Now, this is the Balfour Centenary Lecture with Simon Shama. That's interesting. He wrote the book, Two Rothschilds and the State of Israel, 1978, and it covers Baron uh, Edmund de Rothschild of France and his kibbutz efforts starting in the 1880s, and uh, Lord Rothschild, Walter Rothschild of England, and how they came together to create the state of Israel. Here is the declaration. And if you see right here, they have the one, two, three, four, five drafts. It starts with Lord Rothschild's Hey, draft. Rich, I got a quick question, actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. what's your the question? Brit the British and the French Rothschilds, uh, were the French more idealistically interested in starting kibbutz or um, manifesting kibbutz in the new territory? Like, or, or was were they all the Rothschild brother, all the Rothschild brothers, on board with the same sort of ideological agenda, or were some just like we'll support you, but we don't really care that much, and others like, no, I'm all about this, like the French. Okay, like, what what was the sort of this is an excellent question, mm -hmm. and it is covered in part in a video that we're about to play from Savvy Sounds. Oh, okay. However, okay. <laughs> she skips over. She's in her coverage. She skips over the paragraph that I want to cover, but we'll wait till she delivers, okay. and then I'll I'll add the extra paragraph. The answer right. to your question is no. The Rothschild family does not have a uniform preference or so. predilection for Zionism. Many different people in various branches had a disagreement on whether they would be putting themselves too much out in the open, oh, having okay. their own state and nuclear capabilities down the road, and all these other things that Israel enjoys. All the things that come with statehood, but then you're conspicuously out in front. You're not just you're 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 part of zionism you're part of the foundation of israel and you're also the most rich richest and most powerful banking family in the world it's you hard to claim the victim status tony when you have so many <laughs> nuclear weapons but if you keep it hush hush that's true that's true you can still play the 10 7 card as they say mm. so in more depth of answering well, your sorry. question baron edmund of uh it was baron edmund and james the rothschild of france that were major israel palestine uh colonial supporters baron edmund Part of his concern is you've got the Jewish pogroms going on in Russia during the 1870s, 1880s, these sort of things, right? And he's also into vineyards and wineries. So he's like, I'm going to start working over there to set something up. Now, he's involved with Moses Hess and Baron uh, Hirsch. There's a whole and there's a whole list of them that's uh, listed in uh, last uh, Roman Jerusalem, last nationalist question by Moses Hess, 1862. So there's a whole coterie. And from Moses Hess's claim, they have a secret society that has infiltrated Freemasonry to attend to these goals that Herzl later talks about. We're going to have this country under the Zionist. You know, so Zionism yeah. at this time doesn't even exist. Anti-Semitism as a term at that time doesn't even exist. They have an agenda that starts back in 1829, 
1835. It's it's rumored. And then you see start seeing real evidence in 1840, 1862, all the way up to 1880s. So there's a long history of all this going on. The British Rothschilds were busy funding Cecil Rhodes, De Beers, South Africa, right. apartheid, Ro like right. Rhodesia. That makes sense. Yep. At during the 1880s as well. So at the same time, you got these two different Rothschild branches working on these two things. And then there's a commonality because Herzl and, and Weizmann had said, hey, colonial project, anti-Semitism, uh, you know, this sort of thing can work because one feeds the the other, right? right. If, they ever, if because... they're under attack, they need their own place to be safe. And all these arguments kind of like coalesced. And then it, uh, according to rothschildarchive.org, uh, rothschildarchive.org, you have to go back in the Wayback Machine because they've edited this. But their claim was that uh, the Balfour Declaration was a deliverable receipt for having used its influence to get America into the war on the side of Britain because it was up for a coin toss. One third of America had German heritage, and it took a lot of doing to get America into the war both times. Oh, yeah. And there's yeah. a whole lot of British intelligence. So it's not just like the Zionists got America into the war. British intelligence is right there the whole time trying to get America into the war. And they just found some people to help out that had deep pockets. Right. Yeah. So it's a very pragmatic yeah, well thing. Well said. That's actually that they very have, pragmatic. That's yeah, very pragmatic thing that they have going on. So let's go back to the browser. Very interesting. And let's look at the first draft. This is called the Lord Rothschild draft. 18 July, 1917. So six months before it comes out from the British government, he's like, here's my wish list. It's like writing to Santa, uh, you know, six months ahead of time. His majesty's government. So he's like... Dude, this is legit. It's not even like, hey, I'd like these things. He's like, I've already written it for you. His Majesty's government accepts the principle that Palestine should be reconstituted as the national home of the Jewish people. Two, His Majesty's government will use its best endeavors to secure the achievement of this object and will discuss the necessary methods and means with the Zionist organization. Now, very quickly, it is said in the Jacob Rothschild interview that's on this page, that his family was approached by Kaim Weitzman. He's very persuasive, Taylor Herzl. And a lot of them were sent packing. Like the, the French sent Herzl packing. The British sent Weitzman. They gave him a hard time. Because basically these guys come along and they're like three rungs down in the ladder of something that these other guys had already created and spun up. And then they come back and they're like, hey, fund this thing not knowing like there was a bigger agenda that went on for decades before these guys even had the original idea to come up with Zionism. Moses has his 30 years, 20 years before Ted or Herzl. And then later Weizmann comes along. Right. So these sort of things aren't necessarily true. And just like the Rothschild explanation of how they didn't fund the Confederates. Right. It, when you dig into their exp and you say, what's the evidence you find, it's a little bit different than what they tell you. As an example, uh, the German Rothschild at the time, was asked if they were funding, maybe it was maybe the, I'm sorry, it's the French Rothschild Bank, was asked about funding the Confederates. And his his comment was, I'm still thinking it was German Rothschild. I'll look up the the quote. His comment was, no, that's not us. That was Erlanger and company down the road. They're a Christian banking house. They're the ones doing the Confederate money. And I said, well, that's that's interesting. So they didn't fund the Confederates and this other group did. And I, okay, check, duly noted. And then I came across the French Rothschilds using Erlanger and Company as their front company in Palestine in the 1880s and 1870s to start doing colonization and getting property together. I was like, oh, that's interesting because the Erlanger uh, and Company, uh, they converted to Christianity. They were Jewish and worked with the Rothschilds in the banking. And then they're like, hey, wouldn't it be right. convenient to have a Christian front company that we can do these ex excursions and block what their agenda was of colonizing Palestine? All well and good. I'm not judging it. I just think that history is relevant to what's going on today. And when people know that, they would probably make better educated decisions in their life. Now, I want to read to you what is here on the first draft. Lord Rothschild's draft, 18 July, 1917. Many of history's great documents and speeches, not to mention works of art, literature, and music, were repeatedly modified and refashioned before they were finalized. So it was that on June 19th, 1917, 
British government officials, led by Foreign Secretary Arthur James Balfour, asked Zionist leaders Kaim Weizmann and Lord Lionel Walter Rothschild to produce a draft formulation for British support of a Jewish homeland in Palestine, which the cabinet could consider. Now, you guys don't know Lord Walter Rothschild. He's born into a family, a banking family. He has no interest in banking. He's a zoologist. He's the guy I put on my famous T-shirt where he's riding the tortoise and leading it around with a piece of lettuce because it's a perfect metaphor for how banking is used to lead the world. It's like wherever you put the lettuce, the, the tortoise is going to go. This is like remote control for them. So in those aspects, uh, interesting character. You should look into him. He's a fascinating guy. Uh, he left a, an estate at Tring that has a whole bunch of zoological stuff. He used to do wacky stuff like get pulled around with a, a team of zebras. You know, not that zebras can do that very well, but it's like, it's a cool looking thing back in the day. And so he's an interesting eccentric, eccentric character. And now I'll continue now that you have that context. The Zionist, along with sympathetic British officials, had already been working on the contours of such a statement. Among these were Mark Sykes, Ronald Graham, Nahum Sakalau, Joseph Cohen, Israel Sif, Simon Marks, Ahad Haim. Leon Simon and Harry Satcher. The version here, dated 18 July 1917, is known as Lord Rothschild's draft. It was based on a rather long and detailed 12 July working draft by the Zionists. They had a long Christmas list, Tony. In his capacity as the titular head of the British Jewish community, Rothschild sent it to Balfour with a cover note mentioning that, if acceptable, he would, quote, hand it on to the Zionist Federation and also announce it at the meeting called for that purpose, end quote. Historian Jonathan Schneer, author of The Balfour Declaration, The Origins of the Arab-Israeli Conflict, is struck by the very first sentence. The use of the term reconstituted, which implies an unbroken link between the Jews and Palestine, despite nearly 2,000 years separation. So you can read on now that you know this is here and you can educate yourself and others around you who might not know. It started with Lord Rothschild's draft. And then you have the one from 2nd August. And this is Balfour. He writes this. He's like, okay, I'm basically giving you the same thing. And they point out some of the differences here. And you can read all about it right there. And Milner, Lord Milner, who was the second in command to Cecil Rhodes and Lord Milner's second war. His first war was the Boer War in Cecil Rhodes, South Africa. Anyone know what his second war was? That's right. World War I. This is World War I, a war that Milner helped to start and he's drafting the Balfour Declaration. And then he gets his buddy from the Cecil Rhodes Roundtable group, Leo Amory, and they write a new improved version. And there's the Milner-Amory draft. So you should look up who is Lord Milner, who is Leo Amory, and you're getting some insight into who's working with Lord Rothschild. Because uh, these people are part of the British colonization effort of Cecil Rhodes. The takeover and reconstitution of America back into the British Empire is what their project is. This is part of it. That's why they're on this project. And then you have the final wording. Dear Lord Rothschild. Right? Let's, let's read it because technically it's one sentence and it's 67 words. Dear Lord Rothschild. Oh, I'm sorry. Foreign Office, November 2nd, 1917. Dear Lord Rothschild. I have much pleasure in conveying to you on behalf of His Majesty's government the following declaration of sympathy with the Jewish Zionist aspirations, which has been submitted to and approved by the cabinet. His Majesty's government view with favor the establishment in Palestine of a national home for the Jewish people and will use their best endeavors to facilitate the achievement of this object. It being clearly understood that nothing shall be done which may prejudice the civil and religious rights of existing non-Jewish communities in Palestine or the rights and political status enjoyed by Jews in any other country. I should be grateful if you would bring this declaration to the knowledge of the Zionist Federation. And here you have what Balfour 100 wants you to know about that in the various aspects. And uh, here's uh, Lord Rothschild. He replied, do you know about this? Did they teach you about this? The Balfour Declaration Postscript. 
Lord Rothschild replied to Foreign Minister Balfour on November 4th, 1917, in a handwritten note. Dear Mr. Balfour, I write to thank you most sincerely for your letter and also for the great interest you have shown in the wishes, wishes of the large mass of the Jewish people and also for the efforts and trouble you have taken on our behalf. I can assure you that the gratitude of 10 millions of people will be yours. For the British government has opened up by their message a prospect of safety and comfort to large masses of people who are in need of it. I dare say to you, I dare say, you have been informed that already in many parts of Russia, renewed persecution has broken out. With renewed thanks to you and His Majesty's government, I remain yours sincerely, Rothschild. Now, an interesting aspect of this, a couple different things. First, Tony, would you look this up for me? When did Arthur Balfour become prime minister over there? Because yeah. if, if it was before this, if he had already been prime minister and now he's doing like his uh, State Department gig or whatever, uh, that's one thing. But if if by doing this, he gets later prime minister, I mean, uh, Rothschilds yeah. were very close with Disraeli back in the day when the Disraeli yeah, right. wanted Benjamin to buy Disraeli. the Suez. Yeah. They wanted the Suez Canal, which was Egypt. When Egypt's, was that? Right? That would have been like 1879? 50s, eight, yeah, 1860s, something 60s, like that. Yeah, so somewhere in that. Okay. Yeah, but when did Balfour be... become prime minister? It is really. That would have been right after the whole young movement so that mazzini and then yes. the british state department of like the 1980s the young 1860s, turks 1870s, the young, young armenians you know, right young italians the young so anyways it's david mm -hmm. Bowen. arthur james balfour first oral balfour mm -hmm. um which i think anyways that's an interesting title I remember we doing research on that a while back anyways this is a uh, he was born july 25th 1848 and died march 19th 1930 also known as lord balfour was a British statesman and conservative politician who served as Prime Minister of the United Kingdom from 1902 to 1905. So he had already been Prime Minister and had strong relations with the people he was a dealing with. A decade before, okay. yep. Yeah, mm -hmm. okay. All right, and then there's this other part right here where Rothschild is saying, I dare say you have been informed that already in parts of Russia, renewed persecution has broken out. It's interesting because the pogroms influenced Edmund Rothschild to colonize in the 1880s in Palestine. Here, the Russian second round of it is creating more movement toward a Zionist endeavor to move people out of there. So now you know they have a plan, but they, but they have a problem. So they've got this promise like and the British will colonize. Problem. Well, the British will colonize, <laughs> but you got to figure out how to get your people to work, like move there. Right. And it's okay, a big this, sales it, problem. That is and the early Zionist founding fathers they did not like the Bolshevism because all of a sudden, with the Jew, with the uh, the Jewish participation in the Bolshevik Revolution, they kind of already realized power and like equality and these sort of things because of the overturning of the the Russian uh, imperial system. So they didn't like that. They wrote about that. They're like, those guys aren't going to want to come with us. That's kind of like you know that was one of the dividing lines. And then there's other people who didn't want to move from Germany or Poland or Czechoslovakia or any of these places. Now, interestingly enough, I happened to learn a long time ago after I already knew a little bit about Balfour. Balfour, he uh, he had a, I think it's his niece and she married a guy named Edward Dugdale. And I'm going to show you that in the history blueprint right here because it's an interesting fact and it does play into like how things uh, work here. So let me just type in, uh, let's see, Blanche Balfour Dugdale. All right. This does tie in. I'll go back to Balfour 100 in a second. So Arthur Balfour's niece is married to this guy named Edgar Dugdale. And Edgar Dugdale is the person responsible for bringing Hitler's memoirs into English in 1925. Now, if you don't have Hitler's memoirs printed into English, I would think you couldn't have too many people in the UK and US supporting the Nazi party. But back then, during like the, the business plot of Smedley Butler and all that sort of stuff, like they were having, uh, you know, Madison Square Garden, Nazi rallies with big like 50 foot George Washington's and swastikas. Like there's pictures of this you can look out there, right? 
So without taking this idea of Hitler and taking it out of Germany and seeding it around, like the King of England had to step down. He had to abdicate because he was a Nazi. There's video of Queen Elizabeth giving a Nazi salute when she's a child. They're like teaching her how to be a Nazi. And then she was in charge for like the longest reign in English monarch history. She's like, well, you know, that was a long time before she handed it off to KC3, King Chucky III. So Edgar Dugdale and Blanche Balfour Dugdale, here she is. Uh, that's an interesting aspect because, again, Zionism had a problem. How do we get our people to move? And then this guy, who's like a washed up artist, comes along and ends up like ticking off a bunch of these boxes. And who didn't move to Israel? The people who got processed through the camps that didn't go with the transfer agreement, that didn't go with the Havara agreement, that didn't go with all these other uh, resources that we have where the Zionists were colluding with the Nazi party. So that's kind of a big deal, too. Also, I want you to notice that as we go back to Balfour 100, the, the people in England and France who drew up the document and kind of created the state of Israel, they never moved there. Right. So they create this mess. And get a lot of well-meaning people involved. I mean, if you tell people they got a right to return and God promised them land and all this stuff and you can move from any country in the world and go over there and that's like, uh, those are well-meaning, well-intentioned many times people who have been severely misinformed by who? Not the enemy. The leadership of the movement has always been misleading the people in that movement. Which is the real enemy. Yeah, it's like, the, yeah that's... People not knowing the difference and how to like and have the intellectuals... Clothing. Yeah. Which yeah. goes back to the Fabian socialists, who are the Ingsoc, the English socialists of 1984, H.G. Wells and those roundtable group people, they're all in the same thing. So yeah, now I think it was a like strategy. a double cross system yeah. before a double cross system. Like they're before essentially they formalized when, it. Yeah. Yeah. So before they formalized World War II. it. And here, just to bolster your point, it says success and stumbles in Russia before World War I, although led by Austrian. This is an article on Wikipedia about Zionism, um, so we can uh, check the references. But just to add some context in, uh, to what you're saying, which is correct, before World War One, although led by Austrian and German Jews, Zionism was primarily composed of Russian Jews. Oh, so they needed the conditions in Russia to exist to force mass pogroms. Oh, interesting. And so continuing on, it says, initially, Zionists were a minority, both in Russia and worldwide. Is what four different references there. Russian Zionism quickly became a major force in the movement, making up about half the delegates of the Zionist Congresses. Despite its success in attracting followers, Russian Zionism faced fierce opposition from the Russian intelligentsia across the political spectrum and socioeconomic classes. It was condemned by different groups as reactionary, messianic, and unrealistic, arguing that it would isolate Jews and exacerbate their circumstances rather than integrate them into European societies. Religious Jews, such as Rabbi Joel uh, Tietelbaum, viewed uh, viewed in Zionism a des uh, desecration of their sacred beliefs and a satanic plot, while others hardly thought it deserved serious attention. For them, Zionism was always seen as an attempt to defy the divine order to await the coming of the Messiah. However, many of these religious Jews still believed in the Messiah coming soon. And, for example, Rabbi Israel Meir Kahan, quote, was so convinced mm. of the imminent arrival of the Messiah that he urged his students to study the laws of the priesthood so the priests would be prepared to carry out their duties when the temple in Jerusalem was rebuilt, end quote. And that and was they... some violence in the 90s, if I remember correctly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're correct. That is correct. Yeah, yeah. That is. Back and then the Bundes Socialists, which are made up of essentially so secular Jewish socialists um, from Russia. But to your point, so those they needed to create the conditions to, ma to force mass pogroms and uh, it, in order to gain the justification, both from an anti-Semitic standpoint to say, well, you don't want them to come to your, you don't want them, you don't want them to go to Germany, you don't want them to go to Britain. They need to go somewhere. And now look, there, there are so many Eastern European Jews mainly come out of the Russian area. That would be the Ashkenazi, you know, the mass conversion in like the, what, in 12th century, somewhere between yeah, the 9th like and 12th year, century. In the year 1000. Yeah, somewhere. Yeah, exactly. And like that, so that makes up that crowd of like sort of Eastern European Russian speaking natives that converted to Judaism. And now they're looking for what to do with them. And on the, so what is curious about that is how Theodore Herzl became sort of the spokesperson for that because he was sort of marginalized for a large, if I remember correctly, I need to follow up on my research of that. But I thought in the beginning he was well, he's, largely you know, unknown and marginalized, sort of like Hitler Floyd, was a struggling you know? artist. He was a struggling writer. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Fair enough. He found powerful people with an agenda and he made himself a useful idiot for that useful agenda. Idiot. Very yeah. Machiavellian of him. Yeah, that's true. That's the perfect analogy. Good, well said.
Awesome. All right. So uh, wrapping this up, there is a timeline on Balfour100.com. You guess when it starts? 1250 BCE to answer this question of why the <laughs> British gave away land that they didn't have. You know, I like to point oh, people over man. here. I've got 31 volumes of the Warren Commission report owned by a former United States senator. And my point always is, if they if they give you enough words, you'll believe the thing. In this case, to make you think that it's an alone gunman, they needed 31 volumes to make you believe that that's what really happened. What you don't see is the testimony that they took but excluded because it would be inconvenient to their narrative, oh, which brings aspects. you back to here. What things in this timeline, you know, that are relevant to the narrative <laughs> have not been mentioned? You know, we could we could criticize these sort of oh, things all yeah, night. There the is a small of jump of a couple thousand years in the timeline. And then all of a sudden. So anyway, there's a who's who. And I, again, you want to know the general grammar of the situation? Who is Balfour? Who is Lord Walter Rothschild? Who's Kyle Weitzman? Who's Herzl? Who, you know, the, the character, David Lloyd George, Leo yeah, Amory, right? This is like, this is a Cecil Rhodes round table guy. Like all these people, first off, are in the history blueprint. Let's type right. in Amory, Leo there's a couple different Amory's in here. Oh, yeah. oh he looks There's like Julian he was up to some stuff. Probably Cecil Rhodes, apartheid South Africa, British put, Israelism, put your, British um, Israel brain World. On. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Yeah. British Israel World Federation, eugenics. Yeah, Julian Amory, son of Leo Amory. Yeah, Sykes. Yeah, okay. Oh, well, influenced uh, Zev Jabotinsky. Didn't he have something to do with something back in the day? So, like, these are interesting elements to learn about. If you want to understand how the world really works, it, it has changed in the last hundred years, but in many ways it hasn't changed because some of these things are multi-generational projects that they do, like bringing America back into the British Empire. So like, you know, that's the legacy of Cecil Rhodes and Milner, Lord Milner, the round table, like that, that's part of the Balfour Declaration. So if you don't know about this cat and what he's up to in this context, you really don't have a clue about what's going on in the Middle East, and maybe you shouldn't advocate genocide so easily. You should take a closer look at the starving women and children of the numbers of 2 million people. Also, I want to cover real quick, because, you know, spoiler alert, we'll find out later, U.S. dropped aid to the starving Gazans. Um, here's how that looked. Israel tried to deliver aid, and there was the flower massacre. 700 people got injured, 100 people got killed. So a couple of days later, United States... We dropped the airdrop, right? We dropped 38,000 meals for 2.5 starving, 2.5 million starving people. And I looked up and the busiest McDonald's in the world can serve 40,000 meals a day. So they would be better off just like dropping a McDonald's over there. So at least they'd crank out meals daily. Whereas Rich, that's like, a brilliant juxtaposition between like the power of market forces and efficiency and the power of, you know, uh, trying to regulate that and predict demand and things of that nature through socialist um, forecasting. I think that's so hilarious because right there, it's like, yeah, private people, private business will find the most efficient way to get it done. 40,000 a day, but one. I'm not saying Palestinians oh, deserve McDonald's. No, it's not it's like the healthy point, food. The point is but like, the point can, is like they could give more food. Like, yeah. and yeah, so that they whole situation is being done on purpose. Also, I, I wanted to show you when you click in on any of those people on the last page, here's Leo Amory author of the Balfour Declaration. Yeah, I mean, Lord Rothschild, does he write his own stuff? He said, Leo, write this up for me, okay? Uh, reactions, resources, uh, events, right? It's too too late for the event. But, you know, th for educating people, this is a much better resource than what most people are passing around as, you know, understanding it. And as you saw, even Al Jazeera can't afford to give you the full context like what you're about to see in these next clips, because now that Jacob Rothschild has passed and his great uncle was the addressee on that Balfour Declaration. And we have that video that everyone can freely play because now it's in the news. It's not pointing out inconvenient facts at an inconvenient time. This is the point in the news cycle when it's authoritative. You're allowed to talk about it because Mr. Burns just I mean, Jacob Rothschild just passed this past week. So uh, we do want to take a couple of minutes and uh, commemorate his his life's work. And then we'll get into his relationship with Marina Abramovich after these clips. So let's go to the first clip, which is going to come from... Oh, I didn't press button yet. There you go. First clip is coming up from Sabby Sabs. Uh, Sabrina does good... Uh, how do they say? Like in YouTube culture today, it's a, it's a reaction channel. She's uh, you know watching stuff and then commenting and showing you stuff that you might not have seen. So in this clip... Uh, she's oh, learning. Yeah, it's kind of like what I mean, a lot <laughs> of people do. Only you know, we do we do a whole lot at once, and like she does her. 
couple hours at a time, right? Uh, I so, see, I see. Okay. yeah, yeah. So, uh, more like Tim Pool style. <clears throat> this is long Ish. form content. <laughs> this is long form content because you want to have the evidence in the time capsule in the future and not just like some abbreviated version. So, when we get to like the hammer and the, the, the hammer and the anot, no, that's not, uh, that's a not what it's titled. It's called the hammer and the anvil about the New York Times misrepresentation of the Gaza, uh, hammer and anvil. And that's Hamas. like, uh, that's, that's a some traditional communist stuff. I know. Yeah. We'll get to the ham hammer and sick warfare. Hammer and sicker. All right. So, we're this, Alexandering the Great now, Hammer and Anvil style. Yeah. We're going to go to this first clip from Savvy Sabs called They Started It, meaning they, the people, they, them, those who can easily be named, they're listed on this page. You can see who started it and you can learn the history from there. And uh, in this report, uh, we're then going to transition to the next story, which is just LD is going to pick any random one minute from Marina Abramovich's Rothschild Foundation lecture at the Royal Academy or Royal Archive. And then we'll get into uh, that picture on the other side. We also have at the end of the block, uh, really graceful's 15 minute documentary on Jacob Rothschild, very minimal overlap between her report and Savvy's Cause I think they both have different angles and perspectives uh, that they're bringing together on this. So let's go ahead into this block. Well-informed on the background of this story unfolding. We're moving on to the next story about Lord Jacob Rothschild. Now, Lord Jacob Rothschild uh, was a financier. He actually just died at age 87. But that's not the big part about this story. We need to dive into a little bit about the Rothschild uh, and who they are in reference to the state of Israel. So it says Lord Jacob Rothschild, fi uh, uh, financier, dies age 37. Oh, this is him. Sorry. That's him. It says in a statement on Monday, his family called Lord Rothschild a towering presence in many people's lives. His career began at the family bank in M. Rothschild and Sons before starting his own wealth management fund. He was also known for his philanthropy. Former Prime Minister Tony Blair paid tribute to his dear friend, describing him as a wonderful human being. This is interesting. Born in Berkshire in 1936, Lord Rothschild was educated at Eton College and went on to study history at Christ Church, Oxford. He joined the family bank in 1963, but left in 1980 after a falling out with his cousin, Sir Evelyn D. Rothschild. He went on to build his own financial empire in the city of London, founding investment trust RIT Capital, which he chaired until 2019. The Rothschild family has an estimated fortune of about 825 million pounds, according to last year's Sunday Times rich list. I believe that should be about 1 billion in US dollars. Lord Rothschild was described as a superbly accomplished financier, a champion of the arts and culture, a devoted public servant, a passionate supporter of charitable causes in Israel and Jewish culture, a keen environmentalist and much loved friend, father and grandfather in a statement released by his family. Lord Rothschild also held roles, including deputy chairman at B Sky B Television, director of RHJ International, now known as BHF Klein Wart Benson Group, and was a member of the Council for the Duchy of Cornwall for the then Prince of Wales. So we need to show something about the Rothschilds, okay? Because they were more than just financiers. I mean the whole damn family. I want you to hear about the Rothschild family in reference to the creation of the state of Israel. Let's, let's take a look at this. In modern Jewish history, and it begins with three words. Dear Lord Rothschild. Dear Lord Rothschild, I have much pleasure in conveying to you on behalf of His Majesty's government the following declaration of sympathy with Jewish Zionist aspirations, which has been submitted to and approved by the cabinet. 
pause. Everyone take a look at this letter. This letter was written November 2nd of 1917. This is the letter that declares a Jewish state and Zionism. Now, this is prior to World War II. So when people say that the Zionist state was created because of World War II, or that Zionism was created because of World War II, this was already decided upon prior to World War II. This is 1917. So this is the Balfour Declaration. Why was it that this letter was sent by the Foreign Secretary to your great uncle Walter? It's an interesting question because it was primarily a movement from Eastern Europe, but they didn't clarify who was in charge of that movement. And in addition, it was after all in Great Britain. So they felt that the Rothschild family um, should be the one to whom it was addressed. Okay, did, you, did everybody hear that? The Zion, he's telling you, this is Jacob Rothschild, this is the one who just passed away. He's telling you the movement started in Eastern Europe. And Walter was Lord Rothschild and he was uh, a Zionist. And um, those rarely are the background reasons. So Walter received the Balfour Declaration, and, and I have a copy here. And I wonder if I could possibly ask you to read it for us. Yes, indeed. Yeah. <clears throat> I'm going to put on my spectacles to make sure I read it accurately. His Majesty's Government view with favour the establishment of Palestine of a national home for the Jewish people and will use their best endeavours to facilitate the achievement of this object, it being clearly understood that nothing shall be done which may prejudice the civil and religious rights of existing non-Jewish communities in Palestine, or the rights and political status enjoyed by Jews in any other country. Pause for a second. So you see what, what has happened, right? This piece right here, it says, nothing shall be done which may prejudice the civil and religious rights of existing non-Jewish communities in Palestine or the rights and political status enjoyed by Jews in any other country. So you see this? Obviously, this part right here was not upheld, the non-Jewish communities. Country. I should be grateful if you would bring this declaration to the knowledge of the Zionist Federation. Yours, Arthur Balfour. And here it is, the Balfour Declaration. What do you feel when you, when you see it here? I genuinely feel it's one of the most extraordinary moments in the history of the Jewish people. I do think it took 3,000 years uh, to get to this. And then you say, how did this miracle happen? And it's the most incredible piece of opportunism. I mean, if you think you had an impoverished uh, would-be scientist, Heim Weizmann, who somehow gets to England, meets a few people, including members of my family, seduces them. He has such great charm and conviction. He gets to Balfour, and he unbelievably persuades Balfour and Lloyd George, the Prime Minister, and most of the ministers that this idea of um, the national home for um, Jews should be allowed to take place. I mean, it's so, so unlikely. It, it... You hear this, right? And his voice just cracks me up, by the way. Well, the song's unlikely, right? So see how all the effort that was willing... By the way, just think about the time. 1917, Okay. See what they were willing to do for Jewish people. See what they were willing to do, right? 1917. And what was still happening to descendants of slavery in the United States? 1917, right? Nobody 
ever went this far to create a place where descendants of slavery could feel safe. Nobody, no one. Never forget that. And then he's, you know, starts to fight a difficult battle with the British cabinet and this uh, letter goes through five drafts, as you know. And in the end, it comes out as a rather compromising letter. I mean, the essential point is there for um, the Jewish community to fasten on to. You have the first bit, which promises a national home rather than the national home. You see this? First part promises a national home. And then you have the bit that nothing that's to be done should um, in any way harm the Arab community. But... But this is important. Nothing should be done to harm, he said, the Arab community. But the language here is non-Jewish communities. So obviously, that part of the bargain was not up upheld. You see this? You come back to the big point, which is that this is perhaps the greatest event in Jewish life for thousands of years. And it's a miracle. They started this, okay? They started this. In fact, believe it or not, not everyone that was a part of the Rothschild family actually agreed with Zionism. Now, here's the piece you may not be aware of. Jewish identity and positions on Zionism. Jewish solidarity in the family was not homogenous. Many Rothschilds were supporters of Zionism, while other members of the family opposed the creation of a Jewish state. In 1917, Walter Rothschild, second Baron Rothschild, was the addressee of the Balfour Declaration to the Zionist Federation, which committed the British government, whoops, I think I went up too far. Oh, here we go. The British government to the establishment in Palestine of a national home for the Jewish people. His nephew, Victor, Lord Rothschild, was against granting asylum or helping Jewish refugees in 1938. So just listen to this, guys. This is going to show you not everybody in the family was on board with this. After the death of James Jacob D. Rothschild in 1868, his eldest son, Alphonse Rothschild, took over the management of the family bank and was the most active in support for Eretz Israel. The Rothschild family archives show that during the 1870s, the family contributed nearly 500,000 francs per year on behalf of Eastern Jewry to the Alliance Israelite Universalit. So I wanted you to see this because I wanted you to understand that it wasn't everybody, but obviously the loudest voices were heard. Now, check this out. It says here, they bring up Netanyahu. Interviewed by Heretz in two, uh, 2010, Baron Benjamin Rothschild, who was a Swiss-based member of the banking family, said he supported the Israeli-Palestinian peace process. I understand that it is a complicated business. See the language? What I tell you, still using the word complicated. I told you it's not. Mainly because of the fanatics and extremists, and I'm talking about both sides. I think you have fanatics in Israel. In general, I am not in contact with the politicians. I spoke once with Netanyahu. I met once with an Israeli finance minister. But the less I mingle with the politicians, the better I feel. There are places in Israel named after Rothschild family members. So you can see this, Zikron, Yaakov, a town named, or excuse me, a town founded in 1882 and named after benefactor's father, James Jacob Mayor D. Rothschild. So they even have towns there named after family members. Isn't that something? So I wanted you to see that because I wanted you to see what these people are really about. That's who started all of this. That's where all this comes from. The creation of it and everything. Look at what they started. 
talk about performance art because it's such a particular form of art. It's not a stand-up comedy, it's not a dance, it's not a theater. Performance art is it's what, if I can have explanation, I could say that performance art is a mental and physical construction that you made in specific time and space in the front of audience, and then energy dialogue will happen. So in performance, knife is real knife and blood is real blood. So you're not, oh, hello. <laughs> no, I see friends here, it's so nice. So, I will start immediately because really not much time. So the first thing that I want to tell you is the really the beginning of my career when I was reckless, I was uh, fearless, and I really want to experiment everything. So this is a performance called Rhythm Zero, which I made in Naples, and I was 23 years old. I have all these objects on the table, including the gun with the one bullet. I ask public, that I'm object and you can use anything on me as you wish for six full hours. You know, it was a really dangerous thing to do because I relate everything to the public and I want to see how, how far public can go and what they can do to you. In the beginning, you know, in the first hour, two hours, it was people use soap, cake, uh, uh, bell, uh, the, 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 the shoes, the chair, so very harmless uh, things. And then later on, they really start being very, 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 very aggressive. They will cut my clothes and they will give me a rose, but they will take pins of the rose and stop in my, in my body. They will, uh, they will uh, hold me around uh, the space, put me on the table, spread my la legs and put the knife between. The woman will do what, uh, will say men what to do to me and they will take tears of my eyes. So this went for six hours, and um, it was long. Hey, Internet friends. On Monday, February 26, 2024, Jacob Rothschild was reported dead. He was heir to the Rothschild banking dynasty, a family who was notorious for financing every side of every recent war, a family intimately associated with the Federal Reserve, He's an important figure to discuss as much of what his family has taken credit for. We're seeing the consequences of these actions play out today. The name Rothschild is synonymous with current events even though they like to orchestrate from behind the scenes. For example, before World War II in 1917, the British Foreign Secretary wrote a letter to Lionel Walter Rothschild. This was called the Balfour Declaration, and in it he said that the British government supported a Jewish state in Palestine which of course emboldened the Zionist movement and eventual establishment of Israel. Obviously, that's a big deal today because everyone's still fighting over it. The hard truth is that Israel is a common denominator in every major conflict we see play out across the world stage. And here it is, the Balfour Declaration. What do you feel when you, when you see it here? I genuinely feel it's one of the most extraordinary moments in the history of the Jewish people. I do think it took 3,000 years uh, to get to this. And then you say, how did this miracle happen? It's the most incredible piece of opportunism. Talking about the Rothschild family can be kind of touch and go. And I'm not talking about just the censorship aspect of this. In a sense, they're the manifestation of this reality's boogeyman. And they're dedicated to their role. For an example, here's a picture of Jacob Rothschild with Marina Abramovic in front of a painting entitled Satan Summoning His Legions. Of course, Marina Abramovic is responsible for greatest hits like spirit cooking as she was one of the central figures of Pizzagate. Zelensky even asked Marina Abramovic to be the ambassador to Ukraine back in 2023. And you remember all this discourse about Ukraine being the new Israel. It's almost too perfect, it feels too scripted to be true. All that's really needed are faint echoes of maniacal laughter playing on a loop in the background. But of course, never mention blood libel. It's just a anti-Semitic conspiracy theory. Uh, the Rothschilds are so openly proud of their queer practices that they just brag about it. Here's Jacob Rothschild talking about how his family kept power within the family through inbreeding. And Baron James was head of the Paris branch and the youngest of the five sons of our actual Rothschild gave an astonishingly uninhibited description of the 19th century Rothschild policy of keeping it in the family. I'll quote to you from what he wrote and make you smile. In our family, we've always tried to keep love 
in the family. <laughs> in this sense, it was more or less understood since childhood that children would never think of marrying outside the family so that our fortune would never leave it. <laughs> you couldn't write that today. <laughs> And, you know, Jacob Rothschild's reported death really means nothing. I've heard rumors that he's actually the father of Princess Diana's first son, William, which would be very interesting timing considering the current state of King Charles. But again, those are just rumors and they're easily dismissed. In fact, there's all kinds of rumors about this family that seem so strange it could never be possible. But their timeline of accolades truly demonstrates that reality is stranger than fiction. Also, I just want to say I've seen people celebrating this guy's death across social media saying that since Henry Kissinger is dead and the old Rockefeller guy is dead and now Jacob Rothschild, they think the New World Order is over because these figureheads are dead. But if you just look around, you realize that's totally silly because the majority are sucked into their phones and shot up with the latest medical potion and handing over every ounce of information to the surveillance grid for free, by the way. Eating poisoned food and still wearing, some Some people are still wearing face masks in the Costco. I've seen y'all, I've made eye contact with y'all. But for me, this is simply an educational opportunity on showing those who are curious on how the world really works from a historical perspective in hopes that we can collectively notice patterns and avoid mistakes of the past. My Rothschild family documentary has been hidden on YouTube since I put it up, age restricted, so I'm going to play it for you now. Hey internet friends, chances are if you've spent any amount of time trying to figure out how the world really operates, you've stumbled upon the name Rothschild a time or two during your travels. While Rothschild isn't a household name like Bush or Clinton, the Rothschilds play a lead role on the global stage. But unlike our political figureheads, we have no say in their rule, much less a say in how they rule. In fact, what I've noticed is that if you even dare suggest that the Rothschilds or any other family or corporation is playing puppeteer, you'll get labeled an anti-Semitic conspiracy theorist at some point in your venture. But in an effort to reveal what was once hidden, let us cast away the fear of being laughed at or shunned. This won't be an exhaustive video on the Rothschilds, but if you're new around here, I hope to give you enough information to spark your interest so you'll do your own research. And maybe, in a not too distant future, we can all work together to formulate some solutions. Some peaceful solutions. While not the only ruling body near the top of the pyramid, the House of Rothschild, their Jesuit handlers, and most importantly, the driving force behind their actions, are all certainly worthy of discussion, don't you think? The real owners, the big wealthy business interests that control things and make all the important decisions. They don't want a population of citizens capable of critical thinking. They don't want well-informed, well-educated people capable of critical thinking. They're not interested in that. The Rothschilds claim to be a wealthy Jewish banking family that got their start in 1760 when Mayor Rothschild established his banking dynasty and sent his five sons to foreign countries to continue the family business. At least that's what the majority of their published story claims, but this is just one token in a jingling coin purse of tricks. The story of the House of Rothschild begins long before the 18th century. The Rothschilds are Khazar Jews who converted to Judaism but never made the full conversion. While this is a sensitive and complicated matter, to research and discuss, much less. If you follow the Bible, take note that the Bible warns of fake Jews, not once, but twice. Another tip off is that their name isn't really Rothschild. The family did the old switcheroo and changed from Bauer to Rothschild, using the red shield outside their residence as inspiration for their new identity. Rothschild, German for red shield. Here's where the published history usually begins. After establishing himself as a banker through a series of tactics like offering rare coins and treasure at a discount to nobility, Mayor Rothschild secured himself as a member in the in-crowd, 
getting in good with the Prince of Germany by assisting with his rental troop business. And as a court Jew, he lent money and handled the finances of the nobility. And when Mayor Rothschild sent his five sons to expand their family business to London, Paris, Frankfurt, Vienna, and Naples, their banks caught on by using a system where you could go deposit your gold at a Rothschild bank in one country, get a receipt for it, take that receipt to another country and withdraw your gold so during your travels you wouldn't be separated from what is yours by theft or any other misfortune. And while that was a pretty novel idea, it's important to note that a key function of banks in general is to offer loans and charge interest. That's how they profit. But when this system goes unregulated and the bankers assess a desperate need for money, thus charging an exorbitant interest rate to loan out that money, that's when things go south. Because when a person or a government is faced with the prospect of either losing human life or taking on interest for a loan, well, most folks are going to go the interest route since human life is priceless. The ideology or motivation behind this greed is one of the major factors of how we got here today. That's the basic foundation, but let's get to the real meat and potatoes of the story. The wavering moral compass that led to immense wealth. While the Rothschilds had a hand in the opium and slave trades, the City of London's central banking system, counterfeit money, and the French Revolution, I told y'all this was going to be an accelerated history. I don't want y'all to have to sip from your camelbacks and slip on a pair of Depends to watch a single video of mine, so let's move on to the Rothschilds' funding of American colonies, their role in the American Civil War, and the series of events that led to the creation of the big kicker, the Federal Reserve. The American Civil War was financed by the House of Rothschild. They backed both sides. And throughout this video, you'll notice this trend. The funding of both sides stirs and finances the hatred for both sides. And since war is profit, especially when bankers are the ones who profit from the loans the government takes out, at one point, Abraham Lincoln needed more money. And the rates he was offered by the New York bankers were too high. Thus, he began printing government money. Take note that this money, unlike the money issued by the Federal Reserve today, collected no interest. Thus, Lincoln managed to work around the Rothschilds. But less than two months before the end of the American Civil War, President Lincoln was assassinated. You might notice another trend, the trend of dying figureheads anytime they go against the money trust, or the main belief that the majority of the world's financial wealth and political power could be controlled by a powerful few. Now that we've laid out their basic strategy, which is to cause wars or help them out, give them a little nudge through some provocation resulting in maybe a crisis or two. Loans are dished out at exorbitant interest rates on both sides of the wars. Then when both of those governments can't repay those debts, the Rothschild Bank calls in the loans and takes possession, installing a central bank. In 1913, the same year the Rothschild funded Anti-Defamation League was founded, the Federal Reserve, the central bank of the United States, was conceived. It is neither federal or owned by the government. The Federal Reserve is privately owned, which means it generates private wealth. Guess who benefits? Not the American people. One year after the creation of the Federal Reserve, World War I began, pitting the Allied and Central Powers against each other. Guess who was funding both sides again? You guessed it. And the result was the fall of the German, Russian, Ottoman, and Austro-Hungarian empires. But who cares if there's money to be made off both of the winning and losing sides? After all, it brings us closer to a one-world government, doesn't it? And a one-world government means a central global bank. In 1917, through the Balfour Declaration, the British government expressed their support for a Jewish homeland in Palestine. The letter was written to none other than Baron Lionel Walter Rothschild. With the Versailles Treaty of 1919, Britain was entrusted with the temporary administration of Palestine. Now I'm sure you know where I'm going with this. With the Rothschild bankers funding both the Axis and the Allies, the Second World War brought us closer to a one-world government with the establishment of the United Nations. 
But money wasn't the only thing that the Rothschilds contributed to the Second World War. According to a book by psychoanalyst Walter Langer, not only was Hitler supported by the Rothschilds, he was a Rothschild. Hitler's father was the illegitimate son of a girl who was living in Vienna at the time she conceived. And at that time, she was employed as a servant in the home of Baron Rothschild. Go ahead, but pull as it. soon as the family discovered her. All right. So uh, a lot of good information in those clips. I wanted to pull it right there because the Langer report was developed by OSS and MI6 right. as a piece of propaganda. And I do need to nip that it's fake yeah. in the bud. So let's go over here to History Blueprint. Let's go to Langer. And we definitely to... have covered this before, but it's good to yes. refresh because it's not. Yeah, that was a right. Psy war yeah. propaganda campaign. So uh, once upon a time, Hitler. Yeah. Office of Special Services, Walter Langer, who worked with Henry Murray of MKUltra. He developed the Langer Report, The Mind of Adolf Hitler. It's a psych psychological analysis of the personality of Adolf Hitler. And then you can read it right there. And it would look like this if we went to archive.org. And it would pop up and you can read the report and you can go through it page by page. And if we did a search in the document, how do I do search right here? Search. And let's do R-O-T-H-S-G-L-D. Rothschild. No matches are found. I'm sure it's in there someplace. Uh, but it goes back to the fact that uh, the report is developed by PSYOPs. And in there... Wouldn't it be like from the British and American side, this is their thinking. Wouldn't it be great for Hitler's people to have these doubts because he is a bastard child from a Rothschild. Basically what they said was uh, the Schickle Gruber mother was working for yeah, the Viennese right. Lord Rothschild type character back in the day. And then, you know, as uh, things ha tend to happen and all of a sudden like uh, Adolf Alawa, Hitler, whatever his name was, uh, was uh, was brought into the picture. I don't know about that, but it is a real historical document and you can read it. You just have to not take it as essential fact of the situation because uh, it's been shown to not be very, very credible. Reliable. Yeah, right. here's the history of the report. It says here the wartime report was commissioned by the head of the OSS, William J. Quote unquote Wild Bill Donovan. Yeah. The research and investigation for it was done in collaboration with three other clinicians, Professor Henry A. Murray of the Harvard Psychological Clinic, Dr. Ernest, Ernst Chris of the New School for Social Research, and Dr. Yes. Bertram D. Lewin ooh, of the New York Psychoanalytic Institute, as well as research associates Langer notes in his introduction to the book that one of the three essentially dropped out of the project because he was too busy with other work, but he gives no names. And yes. so, yeah, it's just as uh, those people, those names are uh, damning enough. So, yeah, it should be that definitely take that with a grain of salt and much more so than that. Yes. And then you guys, but her uh, other facts are pretty solid. It was just yes, that yeah, one. Yeah. She does, she does, you know, awesome work. And every now and then we don't, you know, all of us like can make mistakes. We're human beings. Oh, absolutely. Well intentioned as we may be. A that is a real uh, historical report. And it is worthy of study. Like you should read it, but just understand that this is psychological warfare op that exactly. they were developing to cause little problems. And the project that they had created and kind of like managed over there, because it was a lot of uh, Anglo American establishment funding during uh, the 1920s in creating what became the Nazi infrastructure. I mean, all of a sudden, out of nowhere, a group of people who aren't allowed to have an army are like one of the best powered and like armed up and dressed by Hugo, Hugo Boss, right? Like that whole project was a meticulous, that's somebody's project. And then they, the people who owned that project, they took the Nazi paperclip scientists and so did Russia too, because there's also a connection to who that's took over Russia yeah, with the Bolshevik been... revolution. It's wealth yeah. reappropriation of a, the world's biggest country, Russia, right? So like that, that whole project and, and experimentation is an exploitation from the outside by the cartel capitalists, while on the inside, they run it like communism at the bottom. And there's always capitalism at the top of all those societies because like the, the money is used to control stuff. They just don't tell their people. Like they they run two different systems, right? So uh, they don't want other people to compete for those goods and services or provide those goods and services, and that's the difference. It's a state owned, and they, that means it's uh, ruled by force. So it might makes right. 
intellectual bankruptcy That's is what demonstrated is. with violence. All right. So we also heard about Marina Abramovich and you got to hear like, that's just one minute of her presentation. That's the spirit cooking lady from the WikiLeaks Podesta emails with Lynn Forrester de Rothschild, who's married to Sir Evelyn de Rothschild, who is the cousin of Jacob Rothschild, who just passed away. So I, we're over here on Twitter. And anytime you want to find something on my page, you just type in my handle. And Sir Hold Evelyn, on. I think, was the one for the you know, the Rio conference in ninety one or whatever. Was he? No, that that's one? a different guy. No, no, no but he's the one that guy. he he uh, honeymooned in the White House. Uh, and you, you can find that on here too. That like, one. Uh, okay, so I'll show you Abramovic real quick. This is how you find anything on anybody's page. You put their handle colon plus whatever you're searching. So Abramovich, I said this. Here's the Rothschild Foundation lecture. Here's uh, the Rothschild Foundation website. Here's the invitation. Here's the whole thing, right? This is a real thing that happened. So, oh, sorry. Let's go back. So, 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 so sorry. What? I hope I'm not doxing anybody. And I lost my search. Let's see if we just go back two searches. Let's try it again. There we go. Here's the lecture at Rothschild Foundation circa 2019. And uh, this is the location of Satan Summons his Legion's painting. Right. So she was at the place that Rothschild funded. So it does make sense that they could get their picture taken in front of that picture like that. Uh, Zelensky asked Satanist. I didn't. Is that, did I say Satanist? Oh, geez. Maybe. No, no, no. I copied. I'm sorry. I copied. This is an article title. This is not me saying this. This is just me pasting an article. Marina Abramovich to be Ukrainian ambassador. Here's another clip about the ambassador for Ukraine. Now, she also had a Microsoft commercial. And I wanted to look that up as well because once upon a time, back in 2012, Microsoft ran a commercial and the song was Witchcraft. And everybody's walking around looking at their devices. LD, can you look up this Microsoft commercial, the Witchcraft? And so everyone's got their new devices and they're walking around. Is that the one they released on Easter? They're falling down manholes. No, this is like this is like you know, 10 years ago. And uh. then Microsoft later did the Marina Abramovich uh, straight up, uh, like, I don't know if it was AI or what they're advertising, yeah. right? but I want people to see It was this the, here in 2020. Here. Uh, Microsoft deletes Marina Abramovich advertisement after right wing right. outcry over alleged Satanism. <laughs> in 2016, artist Marina Abramovich became the unexpected target of right wing ire. After internet users claimed to have uncovered connections between her performances and Satanism, and it goes on to say, uploaded by Microsoft on April 10th, the video is an advertisement for the HoloLens 2, a headset that allows users to see digital imagery with the outside world still in their head, still in their view. And there is a, this is a obviously very biased towards yeah, her. Yeah. This was and then, uh, so, Vigilance, like, here's Vigilance Citizen on it, you can check it out later. But. And then, so, uh, you know, back in the 2012 Microsoft advertisement, they're playing the song, It's Witchcraft. Yeah, yeah. Uh, no, that's not it, LD. That's the recent one. Um, see, and now it's even hard to find because they did something with Abramovich, and now when you search Microsoft Witchcraft commercial, it brings up her commercial, and not the one where they showed you that people are going to be lost in these devices before VR even came into the picture in the Apple goggles or whatever they got floating around out there. Like people were like this walking around, falling over, you know, but crashing their bikes, crashing their cars, falling in manholes, all this sort of stuff. And then they play that song in the background, you know, it's witchcraft, you know, popularized by Frank Sinatra back in the day when he was working with the mafia to become uh, Kennedy's advisor for president, those sort of things that happen back here. So if it's easily found, if not, uh, I can continue searching for it, but also I wanted to bring up in regards to Jacob Rothschild, and there's a couple more loose ends we got to tie up here. Um, Jacob Rothschild, there he is with David Rockefeller. There's the original uh, Balfour Declaration. We've looked at that. We're going to get to the shekel here in a minute because this is a real thing commemorating Baron Edmund de Rothschild, who by now in this episode you are familiar with. You're like, I know who that guy is. And you'll learn to recognize his face because he's one of the two that helped to create the state of Israel. Uh, lots of tweets. So if you wanted to find historically tweets of Jacob Rothschild, and here he is with, uh, I don't know, this guy, the prime minister. We took him down the, a couple weeks ago. We dismantled his whole argument in Hasbara. There he is with Jacob Rothschild looking at the document that created the state of which he's a prime minister. There he is with Marina Abramovic and... Uh, Satan summoning his legions by Sir Thomas Lawrence, 1797. He's a very popular painter back then. Is the painting in front of which uh, Marina Abramovich and Jacob Rothschild were pictured in 2020. So then that's why I had looked up, like, what are the actual, let's make sure that everyone's got their I's and T, uh, I's dotted and 
T's crossed. Uh, nine years after the Balfour Declaration, uh, Jacob Rothschild has passed. And here's live from Tel Aviv, Michael Rappaport telling you, don't tell me there wasn't Jews here before 1948. Well, we were telling you since 1880 is when that started. But uh, so anyway, catching up on some of the aspects of the Rothschild brothers and their work in Palestine. Uh, you can read all about it. This is some of the stuff that maybe inspired Marina Abramovich to do very similar spirit cooking type presentations. This is the Rothschild Ball from 1972, and it was held by uh, Guy de Rothschild. So that's French Rothschild's type activity over there. And lots more to be learned, Simpsons memes, and more. Now, there was also a part in there by Sabrina, and she was on this page right here. So before I go to the, the paragraph that she kind of like uh, just went over, like uh, it's this paragraph right here. It's very substantial, and I think it needs to be entered into the record. Let me first take you to the top of this page. So it was pretty easy to find. Wikipedia, Rothschild family. Now, it's a long page, so I'm going to give you a little quick tour of this page because it is a very important page. Like, if you're going to read any historical entry, this is one of the most interesting you could dig into because it's very substantial and not a lot of people want to talk about the substance and meaning of the whole thing. The Rothschild family is a wealthy Ashkenazi Jewish fa noble banking family originally from Frankfurt that rose to prominence with Meyer Amschel Rothschild, uh, a court factor. That's what that means. Uh, to the German land graves of Hesse Kassel in the free city of Frankfurt, Holy Roman Empire, who established his banking business in his 1760s. So before America was founded, uh, he's working for the guy who rents out troops to the British Empire to kind of do their uh, colonizing work. And that's how that's a, how he gets his claim to fame. So you can find uh, that little summary. And here's an overview. And I want you to keep uh, keep your eye as we scroll down all these properties that they've had over the years. And I want you to think of the other richest people that you might know about. Your Zuckerbergs, your, your Bezoses, your Gateses, your Rockefellers, your Vanderbilts, your Morgans. And I want you to compare, or even prime ministers' palaces for countries. I want you to compare it to what this family has built for themselves over the year. They were so influential that they had their own style called Le Gout Rothschild, and it meant the Rothschild style. So the Vanderbilt mansion in America is built after the Rothschild family houses. It's, it's styled in their style. Uh, same with Rockefeller and other robber barons of America who were dependent on this banking empire for their wealth and power. So here's an overview. Uh, you can see this is uh, the house of the, the Rothschild family in Frankfurt. Very modest, humble. Uh, they also lived in the Green Shield, the Green Shield house. So it's not just Red Shield. They also lived in the Green Shield house. That's where they trained the Warburgs. Uh, here's one of their houses and estates. Here's another estate. They come to prominence in the Napoleonic Wars. Here's more estates here. Here's more estates here. Look at these buildings. Well, I mean, this is this is some pretty serious stuff. This looks like the capital of a country here, and it's just a, a chateau in France. Okay, influential Waterloo. A lot of con controversial history. Very interesting artifacts to be studied about this whole area. International high finance, they invent international banking and insurance with the Alliance Assurance Company of 1824, which still exists today. The Rio Tinto Mining Company, right? There's some very valuable, De Beers, some very valuable resources that were collected along the way. Again, keep looking at this. Mentmore Towers, you've seen this in Batman, you've seen this in like Eyes Wide Shut and other, maybe it was Chateau Ferrier. Uh, these are movie palaces right some of these are actually you can see tours they're vacant and people go in there with cameras and walk around it's fascinating to see uh the richness of it over here the family funded cecil Rhodes in the creation of african colony of rhodesia they kind of left out south africa there and his work there uh, that's convenient to people who are reading the page but maybe inconvenient to their education uh Nathan Rothschild is the most powerful man in Britain. Failed verification, but there are two other footnotes for that claim. The Niles Weekly Register, Volume 49 of 1836. Now, I, okay, I have an 1835 one. Do I have this quote? Yes, I do. I have the original newspaper clipping of this quote here. But again, this is a claim. It's unsubstantiated, but it's later proven in history to kind of like prove to be true. This is, you know, foreshadowing the, the state of Israel. 
And this is 1836 when the Sultan was still dealing with uh, various offers for that country. Changes to the family fortune, various wars. Uh, some of the Rothschilds uh, stuff was taken in Germany. Interestingly enough, the family moved its banking out of Germany in like 1908, right before World War One, And they didn't reopen in Germany until recently, like last couple decades. So the Rothschilds who were left behind might have been like the black sheeps of the family that weren't let in on the other bigger picture. So it's a very interesting angle to study. And I have many, many, many autobiographies, biographies of the Rothschild family in their own words, telling these stories. It's very fascinating. It's like reading, you know, 20 Mario Puzo novels all about the same family because it's like some gangster hijacking uh, black market type stuff in the early days and maybe up through well the, maybe the present we'll see uh in addition the new york times wrote the rothschilds quote grossly misjudged the opportunities directly across the atlantic end quote well that's not necessarily true but they did turn down insuring the titanic because uh they had doubts that it was unsinkable which is an interesting opt out on an offer back in the day hereditary titles the english branch the french branch again look at these palaces look at these buildings that they lived in at the at the time very impressive uh statements of wealth austrian branch the neapolitan branch uh jewish identity and positions on zionism now this is where sabrina was uh digging in saying it's not homogeneous and the various rothschilds disagreed or agreed uh with zionism as a concept now one of the things she read over was his nephew victor lord rothschild was against granting asylum for helping of jewish refugees in 1938 now also in 1938 i'm pretty sure it's victor rothschild who's the hollywood consultant on the film the house of rothschild which won an academy award in 1938 starring george arliss and boris karloff the guy who plays frankenstein right a legit movie told from the family's perspective, not taken out of context. And there are many artifacts and pieces of evidence that back up that story. Victor was a member of the Cambridge Five spy ring, which helped to have control of communism from a Western perspective. He's also the one that like got away with it. And uh, he has a whole bunch of other interesting things. He has a book. I think it's called The Fifth Man. It's about Victor Rothschild. It's a very expensive, rare book. And if you can get your hands on it, very interesting history. So that's that part of uh, that aspect. That might not be the whole story on Victor Rothschild. I just wanted to point out. And um, that's Jacob Rothschild's dad, the fifth man Cambridge spy guy that worked with Kim Philby and, you know, almost toppled uh, American Anglo and American intelligence for communism. So there's that. After the death of, uh, death of James Jacob Rothschild, his eldest son, Alphonse Rothschild, took over management of the company and was most uh, in support of Eretz Israel, which is the land of Israel. In this return, after 3,000 years, these guys are going to get it done. The Rothschild family archives show that during the 1870s, the families contributed. So 1870s, this is not because of Hitler. This is not because of World War II and genocide going on. This is 1870s because they could. They got a plan together. They're industrious. They communicated their plan. They got funding. They started making alliances. Okay. Standard operating procedure. Nothing to see there. Now, here's the paragraph. <clears throat> Baron Edmund James de Rothschild, known in Israel simply as the Baron Rothschild or the benefactor. He is the youngest son of James Jacob de Rothschild. He's the patron of the first permanent settlement in Palestine at Rishon Zion. 1882. And that's in this book right here. Rothschild and Early Jewish Colonization in Palestine is the title. The publishing company didn't want to put that on the cover. Do you know why? Because it's published by Hebrew University and it's a little inconvenient to their imprimatur. <laughs> but it's there. Okay. So this is this is scholarly, academic level. Hebrew University in Israel history that needs to be recognized regarding the ongoing struggle today. Rothschild and early Jewish colonization in Palestine. So going back over here to the, this paragraph. So he makes the first permanent settlement at Rishon LeZion. Did you know that this is one of the settlements attacked on 10-7? The first permanent settlement in Palestine over 140 years ago. And they tell you it started on 10-7. He also provided 
funding for the establishment of Peta Tivka as a permanent settlement in 1883. Overall, he bought from Ottoman landlords 2 to 3% of the land, which now makes up present-day Israel. That's a lot of land for one guy to just buy up. After Baron Hirsch died, now who's he? He's mentioned 30 years earlier in Moses Hess's uh, Roman Jerusalem Last Nationalist Question, 1862. So he's one of the co-conspirators to bring this about. The Hirsch-founded Jewish Colonization Association started supporting the settlement of Palestine in 1896, and Baron Rothschild took an active role in the organization and transferred his Palestinian land holdings as well as 15 million francs to it. In 1924, now that's a good skip from 1896 to 1924, he reorganized the Palestinian branch of the ICA into the Palestine Jewish Colonization Association, PICA, which acquired more than 125,000 acres of land and set up their ventures. In Tel Aviv, the Rothschild Boulevard is named after him as are many city localities, right? So she covered this part kind of, but then the Rothschilds played a significant part in the founding of Israel's governmental infrastructure. Well, that's fascinating. They create a country and the government and they pay for the Capitol building because James A. De Rothschild financed the Knesset. What's the Knesset? It's the unicameral legislature of Israel. So when you fund something, does that give you some sort of influence or control or say or anything? You get anything for that? It's a gift to the state of Israel, which his family created. So they gave a gift to themselves, and there needs to be a government to run their country that has nuclear weapons. And the Supreme Court of Israel building was donated to Israel by Dorothy de Rothschild. That's his widow. After he passed away, she continued his philanthropy. Outside the president's chamber is displayed the letter Dorothy de Rothschild wrote to then Prime Minister Shimon Peres, expressing her intention to donate a, a new building for the Supreme Court. Do you think if you donate the building the Supreme Court operates in, maybe those people have some sort of allegiance to your endeavors and they care about your goals? Nothing wrong with that. I'm just saying that exists and it's left out of everybody's conversations out there, uh, not including Savvy, because I think she did a good job actually going through this page, sifting it and finding. Now, let me just continue and finish uh, the tour. Places in Israel named after Rothschild family members. She covered that. Modern businesses, investment and philanthropy, Rothschild group, Edmund de Rothschild. This is the group right here. The Swiss Rothschilds funded George Soros in 1968. They funded his quantum fund. They don't want to tell you about that. And if you look up that reference, they delete it from the internet and you have to use Internet Archive to find it. RIT Partners, that's Jacob Rothschild who just passed away. And then there's many other aspects. We're only halfway down their page right now, right? So their influence on history, it's just like Quigley said, it's not that I have an aversion to this. I just think that the activities of this group are substantial and should be known to history. And there's a lot, look, here's the list of uh, you know family members. And you can read, and I have mapped almost everyone on this list into the history blueprint because I wanted to understand this topic long time ago because I felt it was substantial enough. And by the way, look, the, the buildings just keep going. You see those buildings? So Substantial influence over many, many, not just decades, many centuries at this point, 300 years influence in Western society. And yet it's the thing that you're not allowed to talk about until Jacob Rothschild happened to pass away. And now we can cover such facts in an objective manner for the edification of an audience who seeks to be educated on these topics and not be ignorant because ignorance is the basis of all racism. And if you want to make racism a hate crime, can we make ignorance a hate crime too? Can we put people in prison for the rest of their life for ignorance? Because I got a list of people I would start with, just like they got a list of people they don't want talking freely, uncensored on the internet to other people because it threatens their bullshit agendas, right? Their agenda, as you've just seen from this episode tonight, how fragile this agenda is, you, you see that. And they don't want people to know that because knowledge is power. It might make you say, mm, no, thank you, please, to the offers that they make you in the future. So as we move forward, I just wanted to put those into uh, into this time capsule because I think that's a substantial contribution to, to humanity and uh, they their place deserves to be known. They take credit for, you know, why, why not take credit for creating a whole country that's continued to have war in that area. There wasn't war like this for a hundred years before that. There wasn't like Arabs and Jews going at each other the whole time. But because of that agreement, 
of giving away property that the government of Britain didn't own in the first place and promised to two other parties, by the way, right? Like it's caused a big stir. And so when they tell you it started on 10 seven and it's one sided and you unconditional support, I don't question. Yeah. You should question the, all that stuff that your politicians are telling you. And I'll tell you what, that lobby is just not in our country. It's over in Britain too. They got the same issue, right? So there are people right now seeking to protect themselves from the spread of this uh, purposeful misunderstanding that has led to almost a world war at this point, because the country's involved on both sides. You got a whole bunch of countries waiting to back up uh, the Hamas and Hezbollah and the other activities over there, all the uh, Arab Union. Wait till we show you. We got to get to it next. The Arab uh, League's speech at the ICJ. I mean, it's in fuego. So we got to get to that. So, uh, Tony, all that we've pushed into this time capsule on the Rothschilds, right? Last break, this break, uh, substantial content. Do you have anything to add or correct that you've seen? Oh, boy. Uh, nothing. I mean, we started can... with the correction of saying, wait, wait, the Schickel Gruber thing is like a, not a good place. So I'm not stand. saying this is true. I'm just saying... Um... The only thing I could offer as a correction would be, but it's not even something that was mentioned, but the pigeon courier Waterloo thing is, there's no evidence that that occurred. That's about the only thing I can offer as a correction, that they gained foreknowledge of the battle, and that's according to archives that don't exist and all this stuff. So there's no corroborating evidence of that on any front I've seen over the past sort of 10 to 15 years of research. However... That topic is covered several times on RothschildArchive.org, and it has since been censored. So they did use pigeon couriers. They oh, did, they did uh, use encrypt it, yeah. it. They did encrypt using Yiddish so that anyone who got the pigeon couldn't understand their messaging to between the brothers, right? Um, and it's I think it's the I once read it's that the, the inclusion of that with the Waterloo story, which might have happened, but I don't know what their official right. claim was. So it's like taking two things that are true together and like making more of that situation because there's already plenty of situational evidence from the Waterloo incident that they admit on their own. So well, you don't they need admit to they already add had other control. things that exist into yeah, the... like they already had substantial control of the British. Um... Uh, banking by that point, like 20, own 20% 20 or something by that point before the Battle of Waterloo. And so that it was, that's the only thing that's been the hardest thing for me to corroborate, but that's not even something we mentioned. So yeah, it's, it's not pretty, necessary like, in any, claim. and they say, they admit that like they looked in their own archives, believing it, it's on their website. And it says here, we even looked in our own archives and we think this might've just been a myth that got, you know, it, you know, sort of paired with other sort of ideas that were going on at the time. I don't know whether that's true or not, but I always found that to be a little overstated because I was it's like, that's very mythological. Like uh, that, that's you don't just take over a bank with one piece of knowledge. It, you that taking over uh, the bank takes a long period of time and a lot of gold reserves, a lot of moving money and a lot of stuff that's mentioned in the Baron de Rothschild sure. book where they're like, we moved a lot of stuff and we paid off a lot of people and they did a lot of surreptitious activity over the course of decades to gain the control they did. They just didn't get it like magically overnight from a from a knowledge no, no, of a for battle. Sure. And also, um, like what is gained by adding courier pigeon to that scenario? There's already plenty of proof on that scenario, and there's proof that the other thing existed. You don't need to add those two things together right. and just keep them disambiguated. Like IDF would like you to think that their attack and killing those people had nothing to do with the food thing because they're like, that's a different time and place that that happened. Yeah, maybe seconds and feet is if you want to describe it down to that minutia, right? That's right. just has bar. I wanted to say, and here's real, the this real quick for context. Yeah. This is from their own mouth, so it's like if you know you got to take it with a grain of salt. But it says news of Waterloo. It says here this is on the Rothschild archive. Is this live says, or is this ten years ago? This is, this is probably is this live. I would assume. Okay, so but take they the reference same link. 2013 and 2014. It says uh, while it is true that the Rothschilds had an extensive communications network and did use messenger pigeon messenger pigeons, there is no evidence for the news of the English victory at Waterloo having been brought to the new court in 1815 by Pigeon Post. No original contemporary account or documentation concerning how the news reached new court survives in the collections of the archive. Recent research, recent research has also cast new light on this persistent they lost it myth. Like the NASA See uh, Brian Cathart, Cath, uh, Cathcart, right? Nathan Rothschild in the Battle of Waterloo Rothschild Archive Review of the 2013-2014. We click on that. It takes us to this, which is like 
basically a review of the archives from around that time when this was supposed to happen and no mention and they have pictures and stuff now obviously they could just ex this you know not exhibit it on purpose so hard to prove going from their own website but i but just thinking logically thinking on that uh, pragmatically that wouldn't be enough to essentially gain complete control of the bank of england alone and no but if you think like of how memoirs Soros... of baron de rothschild there was a large network going on for decades essentially doing this uh, moving gold around with hesse castle and you know paying off for french and uh, other authorities to essentially and get getting this it from the to... east india company right but, exactly but my so point would be very, the same way that complex. soros cornered the british market in the 90s they could have cornered it with the Waterloo situation, controlling the gold, the courier system, the deliverable of that. Yeah, it could have and... been a multiple things. Yeah. yeah. It just wasn't that one. Like the, the mythos makes it very easy to paint a straw man and be like, that's sure. that's pure mythology and um, a little absurd and obtuse, okay. and which it is. And, and then they saved alone. the Bank of England and then they took over the Royal Mint. And there's a series right. of actions that go up for another 60 years until you get to this, which is the 500 shekel note. These are bank notes from around the world. This is from Israel. This is the 500 shekel. And it gives you a couple of state facts about Israel. It gives you a nice little stamp down here. And if you flip it open, mine's broken from showing it to too many people. Uh, you can see the back. Look, there's Arabic on there. And then you got this history of Baron Edmund de Rothschild. And uh, this is the same Rothschild that we just read about in that paragraph on the Wikipedia. And it reads as follows. And I'm sorry for the... Uh, let me click this here. This 500 shekel note from Israel portrays Baron Edmund de Rothschild, a philanthropist and agriculturalist who aided early Jewish settle, settlers of the country. In the center of the note are a group of early pioneers with buildings in the background. And then it goes in how the back of uh, the note has uh, grapes and leaves and all sorts of other good stuff. But you, you understand that there is an official connection. They thought enough of this man who's known as the founder, the benefactor, that they would uh, they would have his face on the 500 shekel note, which I would have to imagine is quite a few shekels uh, in that situation. And uh, well, it should yeah. be noted. This is kind yeah. of juicy, actually. So well, like, yeah. although they admit this is from the archive in 2014, um, I'm like this reading it. This is the link. They say like some further information corroborates. So it says here, see Brian Cathcart, Nathan Rothschild and the Battle of Waterloo. And when you click on this, it goes through a series of archives and they show you some postings from that some artifactual pieces here but at the end here it says the legend of nathan rothschild and waterloo is just that a legend as with most legends there are underpinning elements of truth he had relatively early information and he seems to have profited by it the rest however is fiction and not harmless fiction the nathan rothschild of the legend is a, sh a shylock a fagan a judas scheming cynical secretive and fanatically greedy the stamp that character in the public mind was the aim of the writer who called himself quote-unquote satan and of the makers of the Dai Rothschild, Aktien of Waterloo. Of course, others have repeated the tale with no anti-Semitic intent. That was, a, that was a sort of anti-Semitic trip going on in the late 19th century. This whole idea that there is some correspondence of like, I don't know. Yeah. An, an aspect, person out, per, like an aspect of himself called Satan that was telling him to like deliver this message so they can make money off the Battle of Waterloo. <laughs> of course, others have repeated the tale with no anti-Semitic intent. But given its pedigree and the absence of supporting evidence, it's probably time historians relegated this legend to the margins and footnotes. And well, it's really interesting, Tony, because if you wanted, if if there was something kind of like incriminating to your history and you wanted to hide that from people, all you'd have to do in that case is add a little anti-Semitism to it. And all of a sudden now you can't talk about that thing because there was anti-Semitism well, added to it in the, the passing around because th they could take something that's factual and actual, hyperbolize it, and make it a little bit racist, and then you end up being able to write a whole book like this, Jewish Space Lasers, the Rothschilds, and 200 years of conspiracy theories, where you know he'll tell you there's nothing to see here. It's, it's much ado a about nothing, that the family has no interest, and people are just racist. And then if you if you take them up on the special offer, you can get the secret Jewish Space Laser Corps Mazel Tov Goyams, Goyam Squad. <laughs> the, this, this patch is a collector's <laughs> item, and you buy it, and it funds uh you know funds anti-hate stuff and it uh, is it's a curious hypothesis i mean certainly your your hypothesis is very worthwhile this is by the same historian by the way, brian carthart um sunday may 3rd 
2015, and this was the Rothschild libel. Why it has taken 200 years for an anti-Semitic slur that emerged in the Battle of Waterloo to be dismissed. Mm. Um, and it says here in the summer of 1840, so we'd have to prove whether Just or not- Just gaslighting people not to read the archives. Go to Rothschild Archive. Well, he's one of the so that was from the Rothschild. He's the same person. He's one of the was, writers about it, but he's not like the archive having stuff written about it is different than the documents themselves that are available in the archive. So when you dig into like the actual like papers and letters and stuff like that, you get to you get to read without his commentary or shading on the situation. Just like you're getting to read in, uh, I think he had actually had access because it says here, Brian. No, Clark, no, he has access. He works of journalism there. at Kingston University. He's like, London, he's like the... Neil Ferguson. Neil yeah, so, Ferguson yeah. will go look at these archives and then come tell you about the archives, but he's not showing you the archive. He's talking about not even in footnotes many times. There's a lot of liberty taken with taken with the narrative of the representatives of that archive. Whereas I think it's more interesting if you read it yourself and get your understand it's like having a priest oh, between you out. and the in the thing right so it's like uh uh martin luther is like every man his own priest right i think people should just read the letters and the things that were written by the people instead of reading like the second hand conden condensed which oftentimes leaves out those inconvenient facts version i mean that the the point is what the prove whether or not your hypothesis was true, we'd have to find out whether this 1846 political pamphlet was sponsored by like clandestine Rothschild agents in order to build up this false boogeyman or straw of man of anti Semitism. Or if it is real, then this is unfortunately where the original sort of legend sort of manifests and it manifests. So that's where we'd have to prove one way or another whether this was somehow done by their own you know, clandestine agents or whether or not this was done by individuals that were against the Rothschild family at trying to build up this sort of like uh, fake, you know, uh, sure. story about Waterloo. Like and that's, that's what about, we can't, it's very difficult about to prove, successful people. You know? Yeah. So it says, it just says here in the summer of 1846, a political pamphlet bearing the ominous signature Satan, quote unquote, swept across Europe telling a story which, though lurid and improbable, left a mark that can be seen to this day. The pamphlet claimed to recount the history of the richest and most powerful, famous, excuse me, the most famous banking family of the time, the Rothschilds, and its most enduring passage told how their fast fortune was built upon the bloodshed of the Battle of Waterloo, whose bicentenni uh, bicentennial year or falls this year. But that's not that's not true either because they really had made money from working for Hesse Castle, which Nathan just rolled over at Waterloo, like, and then they paid the guy from Hesse Castle back later with interest. So he yeah, took other I mean, people's money. They but they're it. not claiming anything there. They're just saying like this right. is a, what the pamphlet claims, and yeah. it says here Nathan Rothschild, the founder of the London branch of the bank, was a spectator on the battlefield the day of June eighteen fifteen, uh, and this was with the bicentenary. So. This was all coming out, I guess, around the bison. And as a night fell, he observed the total defeat of the French army. This was what uh, he was waiting for. A relay of fast horses rushed him to the Belgian coast. But there he found to his fury that a storm had confined all ships to port. Undaunted, quote, does greed admit anything is impossible? And quote, asked Satan. He paid a king's ransom to a fisherman to ferry him through wind and waves to England. Reaching London 24 hours before official word of Wellington's victory, Rothschild exploited his knowledge to make a killing on the stock exchange. See, that quote, doesn't unquote, make any sense. The whole thing, like he's doing it personally. That's the whole part that's the straw man to hide the actual uh, courier nature. That in, is in what these, they present yeah. in the, the Ralph the Rothschild. Though. Right. That it's just a story. bunch of straw men. So you take something, no. you add the, the straw man aspect to it, which also can make it anti Semitic. Uh, but it might not. The point is, they, they, it seems like the, I think the point is the Rothschild, even in like the doc, even in the House of Rothschild film, they support that as being the official narrative of their, but then they, they apparently turn back around and say, if you look at the archives, this is part of a, a sort of legend that was built up in the mid 1850s during the bicentenary. Yeah, it wasn't. Where, and that, it's not that, really how it happened. And I could see that. I mean, that logically would make sense. You can't, you don't just, the movie says they gained foreknowledge about a Waterloo and literally took over the entirety of the Bank of England. Like it was just like a one to one transaction. There's no way, we know based on the Baron de Rothschild memoirs of Baron de Rothschild that I, I got from you that that's not at all the case. And I remember researching this and finding about a couple of years ago, finding that they already had con considerable control over the Bank of England by that point, not majority control, but a significant portion. So it could be, they definitely might've still profited off of it, but to act as though like that was the one and only event that sort of like compelled them to the front. That's yeah. I mean, they it's ran the with work that. They of probably people trying it. to hide it, not, not educate uh, you on it. Right. So enough. my point would be this, 
The House of Rothschild in 1938 won an Academy Award. That means it won an Oscar, okay? It wasn't made by Fritz Lang in Germany in the 1920s. It was made in Hollywood in 1938 with consultants like Victor Rothschild working on the project. Correct me if I'm wrong. If you find a different Rothschild was the consultant, then uh, we can go with that. But the point is, like, it was made by friendlies. And so it is the thing that they wanted people to know about at the time. And then Hitler's people... They took it and used it for some propaganda and they cut in some racism, which also helped to like create that great divide and the need for uh, people to have their own homeland in that situation over there. So all the things that uh, have been presented thus far have foreshadowed. Now we've covered uh, Jacob Rothschild's death and the origin of Israel. Now we can go into the present day situation. I'm going to show you first. Let's go to a comedian. Let's lighten the mood a little bit. All right, so we're going to go to Matt Lieb. He is a co-host of the Bad Hasbara podcast. He's co-host with uh, Daniel Mate, Aaron's brother, and uh, Gabor's son, one of his three kids that I think they I think they get. There's like two brothers and a sister. They're all activists. So this is uh, Matt Lieb. He's at a pro-Palestinian rally, and he's a comedian who's on the scene who's going to make people hopefully laugh about a really tough subject. And then from there, we have to go to, uh, it's a TRT world. I believe that's Turkish television. They have some questions about the nature of Zionism. And then we're going to go to, uh, even an Israeli prime minister is now calling it ethnic cleansing. And that's going to be brought to us by Lee Camp. Then we'll be right back. We'll comment on these clips. Let's go to uh, Matt Lieb. Because he's a funny guy. I am not usually a protester. I uh, mostly am a comic. I don't speak at protests, but stage time is stage time. Uh, did anyone catch the March with Israel yesterday in D.C.? Oh, you didn't see it? Yeah, no one else saw it either. No one fucking went. But as I looked at that crowd, and I now look upon this crowd. I am so proud to be marching with so many Jews and Gentiles of all ages. Races, genders, and nationalities who are brave enough to demand an immediate ceasefire. I'm not speaking to you as a representative of all Jews. I am a bad representative. Uh, I came from a secular family, and the closest thing I got to a bar mitzvah is when I was 13, and I one time saw my dad send back soup for not being hot enough at the cafe in the Holocaust Museum. That is a thing that happens. Very embarrassing for me, as I watched the Gentiles look at each other, seeing this old man screaming about soup, and wondering if it was a test. At that moment, I became a man. I do not represent all Jews. No single person represents all Jews, as no single state represents all Jews. Possibly New Jersey, though. That is why I'm here. I am tired of Israel claiming to represent me, my family, my friends, my pets. That my existence, my existence is inextricably linked to their existence. That my, the existence of the Jewish people can only be secured through oppression, displacement, and genocide of Palestinians. I am tired of the Zionist weaponization of Jewish fear and trauma. And also, as someone in the entertainment industry here in the middle of uh, this tourist trap, I... I gotta say, I am tired of the intimidation, the punishment, and blacklisting of both Jews and Gentiles. Jews and Gentiles who have the guts 
the guts to say what every major human rights organization has said, Israel is an apartheid state. who have been dropped by their agents for this. I know agents who have been fired from their agency for this. And I know entire writers' rooms who don't dare speak up, and I do not blame them. But I know this, despite what these handful of Zionist bullies would have you think, these bullies and browbeaters who claim to hate anti-Semitism, and yet are happy to play into the old anti-Semitic conspiracy theory that they control Hollywood. I know this, despite their threats, I know for a fact that the vast majority of Jewish and Gentile writers, actors, producers, crew, and assistants in this town stand with Palestine! Palestine will be free, secretly, a Nazi chant. Yes. Nazis, famous for bearing the lead on hating Jews. Free, they say, free is a code for genocide. A state where everyone is equal is not genocide. And, and they can figure out the name later. They can call it Palestine or something. It's close enough. It sounds like a Jewish name to me. They look for secret codes in our slogans and in our signs and in our stuffed plushy dolls shaped like a cute squid. And they say, oh, see, mollusks, those are anti-Semitic dog whistles. That's what they say. And while they look for hidden messages, they say out loud, Palestinians are animals. Yes! Yes! They say that Arabs breed too much. On TV, they say this. They say, they say killing hundreds of Palestinian children is worth it to kill one Hamas commander. I cannot be silent about this. We Jewish voices calling for a ceasefire, calling for peace, who are critical of Israel, critical of Zionism, we are inconvenient to the narrative that to speak out against the crimes of Israel is to speak out against the Jewish people. With one hand, they call uh, Gentiles anti-Semitic for using the dual loyalties trope, and on the other hand, they call you traitors for a country you're not even from. City. Our existence as Jews of conscience is inconvenient to them, to the point at which people like Abby Mayer at the Jerusalem Post suggested that all of us here should be excommunicated from the Jewish people. And this, this gives up the game completely, because that way you can claim all Jews stand with Israel, because if you don't, you are no longer Jewish. Well, I've got news for you, Avi Mayors of the world. You do not own the Jewish people. Israel does not own the Jewish people, and Zionism does not own the Jewish people. Jewish in your blind nationalism, in your racism, and your cruelty. Zionism doesn't fight anti-Semitism. Zionism is anti-Semitism. Israel claims to be a bulwark against anti-Semitism while simultaneously doing everything in their power to terrify the Jews of the world. 
into mistrusting their friends, breaking up families, attempting to isolate and gaslight and manipulate them. Zionism is a cult. And we must break free from it. Freedom for Zionism, freedom for Palestine. Israel has a fascism problem. <laughs> it is hurting not just the thousands of Palestinians killed, wounded, or displaced under the occupation, but also the Jewish people Israel claims to be protecting. Zionism is built upon the idea of a Jewish homeland. But in that Jewish homeland, not all Jews are equal. The founders of Zionism, like Theodor Herzl, and Israel's early state builders were all Ashkenazi Jews. Ashkenazim are white European Jews hailing from Eastern and Central Europe and the former Russian Empire. Herzl wrote a famous novel. Theodor Herzl's famous book Alt Neuland, or Old New Land, which envisioned the modern state of Israel years before its creation. The book also talked about Israel as small Europe in the Middle East. But not all Jews are Ashkenazim, and not all Ashkenazim are Zionists. All the rabbis around the world for 130 years since Zionism started spoke up in every way, in every style that they had, and declared that Zionism is sinful, is, uh, is a criminal, and is totally unacceptable according to my religion. That's Rabbi Yisrael Dovid Weiss. He is one of the many anti-Zionist Jews around the world. In fact, prior to the Holocaust and the founding of the State of Israel, Zionism was a fringe minority movement among the world's Jewry. In the aftermath of the Holocaust, as survivors and Zionists started to emigrate to Palestine, there was an immense need for manpower to build and populate this new formation. In 1911, David Ben-Gurion, who would later become Israel's first prime minister, went on record saying, We need people who are born workers. We have to pay attention to the local element, the Oriental Jews, both the Yemenite and Sephardic. Their standard of living and their needs are lower. So to get builders and soldiers and not be overwhelmed demographically by Palestinians, the Zionist project was an urgent need of Jewish immigration. According to Professor Aziza Kazum, European colonialists would often treat local minorities and Muslim lands, like Jews and Armenians, as allies and reward them for their cooperation against local authorities. This led to increased tensions between communities. Moreover, the creation of Israel by way of a mass ethnic cleansing and displacement of 750,000 Palestinians increased tensions that already existed. All these tensions led some Arab Jews to migrate, but the number of Jews relocating to Israel wasn't enough for the Zionist Ashkenazi state builders. To accelerate the process, Zionist spies planted bombs in Jewish centers in Iraq to create hysteria and panic in order to hasten Jewish Iraqis to flee Iraq and emigrate to Israel. Israeli Jewish historian Avi Shlaim, whose family emigrated to Israel from Iraq when he was five, told Middle East Eye. It was part of what somebody described as cruel Zionism. And this was particularly cruel because it involved innocent Jews, decent Jews, good people. And uh, the Zionist movement or the intelligence officers turned these Jews in Baghdad and then later in Cairo. Uh, they turned them into terrorists. They turned them into spies and terrorists against their own Homeland. Over the decades, a combination of push and pull factors eventually led many Mizrahi and Sephardic Jews to emigrate to the state of Israel. But they were less than welcomed. The Jewish community in Iraq had very little to do with Zionism. Uh, Zionism was a movement by European Jews for European Jews. Um, and my mother used to um, talk a great deal about the wonderful Muslim friends that we had in Baghdad. And one day I asked her, did we have any Zionist friends? And she said, uh, no, um, Zionism is an Ashkenazi thing. It's nothing to do with us. 
And I think that reflected the predominant view of Iraqi uh, Jews. And a white savior story was constructed about how Middle Eastern Jews were saved from savage Muslims as well as the savagery within themselves. The discrimination against non-white Jews is a well-documented phenomenon in many sectors of life in Israel, including in education, reproductive rights, the military and others. One of these shocking stories was accusations against the Israeli government of eugenic practices. Families claimed that officials had coerced Ethiopian Jewish women to take contraceptive drugs with long-lasting effects. Critics said it could explain the almost 50% decline over the past 10 years in the birth rate of Israel's Ethiopian community. Ethiopians were not alone in their grievances. The Israeli government is accused of separating Yemenite Jews from their children when the families immigrated to Israel decades ago. The officials told parents their children had died but did not provide any evidence or the bodies of the deceased. Journalists and the families of the victims later discovered that in some cases, the children had been experimented upon in hospitals, while alive as well as after they died, in violation of Jewish tradition, and some others had been given up for adoption or even sold to white Ashkenazi Holocaust survivors. Many non-white Jewish communities from Iraq, Yemen, Ethiopia and other places around the world have long been a victim of the Zionist racial hierarchy. Israeli academic of Iraqi origin Ella Shabbat writes, I am not asking Palestinians to feel sorry for the Sephardi soldiers who might be among those shooting at them. What is at stake in any case is not a competition for sympathy, but a search for alternative. These words written in 1988 are still relevant today. What do you think? Is Zionism a white supremacist project? Even in the echelons of power in Israel, a, a few people, the echelons of power in the United States, and I brought to you some of the mutiny that's been going on with various staff from the White House to the State Department saying they'll no longer be a part of this. Obviously, you have military personnel uh, like Bushnell turning against this genocide in various ways. Even the former prime minister of Israel, I repeat, the former prime minister of Israel, Ehud Olmert, put out an opinion piece in Haaretz. Haaretz is the more left-wing newspaper in Israel. An opinion piece titled Netanyahu's Messianic Coalition Partners Want an All-Out Regional War. Gaza is just a first step. He says the ultimate aim of this gang is purging, read ethnic cleansing, the West Bank of its Palestinian inhabitants, cleansing the Temple Mount of its Muslim worshipers, and annexing the territories to the state of Israel. This aim will not be achieved without extensive violent conflict Armageddon. And Armageddon's sick of this, I think is what, he, that was his initial title. He, they asked him to change that because they just didn't feel it felt, fit the tone. This is the goddamn former prime minister saying that this is not okay. This is, this is genocide. I mean, he calls it cleansing. He calls it ethnic cleansing. To me, that is, you're seeing this more and more, and this should be all over mainstream media. This should be a major, and I mean U.S. mainstream media, this should be a major story in U.S. mainstream media. The former prime minister, even the former prime minister of, of Israel is calling this ethnic cleansing. He's saying they want a regional war, which I've talked about how Israel does want a regional war. Now they have to be careful about how they do that because they need the U.S. to be involved in it. If they were to just go up against Iran or, or Hezbollah uh, alone, and there has been some tit for tat with Hezbollah, but it's not an all-out war. But if they went up with, against them alone, it, it would be catastrophic to Israel. So instead, Israel wants to draw the U.S. into a regional war, in which case then you, Israel would be by far the more powerful, at least, alliance with the United States. But so far, it's just been a tit for tat with Hezbollah. But anyway, back to the fact that you have the former prime minister calling this ethnic cleansing. He used the word cleansing. And let's be honest, many of the people in the Israeli government who are endorsing this, who are behind this, who are putting out these plans, even they have used words like cleansing. They have used words that are genocidal speak. That, is a, that shows you how, how far they are falling. Israel's falling. They, the propaganda's not working anymore. It's just not. The Hasbara, as they call it, is not working anymore. Even, even having Wonder Woman as Genocide Barbie, even having Wonder Woman promote this genocide has not been 
is, is not succeeding. Most of Americans want a ceasefire at minimum. I brought to you the polling showing that Israel across the world has gone from a positive view in, in many countries to a negative view. And from the countries that already had a negative view of the apartheid state of Israel, it has gone to a completely negative view, even more negative view. And that view is going to continue to get more negative as we go along, because uh, there's a lot of uh, Hasbara. We use two terms on this show, Hasbara and Amtsprache. I'll explain them in chronological order. Amtsprache, spelled A-M-P-T-S-S-P-H-R-A-C-H-E, Amtsprache, is a German word that means official language. What it means in the context is in Hannah Arendt's Banality of Evil or Eichmann in Jerusalem. I think it's in Eichmann in Jerusalem. Eichmann gives this statement as to like uh, he can only if he can only answer in official Amtsprache language. And then uh, basically the official language allowed them to dehumanize. So there's no like put Jews on trains in the orders. It's move these parcels from here to here. And it's very a dehumanizing language it takes the humanity, bureaucratic language yeah, yeah it's bureaucratic language meant to like not make you feel emotional about what you're doing because it's just like these are i'm just Moving following orders day, just doing be. my job all these things that the nazis didn't right. successfully use as defense at nuremberg or at least the ones that went on trial because the other ones got a, hey, hey, got how convenient. a deal cut how convenient for the Nazi experiment that they can just rebrand call themselves zionists and go to israel and continue doing the same shit I'm being a little facetious here, obviously, but that second clip we played, it was interesting if you frame it within that context. It, it is. <laughs> it, these things are getting more and more interesting as we tend to uh, cover these things. And there's interweaving topics that kind of overlap. You're learning about this thing and then this thing comes into it. And then over here, these things connect together. That's what education really is when you're doing it uh, right. So this next section that we're going to play... <laughs> I can't believe I have to play some of these clips. The next section we're going to play, I'm dropping it for a control room so LD has it. I have to start it out uh, with uh, a joke, so we'll get to that in a second because I'm not very good at jokes, so I have to think of it first. But in that last clip that we just played, uh, there was reference to if you don't support Zionism, you're anti-Semitic. Isn't that the original thesis by Herzl that we talked about last week? That was covered by Katie Halper and Zach Foster in the in the clip we covered last week, and it was called Mal Shell, and it was yeah. basically saying Mal Shell was an anti-Zionist, and then basically a lot of slur words were associated with that. That's that's Herzl's original kind of work in his area, mm -hmm. and yeah, he wasn't too friendly seems... to the religious Jew. <laughs> Almost as if they were going to use the religious Jews as human shields. And we might learn more about that as we go through the episode tonight, because I think that would be atrocious if that were It's interesting that on. they were so, the fact that many, world Jewry, much of like maybe the, the actual Semitic Jews and the Sephardic Jews, Mizrahi, you know, yeah. didn't, yeah, they didn't see themselves as, oh, that's an Ashkenazi project. Oh, that's fascinating. Why all, why, what is it about the... European Jewry and their sort of need for a manifest destiny and this messianic complex or not supposed Jewish mysticism, all this sort of nonsense. I'm just, it's a curious question I'm going to keep in the back of my mind as we continue going through. Well, tonight. also, um, you heard in that last clip about uh, the terrorist attacks in Iraq, which was also a British mandate colony territory as was egypt during these That's times so if you yeah. so if you look yeah. after paris 1919 the whole middle east that we know today as like the 20th century and 21st century of a lot of wars that was all british they they set it up and wound it up and let it go Weesh. a long time ago but there's a there's a claim that's made today because you just learned in that last clip how they terrorized jews in iraq to get them to move to palestine and there's one of those trick questions today that the Zionists like to use, like, well, the ethnic cleansing of Jews from other countries by the Arab countries. And it's like, bro, that was your own people in many cases, inspiring your people to move to Palestine. And you just like it. in just like in Tsarist Russia, what created yes. the conditions there? Oh, you know, yeah. because, yeah, that why, why did the pogroms didn't just happen out of nowhere? 
Right. Huh, I wonder. Yeah. So that's just curious. Just so there's this long 3000 year history of these people being denied the promised land of their God. And then this other group comes along and says, maybe we can do something with that. That seems like uh, no one's done anything with that project yet. So I want to bring you over here because a lot of people claim ethnic cleansing of Jews from Iraq. And that's not necessarily the whole truth. They were inspired by terrorism to move in many cases. And if we go to uh, David Al Albert Abdullah David Sassoon, sorry, Albert Abdullah David Sassoon is the son of David Sassoon, and he is an opium warlord monopoly guy. This guy's in charge of Baghdad, Iraq. He's in charge of the opium it, trade. He works with the East India Company. Doesn't the Sassoon family correspond or connect with, is it, not Rudyard Kipling, it's the, it, the, the Flemings, the Flemings? Well, or something like that? you're close, you're close, Tony, okay. because they do. Jardine Fleming? Yes, Madison. yes, so. So here Something comes like the, the Sassoon. Sorry. So yep. David Sassoon is part of the Sassoon family. Now you can go to the Jewish encyclopedia and read all about this because that's where I learned about all this uh, history of the Sassoon family. They have a wonderful archive of history on this character, David Sassoon. So you go to David Sassoon, 1792 to 1864, and then he has a son. And then uh, at one point, uh, I, th I think it's this one. Let's go back. Uh, does he David Sassoon, opium? All right. So there's there Jardine is, yeah. Matheson. Here's the connections off to the side, right? So David Sassoon, uh, his um, I think it's his son or grandson marries into the Rothschild family, like in the 1860s, right? So now yeah. you have a connection between the East India Company's opium monopoly and the Rothschild family post Waterloo in a way that involves marriage. Now, how does this trickle down today, right? You could read about the Anglo-Jewish Association and the Jewish Encyclopedia and Evelyn de Rothschild and her work in Jerusalem, 1854. But wait, there's more because the Hollywood connection is a real thing. And if you go down to here and you go over here, uh, Jack Houston is the grandson of John Houston and Albert Abdullah David Sassoon. So on one side, he has John Houston, the director. On the other side, he has Meyer Amschel Rothschild and Albert Abdullah Sassoon in his family tree. This is well known, and you can read about it on his wiki page, and it'll tell you all about it. It's just not going to tell you like... Uh, Holy what shit, bro. I just went to the Jewish Encyclopedia. It says the Rothschilds of the East. Yes, that's Absolutely. what the Sassoons were. This yeah. is on the Jewish Encyclopedia. It says here, Sir Albert Abdullah David Sassoon... Anglo-Indian merchant, head of the house of David Sassoon and Company, quote, the Rothschilds of the East, end quote, born at Baghdad, 1817, died in Brighton, England, eight, uh, October 24th, 1896, eldest son of David Sassoon. Wow. That's and then, And then you go to David Sassoon's entry. And so when they're called the Rothschilds of Baghdad, and then they later marry with the Rothschilds, they're like, we might as well just marry with them. And now you've got a banking conglomerate and an opium conglomerate from the British East India Company's supply line, uh, yeah, all dude, working together this. before this Cecil Rhodes even comes along. What do you got? Holy shit. It says business career. This is just on the wiki, which has whitewashed most of that information you just presented, which is yeah. actually corroborated in the Jewish encyclopedia. That's why sources. Which is so ironic. They're whitewashing the books. wiki. Right. But, but the Jewish encyclopedia is keeping it alive. It's great. So here it says business career. It says here, he proceeded to Shanghai, where he conducted the mercantile operations of the Chinese branch of the firm of David Sassoon, which would be his father, Sons & Co. He went to London in 1858, where he opened a bank on uh, Leiden Hall Street. The business grew exponentially during the American Civil War, mm -hmm. as they suddenly became the main suppliers of cotton to British mm -hmm. spinning mills. It's part of the triangle and the trade. British market. And opium's on the other oh, end of those textiles. Right, 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 right. Wow. That's so, and then here it says philanthropy. Look at this. He served as president of a committee which had for its object the organization of an expedition to the Jews in China, Abyssinia, and the East. He was also a member of the Council of Jews College and the Committee of the Jews Free School, which two institutions he munificently endowed. He was also a warden of the Spanish and Portuguese synagogue for several years. He acted as an examiner in Hebrew to the Jews Free School. So I have to look up what that is. But that's All right, so that. you were on... David Sassoon, mm -hmm. the treasurer mm -hmm. of Baghdad. Sassoon, Baghdadi. Da Sassoon, David Sassoon. That's just, that's Sassoon, well, David Sassoon. This I, is, uh, anyways, this is the, this one, the one I was British just talking about 1792 to 1864. And then his oh, son, Albert, one, yeah. 
Albert becomes the the diplomat and philanthropist. And uh, I think it's his son that marries in with uh, the next generation of Rothschild yeah. family. Yeah, you're looking at his father, at least according to this. At least what's the, the wiki saying that what you have there is his father. Yeah. That they think they screwed up the name. Well, this is the 1818 to 1896. So this is the second generation because he's, oh, he's all in English dress one. and the and the older one is in the Baghdad uniform. This no, is... it's the same one. That's my bad. You're right. right yeah. There he is. Yeah, there he is. He looks the same. <laughs> yeah. David Sassoon and Sons. Yeah, Sassoon. David Sassoon is on the right. So and then there's that's the also chart. inconvenient to the official narratives, especially once you get down to let me just control F on this page. Let's go to the Rothschild reference. Bump, bump, bump. Sure this comes from Sassoon Albert Abdullah David. That's the reference Dictionary of National Biography, Volume 50, London Smith, Elder and Co. That was 1897. And then Joseph Sassoon, 2022, The Global Merchants, The Enterprise and Extravagance of the Sassoon Dynasty. I just wanted to, whenever I reference Wiki, I like to make sure the sources are at least make sense <laughs> in some capacity. Yeah. I mean, so, I mean, uh, there's many. Uh... There's many no generations. One, and no again, this is why I put it into a model to disambiguate the various generations and, and you know, the business partners. And when you get into their business partners and the, the old China trade, that's what they call the opium trade. The opium trade. I mean, a lot of this stuff is still going on today and it involves slave trades. I'm sorry, I'm should, going on the wrong one. It should be See, noted. There's old China trade and there's yeah, the well. slave trades that it was based on and how they continue it today. And uh, Sassoon family is a part of that history in a strong way. I wonder Here's if they the have years. any connection with the HSBC, yeah. maybe like the foundation yes. of that. Yeah. The Hong Kong mm. Shanghai. Yeah, there it Banking is. HSBC Hong Kong right Shanghai. Yeah. There it is. Yeah. Clearinghouse, who funded uh, Hillary Clinton mm -hmm. like sixty million dollars for her campaign in twenty sixteen. So this all this stuff's still going on today. I've interviewed a HSBC whistleblower who would tell you what happened in the last couple of years. It's like it's crazy. Crazy. Yeah. What they're doing over there. It's like basically a more refined and version of BCCI. Okay, we're yes. that. Or less I want to follow version. up with the Aliyahs because one of the confusions yeah. people have is like there's been a bunch of Aliyahs or migrations of Jewish people oh, from I them out. North Africa. And uh, what's that? I, I mapped them. They're in the. Oh, yeah. Okay, here's yeah, the first okay, Aliyah so... right here. Oh, wait, wrong button. The first Aliyah uh, is in the 1800s. And then there's a uh, second Aliyah. Where did I have it? I have it listed someplace around here. The first, uh, yeah, third, first, uh, second, and third. Then the Zionist historiography post the Balfour Declaration, the start of the third Aliyah. The first and second Aliyah originally referred to the two biblical returns to Zion described in Ezra Nehemiah. The first Aliyah led by Zerubbabel, and the second Aliyah led by Ezra and Nehemiah, approximately 80 years later. But that's that's based on dubious hist uh, biblical historiography. It does well, go on to. Mm -hmm. They also had this Palestine Exploration Fund, which helped to set it up. And the whole time, the survey of Western Palestine, like they call it past Palestine the whole time. Uh, so, so it says, it says here, it's, um, this is just on the wiki, it says, for much of their history, most Jews have lived in the diaspora outside the land of Israel due to various historical conflicts that led to their persecution alongside multiple instances of expulsions and exoduses. In the late 19th century, 99.7% of the world's Jews lived outside the region, with Jews representing 2-5% to of the population of the Palestine region. Think about that. That's all in the 1800s, before this colonization project began, they... 99.7% of the world's Jews lived outside that region and only 2 to 5% lived inside the region of That's which right. are of Semitic origin. Those are not Ashkenazi. Those are Semitic origin, you know, people from the Middle East or North Africa. That's what we mean right. by you know, Semitic populations. So, so it says he continuing, he says, despite its historical value as a nation, as uh, a national as, uh, aspiration for the Jewish people, the Aliyah was acted upon by few prior to the rise of a national awakening among Jews worldwide and the subsequent development of the Zionist movement in the late 19th century. The large-scale immigration of Jews to Palestine had, had consequently begun in 1882, which obviously we presented Edmund more than Rocha. enough. Exactly. Yeah. Since the Israeli Declaration of Independence in 1948, more than 3 million Jews have made, an, uh, made Aliyah. Now, granted. What's that know, picture? That boat? Is that during the Havara Agreement? Uh, the Palmach immigration to Israel. This the work. Uh, this work or image is now. Oh, sorry. 
Uh, this is the Palmark archive via the I was taking. looking to see what year that was. This is the Israel. Oops, not that. Where did I where to go? Uh, too many things up. Uh, there. Okay. Uh, hmm. Bad connection. <laughs> that's all right. That's all right. That's Picky wiki right. Israel free image collection project. So, but it's uh it says the Palmach immigration. Something just. Well, it doesn't look like an eighteen hundreds boat. That's my point. And uh, the, during the Havar agreement, there's a lot of pictures of uh, Eastern European okay, here's uh, the... migrants on those boats. Wait, that what? have it says the Palmach. Various was the elite and... fighting force the Haganah, the underground huh. army of the Yeshu, Jewish community during the period of the British Mandate for Palestine. You're right. That would have it's been 20th century. That picture that of the 20th century. The Palmach, Palmach was established in May 1941 by the outbreak of the 1948 Arab-Israeli War. It consisted of over 2,000 men and women in three fighting brigades and auxiliary aerial, naval, and intelligence units. Now, I don't know if that is a that picture perfectly represents. It says here the Palmach, immigration to Israel. And it has like a liner that would look like it's from the 20th century, I would presume. Yeah. And those yeah, look like folks, those look I've like seen, European I've, peoples there, you know, in, in this picture here. So yeah, we've got folks curious. with pictures like that. All right. Moving forward, because we got a long way to go and a short time to get there. All right. So we're going to start out this uh, next block. Uh, there's going to be two clips in here with the Israeli English speaking propaganda meister from London, Elon Levy, who I follow on Twitter. He he writes some of the best content out there. Uh, if you want to see someone like do but, but like sure, bend over backwards Shulmi. to like make you believe like they didn't do the thing, uh, he's he's like he's better than Shmuley or whatever. What's that name? Shmuley. He's way better than Shmuley. Shmuley. That's it. Shmuley. But the last clip we're going to see with him in this block is him promoting Generation Z, which is Generation Zionist. And after you see that he's doing that, and he's their propaganda meister, like you might start to get the Goebbels feeling about the situation because. it's the youth, they didn't, uh, they, they have some youth projects back then and they were going after the youth. There was this thing, I don't know, watch Swing Kids about uh, World War II youth. <laughs> That's a good movie from back in the day. Uh, okay, so also in this clip, I have to say it like this. How many Zionists does it take to remove a Palestinian flag from Orthodox Jews who are flying it in Jerusalem? Orthodox Jews in Jerusalem, they put up a Palestinian flag. How many Zionist police officers do you need to deal with these Orthodox people? If you guessed two dozen, you're probably pretty close because I counted at least 20 to 24, depending on how the, the scenes are cut. Uh, people who are very militant and very threatened by the colors that were get, that were raised. And then later, we have a clip with the comedian that you just saw on Bad Hasbara explaining with Zach Foster that you saw last week, explaining how the word Palestine was like made illegal in Palestine that they can't even use it since the 1980s. You can't have it anywhere. You can't have it in the name of your business, can't have your association, not allowed to say that word. So we're going to we're going to weave all this together, but it takes longer attention spans than what people watching mainstream media can muster. And if you want the understanding and the confidence that comes with that knowledge base and the ability to converse and discuss openly and freely with others, then uh, stay on this ride because we're going to play it up right now. We have four clips. It doesn't take that long in this segment. The last two are from Elon Levy. Those are really the ones you need to pay special attention to. And uh, let's roll, as Larry Silverstein might say. Or he says, pull up. Oh. 
There's the flag in question. See who wins the flag or Bad flag. It's like they took down a terrorist. I mean, they, that's why they need all those people. Now imagine if this film were black and white. That's very good out there. In the juxtaposition between what looks to be a religious community and then obviously a military force is very stark. The one is clearly a secular nationalistic force and the other actually believes in their scripture, I guess. Believes in equality and fairness for man. You can go ahead and cut the next LD. All right. This one is, uh, these are kids. This is 2005. Last week we looked at 2001, 2002, 2005. This is uh, Palestinian kids throwing rocks. And uh, there might be a little bit of shooting or something there. But these kids grew up to be in Gaza on 10-7. If they survived all this. So it didn't start on 10-7. There's been a lot of mistreatment of youth and uh, non-tolerance of their rock throwing against tanks, which can't be hurt by rocks, by the way. It's not a big deal. They're actually made to survive it. All right, here's here's Elon Levy coming up. You're telling me Israeli tanks can survive rock bombardments? Well, not if from Dwayne kids. the Rock Johnson. He could probably rip uh -huh. one of those open, but... Rage <laughs> does that. The Potemkin village of. All right, he here. Propaganda Meister on Fox News gets like prime spotlight seat. So let's check this out. Confirms that they say that Israel has agreed to the framework of a proposed Gaza ceasefire and hostage release deal, and it's now up to Hamas to agree to it. This comes as Biden approves the first U.S. military airdrop of food and supplies into the Gaza Strip. Here with reaction, Israeli government spokesman Elon Levy. Uh, Elon, thanks for being here. Good morning. Thank you for having um, me. What do you make of this report? Is there a ceasefire uh, on the horizon? Well, there's not going to be a ceasefire that leaves the hostages in Gaza or Hamas in power. But what we do want to see is a temporary pause in the fighting to get those poor hostages out. We're talking about 134 people who have been trapped in the Hamas terror dungeons for 149 days now. It's too late for 33 of them. They've already been killed in captivity. And we want to see a pause in the fighting to help get those poor hostages back to their families. Uh, how many of those hostages would you get for that pause, and what kind of a pause are you talking about? I can't confirm any details until everything is confirmed. Obviously, we want to get all of the hostages out and are doing everything we can. That is why Israel is continuing to place unrelenting military pressure on Hamas to release the hostages. That's how we got the last 105 hostages out during the temporary pause in November, and we want another pause to get all the others out, too. Um, how is the military operation going for, for viewers here that sort of see uh, snippets? They also 
we also watched the hair on fire criticism of the left and the international community. But it, from Israel's perspective, as far as eradicating Hamas, how is it going? Well, people said there was no military solution and the military campaign has been exceeding expectations. Hamas started this war with 24 battalions and essentially only the last four in Rafah are still standing. We've managed to shatter Hamas's military formations, destroy its missile production capability. That's why in Tel Aviv, we basically haven't heard a rocket siren in two months already. We're continuing to move in on the Hamas terror army to bring it to justice for 10-7, and more importantly, to make sure that it can never perpetrate those atrocities again and again as it is threatening to do. How do you feel about aid being dropped by the U.S.? Well, uh, is there any... <laughs> when you drop it that way, is there any way to control whether it goes to the civilian population or whether Hamas takes it and leverages it? Well, this is a way to try to get aid to civilians and make sure Hamas can't steal it. We have enough capacity at Israel's crossings to get more aid into Gaza. The question is, how do you get it to civilians who need it? while making sure Hamas can't steal it. And to date, Hamas has been stealing aid and the United Nations has been covering it up. So the airdrops are one way that we are looking into getting aid straight to civilians who need it, while making sure that the terror organization that started this war, that has brought ruin to the people of Gaza by starting the 10-7 atrocities and triggering this war, that the people can get the aid and the terrorists can't get their hands on it. Uh, is the U.S. putting too much pressure on at this point from the outside is there a sense in israel that that, that the, from the prime minister on don you can't conduct the war you want to you know president biden said right at the beginning of this war that if the 10 7 atrocities had happened to the united states its response would be swift decisive and overwhelming and that's what we're doing and we've had firm moral military diplomatic support not only from the administration a bipartisan basis most importantly from the american people as well the big harvard harris poll this week showing 82 percent of americans support israel over hamas we have a problem with the university on the campuses, as you'll be aware of, but we know that the American people stand firmly behind Israel as we fight to bring those poor hostages home and Hamas to justice. Well, you're certainly right about the American people. You're right about the universities. And I know you can't say it about the White House, but uh, hopefully they stay strong. We'll see if they do. Uh, Elon, thank you very much thank for you your be. time. For nearly five months, I know that you've all been glued to the news unable to look away watching what Hamas is doing in horror and how Israelis are fighting back in awe. Back home, Israelis have barely registered news from the rest of the world except for one story, because it is our story. And that is the horrific surge in anti-Semitism from awful people ripping down posters of little kidnapped children marching in solidarity with Hamas terrorists. From those who saw the 10-7 massacre not as an unforgivable atrocity, but as an unmissable opportunity to turn the youth of today against the Israel of tomorrow. But I think that my neighbors in Israel should be looking even more closely at the amazing diaspora awakening triggered by the 10-7 massacre, at the incredible fight back that you, American Jewry's Gen Z are starting to mount. They should be looking at the transformation of Gen Z into Gen Zionist. And that is what I want to talk to you about tonight, what it means to make Gen Z Gen Zionist. Being a Zionist has always meant standing up to the bullies, refusing to be that snotty-nosed kid who gets pushed into the lockers. Zionism is the Jews holding our ground and standing up for ourselves, even when we're outnumbered and the odds are stacked against us. And throughout history, the odds have never been on our side. Not for the generations who dreamed of Israel or the generations who built it, not for the generations who fought for Israel, and feared they might lose it. They all stood up to the bullies, even when the odds were stacked against them more than TikTok's algorithm is stacked against you. And now it's your turn. On October 7th, the bloodiest massacre of Jews since the Holocaust triggered a wave of revolting exhilaration. 
and you've seen the people marching right underneath your windows, calling to wipe out the Jewish state from the river to the sea, tearing down the hostage posters, promising only one, presumably final solution, Intifada revolution. Wicked or stupid, I don't know, but they are bullies, dangerous bullies. They're chanting ceasefire now and globalize the Intifada in the same breath, demanding that the Jews cease so their friends in Hamas can fire. Now we've been talking today and I know that this moment has left so many of you feeling betrayed. Looking around at your classmates, your teachers, your deans, people you thought you trusted only to find that at the most critical moment of your lives, they not only turned their backs on you, they turned against you. So this is your moment. This is Gen Zionist moment. The bullies have come out in force and we all need you to stand up to them. Good, pull it. All right, so you can see the concern that someone who's a comprehensive, literate, uh, literate person who understands the words and what they mean and what they've added up to thus far. Because I think that was a bunch of Hasbara aimed at kids who are not given the opportunity to weigh the other side and make their own decision. That's indoctrination, that's programming, and that is very reminiscent to what happened in a certain uh, Prussian state about 90 years ago to lead up to World War II. So I don't think that that's good. And the other aspect, when you go back to his Fox and Friends appearance, first off, He's doing a press tour in America. That's an American studio he's in. And we're going to learn later tonight, uh, BB has like people come to America and go on to UK because they know they're losing support. So they're like scrambling right now. So he's on Fox and Friends and he says, we're going to continue this war till we get rid of Hamas leadership and until all the hostages are free. Unfortunately, the, you know, what's the accurate number of the hostages kept? Because a lot of those hostages were killed from friendly fire and other things that have already kind of been worked out. Um, so are those hostages really going to be rescued? We don't know what the truth of those numbers are. And then going back to the first point, the leadership of Hamas has always been in Qatar. Here they are, Hamas leaders worth staggering $11 billion, rev one luxury, while Gaza's people suffer. So it, have you, have they launched any attacks on Qatar going after leadership? And if not, they have permission to keep doing genocide and ethnic cleansing because they're never going to be able to sort out Gaza, right? This is where they're trying to wipe out Hamas. And this over here, this is where the leadership is, uh, if you're able to see my mouse, which it looks like on that screen you're not able to. But the point would be um, they're attacking where the innocent the women and children across are. across Saudi Arabia. Right. So then the other side, of the which is a British Anglo-American controlled territory, right? That's a lot of space. And the U S intelligence has bases in Qatar, like U S Intel. We got operations and stuff over there. Israel could just make a phone call and say, you know, do the Munich thing where you go wipe these guys out. They're not doing that. They're bombing women and children. They're starving them. They're dehydrating them. And it's, it's not a good look. And we're going to see later tonight, like Hamas might be defeating Israel and not in the way you think. Because Gandhi said, in order to end the brutality and oppression, you have to make that brutality and oppression visible to the large audience. And then they see what the colonizers do, and then people call for an end to it, right? And we're going to get to other stories that are trying to attract attention to this very important geopolitical situation that too few people have a working knowledge of that is accurate and factual of the evidence that is here in history to be studied. So it's kind of a big problem. And we're slowly... And surely educating people episode by episode on this topic so that you can't be confronted with Hasbara from Eugene or I'm sorry, Elon Levy and believe it because, you know, when he says IDF didn't shoot, you know, you know, they didn't shoot at their own convoy, but they did shoot at the people. And we're going to see the evidence of that tonight, too. So <clears throat> he's a good propagandist. He's he's a he's a very good sophist for the younger generations, um, unlike Rabbi Shmuley, which. It's more of a caricature and easier to sort of like uh, cast aside. This this individual is more of what I would call a classical sophist. He knows how to play to the ambitions, the fears, the emotions of the crowd, and you know utilize uh, tropes and and bromides and cliches that are already accepted within the circles that he you know citismat citismatically parrots 
Hasbara from the Likud party. And he, you know, but he does it in such a way that's charismatic. You know, he knows how to accent, you know, the emotional appeal very well. You know, his good cadence and spacing and sort of timbre with his voice. Like he's much more approachable. And I think that's what makes him much, so much more dangerous as an individual. Um, and so they certainly picked uh, a well-polished sophist and well-trained and for that matter. Um, and that, that makes it all the more, it's easier for me to, and, and for us, I think, you know, is to see through the, the obvious uh, absurdity. We can see the, the absurdity of both of them, but Shmuley is such a, a caricature and absurdity in and of himself. But this, this individual, no, this one, he'll, he'll make people feel confident and he'll give people assurance, especially for younger generations, just through his calm, cool, sort of charismatic approach. And that's very disconcerting. And that's sort of what we're up against in regards to the Hasbro they're currently promoting, especially for the younger generations. All right. Coming up in this next media block, uh, we have a little bit on how the Israeli settlements got started. So it's not just uh, the main movement in there under the colonization and the creation of the state, but this is from like, the 1967 war, spoils of war, they took Gaza and the West Bank and included it. And all those people that have been held their prisoner the entire time have never had their freedom. We need to learn about how Israel's like, oh, let's just start some settlements among those places and try to drive the people out. Um, we're also going to take just a couple minutes uh, looking at Palestine in uh, 2023 and uh, just like a minute. To look like uh, to see what it looked like like a week before the war, and then that gives you context to go to the next clip, uh, where you see some of the female uh, boss lady police guards that they have over there and their training, and how they keep the Palestinians in a, a perfect apartheid and feel really good about it, and then uh, the last clip what about is, female Zionist female empowerment, yeah. Girl, girl bosses. And then uh, the last clip is called uh, We Will Win by Vaad Hat Zedeka. And apparently it's a very popular Israeli kind of military porn type thing. So we're going to take a look at that and then we're going to come back because then we get to really break into some of the meat of this episode, having laid the groundwork for the argument that we're putting on the stage. Let's get to it. This is me driving in what I think is one of the most bizarre places in the world. I just crossed over from Israel into the West Bank. If you look at a map of where I'm driving right now, you'll see a jumbled mess of Palestinian towns and villages, which are shown in green, and Israeli settlements, which are in blue. Many people think of this territory as Palestine, but of the 3 million people living out here, almost 20% of them are Jewish Israeli citizens. The Israelis living out here are called settlers. They live in the West Bank, but they're citizens of Israel. As I drive, I'm looking at effectively two different nations woven into each other through decades of conflict. I visited 15 settlements all over the West Bank, talking to people who have decided to pack up and move out into the middle of disputed land. We'll meet them in coming videos, but first I want to take a look at the maps that help explain how the West Bank got to look like this. So let's go back to 1948 when the map looked a lot different. Back then, all this land was controlled by Great Britain. And due to growing tensions between Jews and Arabs, the UN worked with Britain to split the land into two states. One for Jews, Israel, and another one for Arabs, Palestine. The Jews in the region accepted this plan and declared independence of the state of Israel. But the Arab states in the region saw this plan as just more European colonialism. They didn't accept the plan and instead declared war on Israel. Israel won the war, pushing well past the borders of the UN plan. During the peace negotiations, a ceasefire line was drawn in green ink. It became known as the Green Line. It wasn't necessarily a border, it was just a ceasefire line, with this being the state of Israel, and this section being controlled by Jordan, who had taken control of it during the war. The Jordanians named this newly seized land the West Bank because it was west of the Jordan River. The fragile ceasefire remained until 1967 when Israel fought another war with its Arab neighbors. Israel wasn't looking to take over land in this war, but in just six days of fighting, it blew past the Green Line and seized a whole swath of land, including the entire West Bank. Suddenly, Israel had a decision to make. 
Do they make the West Bank a part of Israel and give the 1.1 million Arabs living there Israeli citizenship and voting rights? Do they give the land back to their enemy Jordan? Or else do they let the people create their own Palestinian state? This became a major debate in Israeli politics. Many Israelis saw this war they just won as not just a military victory, but a religious sign that the Jews were meant to return to the place where a huge amount of Jewish history happened the hills of the ancient Judea and Samaria, which is basically the entire West Bank. So while the government was debating what to do, Israeli civilians began moving into the West Bank without any permission from the government. They just started setting up homes, establishing a Jewish presence in this region. Suddenly, any debate about what to do with the West Bank had to take into account the growing number of Israeli civilians that were living there. But the rest of the world did not approve of this. As the settler presence grew, the UN issued a resolution saying that the settlements had no legal validity and that they constitute a serious obstruction to achieving a comprehensive, just, and lasting peace in the Middle East. They were basically saying that this settler activity was totally illegal. Two different narratives emerged here. One said that Jewish civilians were moving on to mostly empty plots of land that they had captured in a war and that had deep historical and spiritual significance to them. The other side, which is the side that most of the world took, said that these settlers were colonizing land to expand their nation. In spite of international condemnation, the number of settlers in the West Bank grew. Over the next few decades, more and more factions of the Israeli government began to support the settler movement, allocating public resources and granting permits for building. The Israeli housing ministry and military began developing plans on how to develop the West Bank. They built roads throughout the entire region, allowing easy access between the settlements and mainland Israel. More and more building permits were given out and planned communities began popping up all over the West Bank. The settlements slowly shifted from a fringe group of motivated civilians to an institutionalized part of Israeli society, totally supported by the state. Here are the Palestinian towns in the West Bank. Watch how the settlements weave throughout these Palestinian towns. Palestinians didn't like this encroachment. They began protesting, often with extreme violence. Between the violence and the condemnations from the international community of the settlements, the situation became unsustainable. So in the mid-1990s, American President Bill Clinton, Israeli Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin, and Palestinian leader Yasser Arafat signed the Oslo Accords, agreements that established a Palestinian government and split the West Bank into three sections. Area A gave Palestinians total control over security and government. This makes up about 18% of the West Bank, but most of the Palestinian population centers are here. This was a big deal because it gave Palestinians self-rule for the first time. Area B was designated for Palestinian government control while retaining Israeli security control, meaning the Israeli military remains very present there. Area B is about 22% of the West Bank. Area C remained completely under the Israeli military and government control. This is where all the settlements are in Area C. And it's about 60% of the West Bank. So this is basically how we ended up with this mess of a map. Israelis can come and go from mainland Israel through really nice roads that go straight to the settlements. They call these roads flyovers because they bypass Palestinian villages and give easy access from one settlement to the other. But not every settlement has one of these flyover roads. Palestinians can drive on almost all the roads in the West Bank, but their movement is often more difficult, more restricted. They have to stop at checkpoints and get their car inspected sometimes. Sometimes it makes for some really long lines. But certainly one of the most difficult aspects of this carved up land situation is how it hinders Palestinians from being able to build an economy. Area C, which is under Israeli control, contains the majority of the West Bank's agricultural land, as well as the water and mineral resources. Palestinian companies are severely restricted in accessing these resources, which takes a huge hit on their economy. So with these three sections agreed upon by both sides, the settlements continued to grow in Area C. But in 2005, something happened that would ignite even more passion for the settler movement in Israel. Prime Minister Ariel Sharon decided to remove 8,500 settlers from the Gaza Strip, which was another disputed area where there was a lot of settlements. Seeing Israelis forcibly evicted, their homes demolished, left a huge mark on the country, especially the settlers. They immediately redoubled their effort to settle the West Bank, and the numbers continued to grow. Most people who think about a resolution to this conflict propose a two-state solution, meaning giving the Palestinians a state somewhere in this West Bank region. 
But if you look at this map, you can start to see that it's getting harder and harder to do that. The settlers living in the West Bank are not living in tents or caravans. They're living in developed communities with schools and hospitals and even a university. It's not going to be that easy to uproot these communities. In the next video, I'll go inside the settlements and talk to the people who are living there. Jewish people have come home. That's, that's not going to change. You can cut the next. أنا اسمي سمية وشاح عمري 11 سنة من قطاع غزة. نحن الآن على كام عائلة عبد الله. هذا المنزل الذي استشهد فيه 17 شخصا. نقف الآن أمام مخبز السفراء، المخبز الوحيد في مخيم النصيرات الذي يعمل الآن. كما نشاهد أعداد كبيرة من النازحين تقف في طابور طويل من أجل الحصول على ربطة خبز واحد. نحن الآن في مخيم النصيرات للاجئين، وهذا هو سوق المخيم المليء بالنازحين الذين هربوا من القتل والخوف من مدينة رفح. زمان كانت عندي المهنة إني أكون صحفية من قبل الحرب وأنا كان نفسي أثبت حالي للعالم كانت قدوتي اللي هي شيرين أبو عقلة الله يرحمها كان نفسي أثبت حالي للعالم زي ما هي بتثبت حالها مش خايفة يحصل يحصل لك أي حاجة بسبب ال... ال... هذا العمل اللي بتقومي بيه لا مش خايفة أنا أصلا لما أطلع بتوكل على الله كان بابا وماما رفضين هذا المجال الصحافة تماما لأنه هم عارفين أنه بيستهدف الصحفيين لكن لما شافوني أنا مصرة وبدي أكون في مجال الصحافة وافقوا كنت أطلع يعني وأحكي لهم ماما وبابا أنا هيني طالعة وأطلع يعني أتوكل على الله لكن أنا مش عارفة أني حستهدف في الطريق أو لما أروح أو حتى وأنا بصور كمان إنه توقف الحرب والناس والعالم يعني يقدم الإنسانية لقطاع لأطفال قطاع غزة. You are about to meet the women tasked with safeguarding some of the Middle East most sacred and disputed landmarks and territories. My name is India, and today we are going on a real patrol with Israel's female border police. The border police of Israel are integral to the nation's security and have been involved in key operations since their formation. The force is known for its presence in Jerusalem, where they perform a variety of security duties and are heavily involved in anti-terrorism and riot control operations. Interestingly enough, Israel has seen a notable increase in the number of women joining its border police, who make up around 35% of the approximately 9,000 strong force. In recent years, there have been a record number of female officers in training, leading to the formation of the first female-majority companies in the border police's history. This surge reflects a growing interest and commitment among Israeli women to participate in defending the country's borders. I'm Moran, I'm 35 years old. I'm in a family with my wife and my mother. I'm 17 years old. Moran is the only female border police commander here in the West Bank. The West Bank is a significant and complex region divided into areas A, B, and C based on the Oslo Accords. 
This division affects the daily lives of people in the region and is a focal point of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Why did you decide to become a border police officer? אני דור שלישי במשמר הגבול. אני ממשיכה דרך. גם סבא שלי היה, גם אבא שלי, זיכרונו לברכה, היה קצין במשמר הגבול, הספקתי לשרת יחד איתו. זה ככה אחד מהמניעים שלי להמשיך את דרכו. ודבר נוסף, אני רואה בזה שליחות מאוד מאוד גדולה. Women like Moran, assuming key roles in the West Bank, demonstrate the growth of female leadership in especially high pressure and volatile environments. המטרה שלנו פה בעיקר זה להבטיח את שלומם וביטחונם של כל מי שחי בגזרה הזאת. אנחנו מדברים גם על המתיישבים ואנחנו מדברים גם על הפלסטינאים שנמצאים פה. But their job does not come without risks. In January 2024, in the West Bank city of Jenin, a female border police officer, Sergeant Shai Galmai, was killed in a terror attack when an explosive device targeted her and her unit's vehicle during armed clashes in the region. What are the challenges of women, specifically, in the border police? Lohamot Bachayl nechnesu kvar mi... שנת 95, היום כבר בנו, לוחמות, קצינות, הגיעו לדרג המ"פ, שזה משהו שקרה רק בתקופה האחרונה. היחס הוא שווה ערך מבחינת נשים וגברים, לוחמות ולוחמים בחיל, ואין תפקיד שפתוח ללוחם או קצין מפקד במשמר הגבול שהוא לא פתוח ללוחמת או מפקדת. פה זה המפעל של הר ברכה, של הטחינה. וואו, שזה הטחינה? אפשר אחר כך לעצור שנייה. אה, כן. הם מביאים טחינה ככה לטעימה. The city we are overlooking now, Nablus, has experienced tensions, particularly between neighboring Jewish communities and Palestinian residents. את יכולה לראות פה? את קבר יוסף, ממש איפה שהכיפה הלבנה. נבלוס is a major Palestinian city in the West Bank, and it is also home to Joseph's tomb, which is one of the most important holy sites in Judaism. Because it is a Palestinian city, Jewish Israelis face restriction on access. As a result, when religious Jews visit to pray every so often, it necessitates a substantial joint security operation between the border police and the Israeli army to manage the significant risks involved. So the rest of our shoot was canceled because unfortunately there was a terror attack in Tel Aviv. I will keep you updated. Jerusalem, Israel's capital, is a city at the epicenter of historical and religious significance and a focal point for security concerns. The border police's significant presence here is a direct response to the myriad of security challenges the city faces. Stabbings, shootings, arson, vehicle rams, and stone-throwing attacks are all too common. It demands constant vigilance to maintain peace. Here we are already coming to the heart of Silwan, to the city that is already starting to be a part of his life. We are going to our enemies, whether it is in a bag of water, a bag of water, we are sometimes going to be here. In the heart of these tensions lies Silwan, an Arab-Palestinian neighborhood in East Jerusalem. In recent years, Silwan has become a flashpoint due to housing disputes, particularly in the Batan al-Hawa section, where the eviction of 19 Palestinian families has ignited major controversy. These disputes are deeply rooted in history, revolving around the claims to homes that were owned by Jews before Jordan's occupation of East Jerusalem in 1948 similar to the cases in a nearby neighborhood also in East Jerusalem, Sheikh Jarrah. The legal battles and subsequent evictions have heightened friction in Silwan, as a handful of Jewish families now reside among the neighborhood's Palestinian population. This is the Jewish house. It's called Beth Yonatan. It's a house that was not found by a few people. It's also a house itself. You can see it. So what do you do when there is a conflict between a Jewish family and an Arab family? Oh, 
אנחנו נמות ולא נתגייס. זה המסר של ההפגנה פה. They don't want us to be Jewish, therefore we prefer to die and not go to the army. Oh, it looks like apartheid. Use the water cannons. Rappaport's looking for that stuff, I'm sure. I mean, we we saw some water cannons used at the protest last week. Those were Orthodox Jews protesting uh, mandatory indoctrination into the army. They heretofore have had an ex exemption from that, and now the IDF is looking for fresh meat for the grinder, and those guys were uh, protesting almost look a little bit anti-semitic we have uh we have a lot to uh to cover from that you saw the girl bosses and uh there's a quote about the the human shields and then it goes into like look at what's going on if you turn that class clip black and white again it looks like something out of spielberg's schindler's list uh we had the young palestinian journalist and last week we covered uh the funeral where we saw again a bunch of Israeli police, Zionist police, beating down the people that were just trying to have a funeral for that journalist who was shot while she was covering the war. And now the the little 11 year old is being uh, put out there as the next generation in Palestinian war reporters. And then uh, we do have one last clip in this block. Let's just take a second of a uh, couple. Let's just play it and we'll talk over it. Uh, this is the one that says uh, we will win. And this is uh, some war propaganda that's going on over there. הכוונות האלה אנחנו צריכים להילחץ. זה הרחפן. תודה רבה לבד, הצדקה. או בלב חאן יונס, שני מחבלים גילינו בעזרתו. אני רוצה להודות לוועד הצדקה שכבר פועלים ארבעה חודשים ללא הרף למען החזית ולמען העורף. עשרות מתנדבים מחלקים ציוד חשוב לחיילים שלנו. והשליחים הטובים הם ארגון ועד הצדקה. תודה רבה על העבודה just a little has borrow for you to to pep you up they got lots of technology they got drones in the sky they, you know everyone's uh rah rah for the war almost as if like hamas did them a favor by doing 10 7 so they could get like their full genocide and ethnic cleansing on that was my initial hypothesis something very strange happened on 10 7th and i don't think we've really gotten to the bottom of exactly oh, but we're how about to. multiple failures all at the same time with precognizance on the military side that there operation jericho wall operation jericho wall right covered yeah, it yeah and we covered it yeah exactly. so and and the fact that the Likud party you know build up Hamas only to create the straw man they needed and the justice you know, to create the international, not only the national, but the international justification for the, their need to go and clear them out. River um, to the sea is in Likud charter, 1977 lines one and two. All right. So in that, that milieu, remember a couple of weeks ago, Tony, uh, Thomas Friedman, no, yeah. who I blame for the flat earth movement. Cause he wrote a book called the world is flat and people who don't read just took that as like, a that's a metaphor. Thing. Everyone. It's a metaphor. It's a metaphor. It's a metaphor. It's a metaphor. Economics. Just Globalist having economics. <laughs> having fun. But that's a real Thomas Friedman book. That was a famous book when I was in college. Very He's famous. He's the guy. 
who yeah, compared really. like people in the Middle East to animals, specifically like insects and Hamas is a trapdoor spider and these sort of things. There's going to be a clip coming up later where you're going to see again footage that makes people look like insects. And I think it's on purpose because we're going to show it to you like color footage and it doesn't like it's so it's like purposeful like dehumanization through the technology. And there's a theme to that. However, in this media block coming up, we're going to learn about some news that heretofore was unknown to this show. And I have not seen, like you've seen the, le the, the level and depth of coverage that we've given to this topic. This has not been on the radar of anybody that I've been checking out. So I did find this clip earlier this week. So tying it back into Thomas Friedman, uh, allegedly uh, official sources say heard on the street that Thomas Friedman has a, a new comparison and that Israel is like, a hawk and that Hamas is like a snake. And uh, in this new fake hypothesis of Thomas Friedman's that I just made up because I saw this meme and wanted to show it to you, I think that Thomas Friedman in this hypothetical that I made up just to show you this meme uh, did not watch till the end of the video. And so the hawk strategy to take out Hamas might backfire. And this matches up to a clip that's in this media block. That's another reason to show you this meme. Here you go. He's got a snake. He's thinking about it. Maybe he shouldn't have tried to get the snake. Right about there. It's like, oh, maybe it's a bad strategy. Trying to do the full ethnic cleansing genocide in front of the whole world while they're watching. Maybe we should have done this during prescriptive edge or operation. What was the one uh, that they did back in 2008? It's uh, got that. Cast lead. Past oh, lead. 2008, 2008, I forget that one. Yeah, like they're throwing lead. So, you know, lessons to be learned in history. Um, yeah, that was at Gaza. Yeah, cast lead. Don't invade Russia in the winter. Something that Napoleon and Hitler didn't figure out. But uh, yeah, I mean, nature is metal. And uh, I subtitled that one. <laughs> nature is metal. Uh, I said, don't tread on memes. That's what that one was called. All right, so... <clears throat> With all that being said, now we're ready to get into some real heavy-duty information. We have laid the foundation, who set up Israel, why. It's a couple different uh, a banking power and a military power, and there's all sorts of things that come with that, including energy and Gaza resources out in the sea that they have rights to, but they're not going to have rights to because they won't be there anymore because they're being ethnically cleansed. We're going to get into this clip, and it's going to start out with uh, the claim from Breakthrough News. This is not my quote. This is their claim. Israel is a racist supremacist state. And no, it's not the video that we showed you uh, last media block or two media blocks ago. The next one in this block is called Hamas issued their own statement about October 7th and it got ignored. And I was a little incredulous. I happened to click that and I was like, hmm, hmm. It gives you a little context away on the other side of the scale because all we've heard is like Elon Levy and BB. And uh, Ben Gavir and uh, the guy from the IDF spokesman, all these people telling you a very one-sided story about pelvis is crushed and breasts and footballs and all this other stuff, 40 beheaded babies. We're also going to get to the basis of those claims. All those stories have fallen apart this past week, a whole bunch of them. And it leads back to some stuff that we have to save to the end of the episode because that's how touchy it is. So, uh, and then in the last clip that rounded out because we need a little more comedy, uh, the truth behind the shocking rise in anti-Semitism by Lee Camp, because what he's going to probably show you is that by expanding the definition of anti-Semitism to include anyone who says freedom for Palestinians, let's just call that genocidal talk. Let's call it anti-Semitism. All of a sudden you got billions more anti-Semites in the world and the ADL can get cash, cash in on that one. All right. So here we go. Uh, it's going to be, there's going to be a little turbulence in the second video. This is going to catch some people unaware of the claims that are made. And we're not going to say we believe all these claims, but we are going to hear them out and listen and weigh these claims to check them to see if they have veracity and evidence that exists in reality. That's how we do it. Let's roll. Israel is one of the most racist countries in the world. While my you words. never hear anyone in the mainstream media say this, this is actually one of the most important things you need to understand if you want to know what's happening right now. <laughs>
From its inception, the whole idea of Israel as a country was based on racism. Israel was conceived as a Jewish state, and while there's nothing wrong in principle with Jews having a homeland, the problem is that they insisted that that homeland had to be in Palestine, which already belonged to someone, the Palestinians. The slogan of Israel's founders was, a land for a people for a people without a land. But deep down, they all knew that the only way to have a Jewish majority in Palestine, an Arab country, was to expel the Arabs. One of the founders of Israel, Yosef Weitz, wrote, there's no room in the country for both peoples. There's no way but to transfer the Arabs from here to neighboring countries. Israel was quite literally founded by expelling and massacring hundreds of thousands of Arabs in a years-long process called the Nakba. And when you found a country based on racial exclusion, you're gonna get a culture that fosters and celebrates racial exclusion. Because countries that commit terrible atrocities rarely acknowledge committing those atrocities. And the presence of Palestinians who remained in Palestine became a constant reminder, not only of the violence that founded Israel, but of the constantly looming threat that they might come back and try to reclaim their land. Every day you can find videos coming out of Israel showing Israelis calling for all Arabs to die. Insulting the Prophet Muhammad. Desecrating mosques, <laughs> spitting on Christians, mocking and celebrating the murder of Palestinians, committing violent hate crimes against Palestinians, watching Gaza get carpet bombed from a cliffside for entertainment. But don't just go off these anecdotes. Let's look at some of the polls. One poll found that two thirds of Israeli teens believe Arabs to be less intelligent, uncultured, and violent. It also found that 50% of Israelis wouldn't live in the same building as Arabs, wouldn't befriend Arabs, wouldn't let their children befriend Arabs, and wouldn't let Arabs into their homes. Another poll found that 60% of Israeli Jews want segregation from Arabs. Another poll found that half of Israeli Jews agree with the statement, most Jews are better than most non-Jews because they were born Jews. Jews. The poll also found that 88% of Israeli Jews would be disturbed if their son befriended an Arab girl, and 90% would be disturbed if their daughter befriended an Arab boy. This poll found that about half of Israeli high schoolers don't think Arabs should have the right to vote. Another poll showed that almost half of Israeli Jews don't want Arabs teaching their kids. Not only are these views widely held in Israeli society, they're also represented in government, which codifies these sentiments into law. For example, Israel has a law that says if an Israeli marries a Palestinian or someone from several other regional Arab states, that person isn't allowed to move in with said Israeli. This law was passed in 2003, but it's been renewed every single year since. Israel also doesn't allow interreligious marriage to be performed in the country, which is meant to deter Jews from marrying non-Jews. In 2018, Israel passed the nation state law, a law which has constitutional status, which says the right to exercise national self-determination, i.e. have rights, is the exclusive right of Jews no one else. There's also the Nakba law, which makes it illegal to acknowledge the Nakba, the expulsions of Palestinians that were needed to found Israel. This would be like passing a law to make it illegal to talk about indigenous genocide or slavery in America. There's also the admissions committee law, which basically allows towns to operate panels that deny applications for entry based on socio-cultural compatibility, which essentially just legalizes racist housing discrimination. In Israel, advocating genocide of Palestinians doesn't hurt your chances of holding a high position in government. And in fact, in many cases, it helps. In 2014, Israeli lawmaker Ayelet Shaked wrote an unhinged rant on Facebook, calling all Palestinians enemy combatants and saying their mothers should be killed for giving birth to, quote, little snakes. The next year, she was appointed Minister of Justice by Benjamin Netanyahu. Itamar Ben-Gavir, a lifelong admirer of Mer Kahan, an Arab exterminationist, a man who praised a Jewish settler who killed a Palestinian for throwing a rock at him, a man who was famously acquitted after being criminally charged for chanting death to Arabs, is Israel's current Minister of National Security. He's not some fringe figure either. He's one of the most popular politicians in Israel right now. In the last few days, Israel's been working hard to cast itself as the victim, 
the victim of hatred, the victim of terrorism, the victim of anti-Semitism, that they have no choice but to lay siege to Gaza. But underneath this carefully concocted victim complex is a racist, Jewish supremacist state that's been trying to finish the job that the Nakba started for decades. And really, this shouldn't come as a surprise to anyone. After all, they're literally cutting off water and electricity to a city of 2 million people right now. Their generals talk openly about flattening Gaza and killing the animals, meaning Palestinians. It's obvious their goal is genocide. Right, so it's a somewhat obvious oversight in journalistic coverage of the events of October 7th that nobody had bothered to actually ask Hamas why they did what they did. While nobody condones the violence they may have shown on the night of October 7th, so many narratives have been weaved in order to, at least at first, justify the Israeli response. Before it became crystal clear, it wasn't proportionate. It was genocide that was being carried out instead. In light of that, you'd think perhaps somebody might try and, you know, talk to Hamas, get their side of the story, interview them about their actions, their plans, and their intentions, but no, not a hope, not from our media. In fact, Hamas have released a statement, but that's too much like effort to pay attention to as well, it would seem. In fact, for this statement to come to my attention, it's come from a Palestinian academic in the Western Bank to a Palestinian activist in this country who then took it to a renowned independent news site. So it seems only right that their side of the story should be told as widely as possible so people can make as informed an opinion of having both sides of the story. And whether you're pro-Israel or pro-Palestine or frankly are just pro-peace and want an end to all of this atrocity, you can't argue with the need to hear from all concerned, surely, can you? Right, so there is a Hamas statement on what happened on October 7th, and having heard from large swathes of the media what Israel has said about the events of that night versus what has been discovered following some investigation, Perhaps the Hamas version of events is well overdue being heard. What a pity none of our media have ever seemed interested. Fortunately, those with an interest in getting this point of view heard have worked to achieve this. A briefing provided by Hamas has been passed along to the UK by the Palestinian academic Professor Mazin Kumsier, who teaches at Bethlehem University in the West Bank and also runs the Palestinian Museum of Natural History. Now, having passed this briefing on to a Palestinian rights activist in the UK, Flavio Santafani, they have in turn passed it on to Sportbox, who have reproduced the briefing in full in what is a UK exclusive, sad to say, when surely journalism is about exposing the truth and that requires viewpoints from both sides of these atrocities in order to ascertain. No other media are bothered with this. No other media have picked this up. It is impossible for large big budget mainstream news sources to not be aware of this briefing being in existence. So what gives, guys? If you aren't covering something as important as a key piece to this story, like the version of events of one of the actual parties involved, then what are you doing? Shaping a narrative, telling us what to think instead, clearly. It's the only conclusions you can reach. We've learned a lot in the three months since October 7th. See if this 10-point response from Hamas and any of the contents thereof ring any bells with you and Use it to formulate your own opinion. This is what it says. In light of the Israeli fabricated accusations and allegations over Operation Al-Aqsa flood on October 7th and its repercussions, we in the Islamic resistance movement, Hamas, clarify the following. One, Operation Al-Aqsa flood on October 7th targeted the Israeli military sites and sought to arrest the enemy soldiers to pressure on the Israeli authorities to release the thousands of Palestinians held in Israeli jails through a prisoner exchange deal. Therefore, the operation focused on destroying the Israeli army's Gaza division, the Israeli military sites stationed around the Israeli settlements around Gaza. Two, avoiding harm to civilians, especially children, women, and elderly people is a religious and moral commitment by all the Al-Qassam Brigade's fighters. We reiterate that the Palestinian resistance was fully disciplined and committed to the Islamic values during the operation and that the Palestinian fighters only targeted the occupation soldiers and those who carried weapons against our people. In the meantime, the Palestinian fighters were keen to avoid harming civilians, despite the fact that the resistance does not possess precise weapons. 
In addition, if there was any case of targeting civilians, it happened accidentally and in the course of the confrontation with the occupation forces. Since its establishment in 1987, the Hamas movement committed itself to avoiding harm to civilians. After Zionist criminal Baruch Goldstein in 1994 committed a massacre against Palestinian worshippers in the al Ibrahimi mosque in occupied Hebron city, the Hamas movement announced an initiative to avoid civilians the brunt of fighting by all parties, but the Israeli occupation rejected it and even did not give any comment on it. The Hamas movement also repeated such calls several times, but received by a deaf ear from the Israeli occupation, which continued its deliberate targeting and killing of Palestinian civilians. Three, maybe some faults happened during Operation Al-Aqsa Flood's implementation due to the rapid collapse of the Israeli security and military system and the chaos caused along the border areas with Gaza. As attested by many, the Hamas movement dealt in a positive and kind manner with all civilians who have been held in Gaza and sought from the earliest days of the aggression to release them. And that's what happened during the week-long humanitarian truce where these civilians were released in exchange of releasing Palestinian women and children from Israeli jails. Four, what the Israeli occupation promoted of allegations that the al qassam brigades on October 7th were targeting Israeli civilians are nothing but complete lies and fabrications. The source of these allegations is the Israeli official narrative and no independent source proved any of them. It is a well-known fact that the Israeli official narrative had always sought to demonize the Palestinian resistance while also legalizing its brutal aggression on Gaza. Here are some details that go against the Israeli allegations. Video clips taken on that day, October 7th, along with the testimonies by Israelis themselves that were released later, showed that the al qassam Brigade's fighters didn't target civilians and many Israelis were killed by the Israeli army and police due to their confusion. It has also been firmly refuted the lie of the 40 beheaded babies by the Palestinian fighters and even Israeli sources denied this lie. Many of the Western media agencies unfortunately adopted this allegation and promoted it. The suggestion that the Palestinian fighters committed rape against Israeli women was fully denied, including by the Hamas movement. A report by the Mondo Weiss news website on December 1st, 2023, amongst others, said there is a lack of any evidence of mass rape allegedly perpetrated by Hamas members on October 7th, and that Israel used such allegation to fuel the genocide in Gaza. According to two reports by the Israeli Yedioth Aronoff newspaper on October 10th and the Haaretz newspaper on November 18th, many Israeli civilians were killed by an Israeli military helicopter, especially those who were in the Nova Music Festival near Gaza, where 364 Israeli civilians were killed. The two reports said the Hamas fighters reached the area of the festival without any prior knowledge of the festival, where the Israeli helicopter opened fire on both the Hamas fighters and the participants in the festival. The Yedioth Aronoff also said the Israeli army, to prevent further infiltrations from Gaza and to prevent any Israelis being arrested by the Palestinian fighters, struck over 300 targets in areas surrounding the Gaza Strip. Other Israeli testimonies confirmed that the Israeli army raids and soldiers' operations killed many Israeli captives and their captors. The Israeli occupation army bombed the houses in the Israeli settlements where Palestinian fighters and Israelis were inside in a clear application of the Israeli army notorious Hannibal Directive, which clearly says that better a dead civilian hostage or soldier than taken alive to avoid engaging in a prisoner swap with the Palestinian resistance. Furthermore, the occupation authorities revised the number of their killed soldiers and civilians from 1,400 to 1,200 after finding that 200 burnt corpses had belonged to the Palestinian fighters who were killed and mixed with Israeli corpses. This means that the ones who killed the fighters is the one who killed the Israelis, knowing that only the Ar Israeli army possesses military planes that killed, burned and destroyed Israeli areas on October 7th. The Israeli heavy aerial raids across Gaza that led to the death of nearly 60 Israeli captives also prove that the Israeli occupation does not care about the life of their captives in Gaza. Five, it is also a matter of fact that a number of Israeli settlers in settlements around Gaza were armed and clashes with Palestinian fighters on October 7th. Those settlers were registered as civilians while the fact is they were armed men fighting alongside the Israeli army. Six, when speaking about Israeli civilians, it must be known that conscription applies to all Israelis above the age of 18. Males who served 32 months of military service and females who served 24 months were all can carry and use arms. This is based on the Israeli security theory of an armed people, which turned the Israeli entity into an army with a country attached. 
Seven, the brutal killing of civilians is a systematic approach of the Israeli entity and one of the means to humiliate the Palestinian people. The mass killing of Palestinians in Gaza is a clear evidence of such approach. Eight, the Al Jazeera news channel said in a documentary that in one month of the Israeli aggression on Gaza, the daily average killing of Palestinian children in Gaza was 136, while the average of children killed, killing in Ukraine in the course of the Russian-Ukrainian war was one child every day. Nine, those who defend the Israeli aggression do not look at the events in an objective manner, but rather go to justify the Israeli mass killing of Palestinians by saying there would be casualties amongst civilians when attacking the Hamas fighters. However, they would not use such an assumption when it comes to the Al-Aqsa flood event of October 7th. And 10. We are confident that any fair and independent inquiries will prove the truth of our narrative and will prove the scale of lies and misleading information in the Israeli side. This also includes the Israeli allegations regarding the hospitals in Gaza that the Palestinian resistance used them as command centres, an allegation that was not proven and was refuted by reports of many Western press agencies. So their plan was called Operation Al-Aqsa Flood and it was a deliberate targeting of Israeli military sites. There are military garrisons in all of the kibbutzes surrounding Gaza. And indeed, we know some of the hostages taken were soldiers, such as two of the three who were killed allegedly by poison gas attacks by Israel. Other hostages certainly were not hostages, though. Hostages were sought to exchange for those Israel is keeping in prison. They fact are not covered nearly enough by our mainstream media. But Israel hold captive in their jails many more Palestinian hostages than Hamas holds Israeli ones. The Hannibal directives are there to prevent these deals, Israel preferring to kill their own people than release Palestinians they are holding themselves. And after Netanyahu kiboshed a cabinet agreed negotiation for hostages with Hamas from just last week, it again reinforces the ongoing belief that Netanyahu does not value Israeli lives. Israeli prisoners released have attested to being well looked after as stated here as well, which cannot be said of Palestinian hostages released by Israel who have made many claims of being abused while in captivity. Hamas, also unlike Israel, have held their hands up to having potentially made mistakes here. They don't directly admit them, but they do say that they're possible. Of course, independent investigation is required and they welcome that. So this is not the response of a group seeking to absolve itself entirely of any fault here. We know there were Israeli helicopter attacks on people fleeing the Nova Music Festival. We've seen footage of that on social media. They mention the Israeli news outlets also corroborating that. And they talk about the ongoing examples that demonstrate an apparent indifference to the lives of Israeli hostages. The death toll of civilians in Gaza also speaks to an attitude of life being cheap as long as they take a few Hamas operatives out as well. I could pick out more from this, but I'd rather you think about that and perhaps reread it or re-listen to it. You've seen the news stories covered. I've covered a lot of them, but there's scores that I haven't that are reflected in this statement too. But the thing that stood out most for me was that this was just a far more honest appraisal of what went down and what has happened since than anything Israel has actually issued. Any of their so-called evidence has proven so often haven't been completely debunked as a pack of lies. Now, I am not sitting here extolling the virtues of one side over the other. I am going to great lengths to try and avoid doing that because innocent lives have been lost on both sides here. Who is to blame for what has to be investigated. A ceasefire is what we need to see. But the fact there is almost certainly guilt to one extent or another on both sides does not preclude the fact Gaza is occupied territory or that those attacking it are the ones holding it under occupation and are now committing a genocide there. Those being genocided have every right to oppose that occupation. There is a definite question of scale of atrocity here, though, and that scale must be reflected in the consequences that follow these events when they eventually end, and they must end. Too much innocent life is still being lost. We need a ceasefire. We need leaders prepared to call for one, and we need a two-state solution, whether Israel wants that or not, along with an end to their occupation of Palestine. All Netanyahu has right now is rhetoric, especially as we wait for the verdict due tomorrow from the International Court of Justice. And he's given out some mad speeches of late because, because of it. This one here is possibly his most insane, though. Watch it next and see if you think it's Israel or Hamas who sound the more warped. And I'll hopefully catch you on the next video. Cheers, folks. This article from Kid Clarenberg, who had his Twitter uh, banned for at least three months. I don't know whether it'll end up being permanent or not, but at least three months. But anyway, he talks about the, and he calls it Democrat linked, but I actually think it's considering the fact that pro-Israel money flows to both Democrats and Republicans. It's really the duopoly linked. It's 
Democrat and Republican linked, but maybe he's talking about specific people are, are Democrats. But he says the Democrat linked PR firm tapped by pro Israel groups to control the Gaza war narrative. And you've probably seen some of this PR to try and justify Israel's ongoing genocide, their special genocide operation. On December 6th, it was announced with much fanfare that the 10 7 project a new centralized communications operation to promote continued U.S. bipartisan support for Israel, push for accurate, complete coverage of the Israel-Hamas war, right? They want to make sure to call it the Israel-Hamas war because they don't want you to believe this is a war on the Gazan people, which is what it is, a war on Palestinians. So really, this is an Israeli-Palestinian genocide. The 10-7 Project, his goal is to achieve a stronger media focus on victims of October 7th. Then he looked into who, who and what is funding the 10-7 project, and it's not exactly clear. Publicly, sorry, publicity material spoke vaguely of an unnamed coterie of philanthropists, right? Isn't it amazing you could fund genocide, pro-genocide propaganda and be called a philanthropist? I'm just helping the world. I'm putting out stuff to justify genocide. I'm paying for it. I'm footing the bill. So I'm a good guy. I'm a philanthropist. It's what I do. He said, but its founders offer some clues. Here are some of the founders. The five founders are the American Jewish Committee, AGC, AJC, the Jewish Federations of North America, JFNA, the Anti-Defamation Defamation League, ADL, the American Israel Public Affairs Committee, APAC, and the Conference of Presidents of Major American Jewish Organizations, this is quite the rogues gallery of Zionist entities, several of which have deplorable track records of actively whitewashing, if not outright facilitating, Israeli apartheid propaganda activities that have become turbocharged since 10-7. The organization is just the latest salvo in the Zionist state's long-running information war against Palestinians and the Western world. The 10-7 Project's public footprint represents but the visible tip of something far larger and considerably more destructive. He talks about the ADL, and I found this really fascinating, debunking some of the, oh, man, anti-Semitic uh, acts are on, uh, really on the rise, and, oh, it's such a plague on humanity, all these anti-Semitic acts. Now, here's the thing. is First of all, even if these numbers were true, the anti-Semitic acts – would be on the rise because Israel's committing genocide. Uh, and Israel has worked very hard to make you conflate Israel and Judaism as if they're one and the same, which they are not. I'm an anti-Zionist Jew. There are millions of us. If I have to keep repeating that, I, I, I will. They have worked very hard to make you think that Israel is Judaism. And therefore, there are people around the world that now hate Jews because they hate what Israel's doing. Uh, so Israel is doing that. So that, thank you, Israel, for, for doing that. But uh, the ADL has since October 7th published a steady stream of reports lapped up by the media, largely without question, testifying to an explosion of anti-Semitic incidents across the Western world in the wake of Operation Al-Aqsa Flood, in the wake of 10-7. The ADL recorded 2,000 anti-Semitic incidents, including 905 anti-Israel rallies. They're saying there's been thousands of anti-Semitic incidents across, and I can't tell if this is just across America or around the world, but I think it's around the world. 2,000 anti-Semitic, oh my God, oh, it's everywhere. Oh, geez, wow, this is terrible. And then, as Kit Klarenberg puts here, shocking stuff, one might think. Yet, as an investigation by Mint Press, Alan McLeod revealed the ADL is producing such staggering figures by categorizing anti-Israel and pro-Palestine pro-Palestine rallies and corresponding chants as both individual anti-Semitic incidents. Basically, if you have a rally that is against genocide right now, that they're calling that anti-Semitic. If you have a rally where you say Palestinians should be allowed to be free, they're calling that an anti-Semitic incident. If you march with five people through your college chanting free Palestine or let Gaza live, they're calling that an anti-Semitic incident. You are not allowed to request, to, to lightly, politely request no genocide. Excuse me, sir. Could we have no genocide, please? Excuse me, sir. Could you go a little lighter on the genocide for me? Thank you. Because they're calling that anti-Semitic actions. So all of these numbers that they're coming up with are bullshit. Like, 
I don't know what the real numbers are, but I can tell you the ones they're providing are garbage. And yet our mainstream media, I didn't look up how many articles have referenced their stats, but many have, especially across the United States, just takes those numbers at face value and says, oh my God, look at all the anti-Semitic incidents. And then you actually look at the numbers and you go, oh, 95% of them are like a rally at a college saying no more genocide, saying don't bomb Gaza, saying don't bomb children. I mean, it really is a backwards, backwards world where you can't protest to end a genocide or else you're uh, the, the, the anti-Semitic, you're racist, you're a bigot, you're like, what? Why would endorsing genocide make me a better person? So backwards, but of course that's the goal, right? That's the, that's the hidden agenda is they want you to believe the opposite of what is moral, what is just, what is real. Despite the exposure of its embarrassing Enron style accounting, the league continues to pump out the same bogus quote unquote research at regular intervals. On December 12th, it claimed anti-Semitism in the US was now up 337%, which is a lot. And I should know because it's my name upside down. And I know my name upside down. 337% in the wake of October 7th. And it's at an all time record. Oh my God. But in fact, again, they're calling any rally to end genocide as being anti-Jew. And of course that is nonsense. It is stupid. He then talks about APAC. He says it's 2022 installments. So this is APAC boasting. This is not someone accusing APAC of something. This is what this is them bragging. In 2022, they said, or for 2022, they said, among other things, that they bagged $3.3 billion for security assistance to Israel with no added conditions. Security assistance means bombs. And having gifted $17.5 million, the most of any U.S. PAC political action committee to pro-Israel candidates, 98% of whom won their elections in the process de defeating 13 anti-Israel challengers. Now, anti-Israel challengers could mean that these people say that Israel is an apartheid state, which is just factually, it's just a dictionary definition. Uh, Anti-Israel could mean that these people are not willing to say that Israel deserves uh, every, every last square foot of uh, the entire region. Um, anyway, they call a lot of things anti-Israel. You know, you showed up at a free Palestine rally. You said there shouldn't be a genocide. Those are all anti-Israel, according to them. So there's AIPAC bragging that when they want to defeat a anti-Israel candidate, they succeed. 98% of the time, they succeed. Hyperbolized Hasbara is part of the problem that's going on out there um from the second clip in that block tony that was the hamas statement on 10 7 what are those elements caught you uh as surprising <laughs> first the subtle jab against the idea of forces when they mentioned uh we didn't expect a near total collapse all at once and you know that's that's an interesting statement to make because i'm not so sure maybe i don't know that's speculation i don't have any evidence to support that but it is curious how there is a uh a a, a, a multi-level failure from land sea air all at once with precognizance you know operation operation jericho walls wall. jericho, yeah. yeah jericho wall right and so it's just curious like the the fact that they were they you know, were so easily dismantled so quickly and with such great haste. Is that because of the skill and sophistication of the Hamas fighters and the operation? Mm. It's very 9-11 like as far yeah, as Yeah, like man. And I call that we both failures called and it. who's getting we, fired for it. We both call that very early on. Like this seems very very much like 9-11, very much like a false flag event that we have studied and presented on the show the evidence for such going back well over now. A hundred I mean, years. It's a prescribed I mean, the, event. The lucid, right. They they have an event that they need. So in in the case of nine eleven, they wrote a foreign affairs. <clears throat> Remember how we looked at foreign affairs? We didn't get to look at this issue yet, but we we teased it. The Israel and the crosshairs. Foreign affairs, nineteen ninety eight, November, is over there on the shelf. And in there, 
Uh, it talks about catastrophic terrorism, talk about a new Pearl Harbor, 9-11. It's written by Likud neocons here in the United States. It also has an article by Bernard Lewis, who's a Zionist, who says Osama bin Laden, public enemy number one, licensed to kill. And those two things become the working paper of PNAC's Project for a New American Century uh, document, re re Rebuilding America's Defenses. And in there, they call, again, they need a new Pearl Harbor event. to, ha And it just happens that the Arab terrorists with the box cutters drop the Christmas list in their lap, just like uh, Lord Rothschild got it from Balfour. You know, it it might have started with Lord Rothschild in these cases, in this metaphor. Like, you know, a... going back, it might have started with the people who did the thing that blamed on the guys with the box cutters. Is a reasonable theory to put forth, even if some a lot of it's based on circumstantial evidence, but reasonable enough based on certainly Whitney Webb's research and, and so many others. You know, she mentioned in the interview that you did with her that she'd have to write a whole other book just on the connection between Israel, Mossad, particularly, and 9 11. Now, isn't that curious? Now, what, what came out of 9 11? What manifests out of 9 11? Not just the Patriot Act and the loss War of on terror. rights. War on terror, but the war on terror, what was the boogeyman of that? Uh, Al Qaeda. I mean, Ooh, Osama Arab, bin Laden, Arab Israel's Jihad, enemies, like Arab Death Jihad, Allah, but, it, but it was really, letters. it was really building up this straw man of Arab terrorism, right? Yes. And who would that benefit the most? Think about it. who would that benefit truly the most, especially if you look at the plans going back to the original foundation, the Zionist plan, you know, from the river to the sea, huh? Now they're starting. I'm just, curious. it also it's benefits their partner who has been grooming. I'm going to talk about uh, the UK, British the British Empire, they had been grooming proxy Arab armies to use as such Correct. things. And that's where Sinjin All Philby, set. Kim Philby, and Victor Rothschild come back into the picture because there's a 20-year arc between Sinjin Philby, the father of Kim Philby going native with the Arabs, becoming a Muslim, taking a Muslim wife, living an Arab lifestyle, getting friends with Ibn Saud, getting that, cunt, the, that tribe to rise up and become a country named after yep. Ibn Saud, Saudi Arabia, um, and the Wahhabism which was Muslim an extreme form of right. fascist Arabism, you know, that was prevalent at that time. There's a whole interesting history there that is not talked about in the official narratives and is very much substantial, relevant, and meaningful. That's another point, right? Topics. Arab Arab nationalism, Arab just like we talk about the Azov Battalion in the Ukraine. Um, it's Arab, this sort of like neo-nationalist Arab movements with Wahhabism, the Muslim Brotherhood. Those are also manifestations of British and Anglo, you can call it Anglo-American statecraft that goes back to hallmarks of the early, what the Lord Palmerston Zoo back in like yeah. the 19th century with the young movements 1840s. I mentioned earlier. Yeah. That is much more efficient in regards to, you know, create like a neo-nationalist or hyper-ethnic or hyper-religious, radicalized religious sect and use that as a way to perpetuate your needs or create destabilization in those regions. So it all goes back to interventionism, colonial interventionism, and interventionism with Anglo-American, um, you know, uh, interests. And that's very, it's tragic, but there's a consistent pattern here and it should be noted. And uh, that pattern it's consistent. We're back to the 19th century. I just mentioned Palmerston Zoo. Wow, isn't that so consistent with what we're seeing now? We're in the 21st century now. Wow, they seem like they're doing something similar. Now, is it a perfect one-to-one -one connection? No. It, it rhymes. History it may perfectly. not repeat, but it sure does rhyme. But there's a lot of interesting so it's elements here you know, that would make a reasonable deduction, which would form a, a valid theory. You know, in the absence of other evidence, you know, it's reasonable to consider this as being potentially connected to a lot of other aspirations. Um, you know, not just the neocons in America, but aspirations within the rich power, the power elite within uh, American finance. A lot of them connected to Epstein, by the way. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Mossad and the IDF and the instantiation, the continuation of the deployment of their ever burgeoning nation state. Yeah. Yeah. And as we talked about earlier, you remember I pointed out Cutter. This is where uh, the leadership of the Ham the Hamas is way on the over east here, side across Saudi Arabia, here, east side and west east side, side of the Gaza Strip, and this is where they're doing a gen uh, uh, genocide, ethnic cleansing, apartheid uh, area type over here, right? So they're bombing all these people over here, two million people displaced. They tearing down their That's homes, they're just bulldozing, yeah. bulldozing everything because of these people over here, the leadership in Qatar. And they're billionaire rock star type people. And this is New York Post. This isn't some like, you know, uh, conspiracy type place. Hamas leaders, $11 billion, revel in luxury. They're not being touched by Israel. But you know who is being touched by Israel? Sorry to have to do this. Please don't eat us 
when you die. Hopefully you will die before us. If you were, if we were to die, uh, you hopefully you die first. But if you, if we die first, uh, go eat other people, right? This is a little girl in occupied Palestine, 18 February, 2024. Her concern is if her family and she dies that the cat without food doesn't eat her and she understands like hey uh hopefully we all die together but if not uh go eat other people please and this this was memorable because i saw this when it came out and i had to go look it up yesterday because i wanted to explain such things to you that no child on this planet should have to have these types of concerns and now that you know enough, just from watching this one episode, if not every episode since 10-7, now you know enough to know that maybe we should just uh, pause being all genocidal and ethnic cleansing and, and being one-sided and unilateral support and no questions asked because the situation's not right. It's not what you've been told. People who support it, look, if they have to lie to you to get you to support their side, What's going on here? Have we noticed a continual hyperbolization, if not straight up creation out of whole cloth of fictions that have been used to promote and, and misrepresent the events such that everybody who's a good person, well-meaning person, well-intentioned person ends up backing the wrong side of genocide and ethnic cleansing? This is something that we have the power to observe and to let each other know this is going on and to build up the intellectual self-defense and the immunity mentally. This is like a vaccination of information. You're not going to unsee and unknow the things that you're learning. You're going to, you know, it's it's not like, you, you know, tomorrow we're going to find out, oh, it wasn't really Lord Rothschild who the Balfour, no, the Balfour Declaration is a piece of history. It's It's been there for over 100 years. It is what it is. They did what they did and they continue to do what they continue to do in the name of religious Jews who want nothing to do with it as we've also shown in tonight's clips so it's what should is also it? be yeah go ahead it Tim. should also be mentioned real quick uh, uh in regards to Lee Camp which he did a phenomenal job there but he was first of all mid press news is although they can they've done they have good investigative journalism they also are very heavily biased towards sort of a progressive left narrative even though sure. you know sometimes they have some so you did that's why they had the democrat there i was like he's right it's a duopoly <laughs> it's it's a, it's both parties are deep captured by the apac you know adl the various lobbying groups of that make up the israel lobby so that's that um uh, it, they remind me a lot of the intercept in that regard you know sort of a leftist investigative journalist sometimes bridging on alternative narratives so i appreciate them but you have to take them with a grain of salt so um mm -hmm. that being said the anti-semitic thing over th up 300 uh, up over 300 percent i'll never forget when october 7th first happened we played a bunch of those um insane like tiktok and youtube advertisements do you remember those rich yeah and i remember seeing on the television just like when my the you know when i was um uh, uh, you know, uh, with family members and whatnot, a plethora of propaganda immediately following. I mean, within days, you know, following the the October seventh events, all this like Jewish hate, you know, swastika on the door, you know, have to paint it over from the good neighbor, you know, recognize that you Jews are so oppressed and so victimized today in today's world. And so it was interesting. It's like immediately after this event, they go right to the Hasbro, like. 10,000 fold um you know, Very right to the, the emotional appeal yeah right so it's just that's an interesting element that um he pointed out that has been a continuation of a belief that there's been a rise in anti-semitism which is really just a, for the most part for the most part i would argue most likely a critique of zionist policy rather than actual sort of hatred to, to jews is because they're jews um yeah that's ignorance that's ignorance, ignorance correct and then a sub-function of ignorance is racism Right. And that's where people do things that are ignorant because uh, they're not educated. They do evil and action based about on ignorance. Right. right. And when people say somebody is a Jewish Zionist, both those labels are kind of necessary to disambiguate because not all Zionists are Jews and not all Jews are Zionists. Which we showed tonight. Look at the ultra-Orthodox. Look how they're treated. Right. So uh, being able to understand the situation, like the, earlier when I was playing... Uh, uh, the comedian at the Palestinian rally, Matt, mm -hmm. like uh, it, the title of it is, it's like Jewish comedian at the pro-Palestine rally, right? 
And there, there is a, a, a talk worth listening to between Katie Halper and Rabbi Shapiro where they debate Zionism hmm. because he had an interesting perspective and she was trying to understand what he was saying. And it was, we don't have time to put that in tonight's time capsule, but that's sure. also worthy of consideration because Maybe I'll play some he said the town hall or something. Yeah. yeah. He was like, why do we have Jews against Zionism? You know, why don't we have former Zionists? He's like, cause if, when you have Jews against Zionism, uh, you're, you're making it, you're kind of equating like, you know, Jews with Zionism. And so he had an interesting take on it. And I try to consider all sides and, and understand and learn and grow along with uh, the ability of the information to, to feed me. So, so that's kind of how that unfolds. We don't have time for that. In this, and tonight, even though it was on the show card, honorable mention, Katie Halper and Rabbi Shapiro. Now, this next clip, next two clips. Fallacy of composition, no, maybe he might be committing there. Sorry. Just yeah. Get these out once well, you know, I, I, check I, that out. Look, I'm not I saying mean, he's wrong, but if, if, it's okay be... to argue, but don't kill people in the name of like something that didn't happen and make up a bunch of stuff. And cause you're just right. being like the people that you try to get away from seven. I don't care ago. if they call it Zionism or whatever. I mean, that's what they call it themselves, which is just institutionalized sure racism. So yeah. that's what we're seeing manifest. And yeah. that's, I don't care. You can call it something else if you want so to explain to me the behavior of these neo-nationalists that, you know, are arguing, you know, uh, yeah, based on like biblical situations of Amalek and the right. Three thousand to... years, Jacob right. Rothschild said they've been working on that. So ever since the Amalekites biblical and the Canaanites to... and the Hittites and the other people of the area who held the area for three thousand years before we could get it back. That's not such a success story I'd be bragging about. All right. Speaking of stories we're not gonna be bragging about, uh, or that they shouldn't be bragging about, at least. I saw the following clip. As soon as we were done with last week's show. So you got to imagine, we just did a seven hour show. It's like five in the morning. I got to get to sleep, but I happen to see live the ICJ, this guy in this red robe over his suit, giving this speech. So I said, okay, I'm going to click that. And then 27 minutes later, I was like, that's a really kick-ass representation. And it's not from South Africa. It's from the Arab league. So uh, this guy, you're going to see Ralph Wild. I'm showing it from the page that I first saw it on because it was pasted all over the place all week. But I got to see this in the wee hours of Monday morning as it was happening. And I'm not going to play the whole speech because it's like a half hour. But we're going to get like the most meaningful part of the speech so you get a gist of what the actual courts are being told and what's going on there. Because if you listen to Bibi Netanyahu and uh you know uh elon levy and the other has bara meisties meisters over there you're gonna have a very unrealistic caricature-ish funhouse mirror picture of reality and you don't want to go through life like that you deserve better for yourself so we're going to take a few minutes of time and attention to pay attention to the words that this man has thoughtfully composed for your consideration so you can better understand the situation i found it to be immensely valuable and i'm already like pretty well schooled in this topic so hopefully you also feel that it's worthy of your uh your time and it is an edifying experience for you and then after that we'll just have a, a wee tiny short like two minute clip of uh, a, uh from middle east eye and it's titled are israeli right-wing politicians enabling the hate speech and dehumanization of palestinians the answer might be yes. All right, let's go first to the ICJ. This is Ralph Wild, a legal masterpiece from Ralph Wild on behalf of the Arab League against Israel in the genocide hearings at the ICJ. Let's get to it. I now respectfully request, Mr. President, that you call on Dr. Ralph Wild, senior counsel and advocate, to address the legal questions before the court. Thank you. I thank Mr. Rifai. I now give the floor to Mr. Ralph Wild. You have the floor, sir. Mr. President, distinguished members of the court, it's a great honor and privilege to appear before you and to represent the League of Arab States. The Palestinian people have been denied the exercise of their legal right to self-determination through the more than century-long violent, colonial, racist effort to establish a nation state exclusively for the Jewish people in the land of mandatory Palestine.
When this began after the First World War, the Jewish population of that land was 11%. Forcibly implementing Zionism in this demographic context has necessarily involved the extermination or forced displacement of some of the non-Jewish Palestinian population, the exercise of domination over and subjugation, dispossession and immiseration of remaining non-Jewish Palestinians, the emigration to that land of Jewish people, regardless of any direct personal link, and the denial of Palestinian refugees the right to return, all operating through a racist distinction privileging Jewish people over non-Jewish Palestinian people. This has necessitated serious violations of all the fundamental Jos Kogan's and Erga Omne's norms of international law. The right of self-determination, the prohibitions on aggression, genocide, crimes against humanity, racial discrimination, apartheid and torture, and the core protections of IHL. Today, I will address, first, violations of international law arising out of the regime of racial domination, apartheid, perpetrated against the Palestinian people across the entire land of historic Palestine. And then, second, the existential illegality of Israel's occupation of the Palestinian Gaza Strip and West Bank, including East Jerusalem, since 1967. As a necessary prerequisite, I must begin with the special right granted to the Palestinian people in the League Covenant. The legal right of self-determination of the Palestinian people originates in the sacred trust obligations of Article 22 of the League Covenant, part of the Versailles Treaty. Palestine, an A-class mandate under British colonial rule, was, after the First World War, supposed to have its existence as an independent state provisionally recognized, a sui generis right of self-determination. The UK and other members of the League Council attempted to bypass this, incorporating the 1917 Balfour Declaration commitment to establishing a national home for the Jewish people in Palestine into the instrument stipulating how the mandate would operate. However, the Council had no legal power to bypass the Covenant in this way. It acted ultra virus and the relevant provisions were legally void. There was and is no legal basis in that mandate instrument for either a specifically Jewish state in Palestine or the UK's failure to discharge the sacred trust obligation to implement Palestinian self-determination. After the Second World War, a self-determination right applicable to colonial peoples generally crystallized in international law. For the Palestinian people, this essentially corresponded to and supplemented the pre-existing covenant right regarding the same single territory. The 1947 proposal to partition Palestine was contrary to this, the Arab rejection and affirmation of the legal status quo. In 1948 then, Palestine was legally a single territory with a single population enjoying a right of self-determination on a unitary basis. Despite this, a state of Israel specifically for Jewish people was proclaimed in 1948 by those controlling 78%, more than three quarters of Palestine, accompanied by the forced displacement of a significant number of the non-Jewish Palestinian population, the Nakba catastrophe. This illegal secession was an egregious violation of Palestinian self-determination. Israel's statehood was recognized and Israel admitted as a UN member despite this illegality. 
Israel is not the legal continuation or successor of the mandate. This violation of Palestinian self-determination is ongoing and unresolved. Two key elements are, first, Palestinian people not displaced from the land proclaimed to be of Israel in 48 and their descendants have been forced to live as citizens, presently they constitute 17.2%, of a state conceived to be of and for another racial group, under the domination of that group, necessarily treated as second class because of their race. Second, Palestinian people displaced from that land and their descendants cannot return. These are serious breaches of the right of self-determination, the prohibitions of racial discrimination and apartheid, and the right of return. They must end immediately. As if this ongoing Nakba was not catastrophic enough, in 1967, Israel captured the remaining 22% of historic Palestine, the Gaza Strip and West Bank, including East Jerusalem, the Naksa. It's maintained that use of force to remain in control for the 57 year period since. For more than half a century then, a state defined to be of and for Jewish people exclusively has governed the entire land of historic Palestine and the Palestinian people there. And the regime of racial domination, apartheid, and denying return has been extended throughout. In the case of Palestinians living in the occupied territory, this has involved the same serious violations of international law supplemented by serious violations of norms applicable in occupied territory. Indeed, these people are subject to an even more extreme form of racist domination, as they aren't even citizens of the state exercising authority over them. Even in East Jerusalem, which Israel has purported to annex, the majority non-Jewish Palestinian residents don't have citizenship, whereas Jewish residents, including illegal settlers, are citizens. Just as in territorial Israel, in occupied territory, these serious violations concerning how Israel exercises authority over the Palestinian people must end immediately. However, here, a more fundamental matter must also be addressed. The illegality of the exercise of authority itself. The enduring Palestinian right of self-determination means that the Palestinian people and the state of Palestine, not Israel, are sovereign over the territory Israel captured in 67. For Israel, the land is extraterritorial, and given what I said about the mandate, territory over which it has no legal sovereign entitlement. Despite this, Israel has purported to annex East Jerusalem and taken various actions there and in the rest of the West Bank, constituting de jure and de facto purported annexation, including implanting settlements. It is Israeli policy that Israel should be not only the exclusive authority over the entire land between the river and the sea, but also the exclusive sovereign authority there. This constitutes a complete repudiation of Palestinian self-determination as a legal right since it empties the right entirely of any territorial content. Actualizing this through de facto and de jure purported annexation is, first, a serious violation of Palestinian self-determination, and second, because it's a, uh, enabled through the use of force, 
a violation of the prohibition on the purported acquisition of territory through the use of force in the law on the use of force, and so an aggression. Serious violations of further areas of law re regulating the conduct of the occupation are also being perpetrated, notably the prohibitions on implanting settlements and altering, unless absolutely prevented, the legal, political, social and religious status quo. The occupation is therefore existentially illegal because of its use to actualize purported annexation. To end this serious illegality, it must be terminated. Israel must renounce all sovereignty claims and all settlements must be removed immediately. However, this is not the only basis on which the occupation's existential legality must be addressed. We need to delve deeper into both the law of self-determination and the law on the use of force. Beginning with self-determination, this right, when applied to the Palestinian people in the territory Israel captured in 67, is a right to be entirely self-governing, free from Israeli domination. Consequently, the Palestinian people have a legal right to the immediate end of the occupation. And Israel has a correlative legal duty to immediately terminate the occupation. This right exists and operates simply and exclusively because the Palestinian people are entitled to it. It does not depend on others agreeing to its realization. It is a right. It's a repudiation of trusteeship whereby colonial peoples were ostensibly to be granted freedom only if and when they were deemed ready because of their stage of development determined by the racist standard of civilization. The anti-colonial self-determination rule replaced this with a right based on the automatic immediate entitlement of all people to freedom without preconditions. In the words of General Assembly 1514, inadequacy of preparedness should never serve as a pretext for delaying independence. Some suggest that the Palestinian people were offered and rejected deals that could have ended the occupation. And therefore, Israel can maintain it pending a settlement. Even assuming, arguendo, the veracity of this account, the deals involved a further loss of the sovereign territory of the Palestinian people. Israel cannot lawfully demand concessions on Palestinian rights as the price for ending its impediment to Palestinian freedom. This would mean Israel using force to coerce the Palestinian people to give up some of their peremptory legal rights illegal in the law on the use of force and necessarily voiding the relevant terms of any agreement reached. The Palestinian people are legally entitled to reject a further loss of land over which they have an exclusive legal peremptory right. Any such rejection makes no difference to Israel's immediate legal obligation to end the occupation. Turning to the law on the use of force, Israel's control over the Palestinian territory since 67 as a military occupation is an ongoing use of force. As such, its existential legality is determined by the law on the use of force as a general matter beyond the specific issue of annexation. Israel captured the Gaza Strip and West Bank from Egypt and Jordan in the war it launched against them and Syria. It claimed to be acting in self-defense, anticipating a non-immediately imminent attack. The war was over after six days. 
peace treaties between Israel and Egypt and Jordan were subsequently adopted. Despite this, Israel maintained control of the territory, continuing the use of force enabling its capture. Israel's 67 war was illegal in the Yossad Bellum, even assuming, arguendo, its claim of a feared attack. States can't lawfully use force in non-immediately imminent anticipatory self-defense. Alternatively, assuming, again arguendo, that the war was lawful, the justification ended after six days. However, the Yos Ad Bellum requirements continued to apply to the occupation as itself a continuing use of force. In 1967, with self-determination well established in international law, states could not lawfully use force to retain control over a self-determination unit captured in war unless the legal test justifying the initial use of force also justified on the same basis the use of force in retaining control. Moreover, this justification would need to continue not only in the immediate aftermath, but for more than half a century. Manifestly, this legal test has not been met. Israel's exercise of control over the Gaza Strip and West Bank through the use of force has been illegal in the Yos Ad Bellum since the capture of the territory, or at least very soon after, afterwards. The occupation is therefore, again, existentially illegal in the law on the use of force and aggression, this time as a general matter, beyond illegality specific to annexation. To terminate this serious violation, the occupation must likewise end immediately. What of Israel's current military action in Gaza? This is not a war that began in October 2023. It's a drastic scaling up of the force exercised there and in the West Bank on a continual basis since 67. A justification for a new phase in an ongoing illegal use of force cannot be constructed solely out of the consequences of violent resistance to that illegal use of force. Otherwise, an illegal use of force would be rendered lawful because those subject to it violently resisted. Circular logic with a perverse outcome. More generally, Israel cannot lawfully use force to control the Palestinian territory for security purposes pending an agreement providing security guarantees. States can only lawfully use force outside their borders in extremely narrow circumstances. Beyond that, they must address, they must address security concerns non-forcibly. Does it even raise an eyebrow anymore that this image was shared in a Telegram group? If you have been following this series, you have seen some dark content. And this time, we are specifically focusing on these guys. And asking to what extent their words have led down this dark tunnel of dehumanizing Palestinians. The caption on this edited image reads, The Three Monkeys. And the top comment is, I always asked how many more baboons slash monkeys we had left to kill. In this photo, a dog is eating what appears to be human remains. And here are some reactions to that image. Even a clip was edited with the caption, a sad and touching clip. Donkey, donkey dies, daddy cries, inky pinky ponky, inky pinky ponky, daddy bought the donkey, donkey dies, daddy cries, inky pinky ponky. 
and it's not just animal memes. אז אין סימטריה, והילדים בעזה, הילדים בעזה הביאו על עצמם את זה. Pretty strange, isn't it? That amidst all of this, many seem to be most offended by calling for a ceasefire or freedom for Palestinians. Well, freedom for Palestinians can't happen as long as they keep getting dehumanized by that really successful Hasbara with catchy tunes. Super imposition of pigs and swine. That's uh boy. Yeah. Pinky pinky donkey. Yeah, that's uh not Pretty one of the best hits. It's very uh uh well, they don't seem to res they don't have sort of any propriety with the way in which they conduct genocide, so why should I be surprised? Let's put it that way. They take their genocide entertainment seriously, Tony. And you shouldn't criticize it. <laughs> hey, uh, how about the IC, ICJ guy? I mean, Arab League hires a guy with a good British accent. Many such guys have been hired on both sides, you know, in that ICJ. Uh, Israel has a couple good uh, Hasbara people that speak English. So <clears throat> he has a longer argument. But you got the gist. Self-determination, right of self-defense. Not allowed to use force outside your borders. Not allowed to use force in these policing of the 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 occupied territories. All this sort of stuff, uh, putting them on notice. And yeah, I mean the Israelis have argued that the General Assembly for the right in two thousand three or, or nineteen ninety five and two thousand three that the General Assembly doesn't have the vested power to even make that determination. So they, it's just interesting the legalese like the the play they make because it's. They used the right to self-determination based on the General General Assembly vote. It was never ratified by the Security Council, as we all know, with Resolution 181 that created the Israeli Arab conflict or the war, really the Nakba, and in 1948. And, you know, they utilized the General Assembly vote without any ratification or any support or any power vested in the General Assembly for their own argument for right to self-determination. But then they turn around and say the General Assembly has no power to vest that in the Palestinians. It's just... The legalese on both sides just to almost make it impossible to appeal to any legal authority to, to, to somehow find a way to resolve the situation. Well, there's that meme of the UN where it's like the word peaceful on a sign and then the UN helmet and it says unpeaceful with the soldier <laughs> yeah, standing there. That's a perfect right? juxtaposition. So the UN exactly. is just good enough to help keep the genocide going without being good enough to actually stop it. It's like they're like, everyone's like, somebody has to do something. And mm -hmm. so the UN's like, oh, we're going to do something. And by the time we do something, everyone's going to be dead. But we're going to do something. Yeah, exactly. Right. They appeal right. to these international bodies, which are scary enough when we say international bodies. I mean, there's this... There's this language of globalism yeah. inherent globalism. in that that is yeah. that is you know yeah. it's just like the BRICS nation like the, all the BRICS nations are on board with Agenda 2030 including Russia and China by the way mm -hmm. so yeah but they act like we're there's this multipolar world okay and then yeah. and Tucker over there with Putin please okay mm -hmm. <laughs> give me a break but they got nice subways over there but I appreciate look I I'll say this I appreciated his arguments brilliant I'm not I'm not like what I'm saying is I super appreciate his arguments and what he's appealing to starting with in the arguendo or the treaty of versailles that's yeah. powerful going back to the original sort of um uh, outline for that territory and then the fact that 1917 supposedly the balfour declaration supposedly usurped that which it didn't not necessarily but it still guaranteed them their rights in that document right right the self-determination so the fact that they were able to take it take it back to the treaty of versailles um and utilize that as leverage over the Balfour Declaration. Very powerful, really brilliant. So, I mean, kudos to that. I'm just saying, unfortunately, when it comes to legalese, you can't. Not a whole lot probably yep. going to happen, but yeah, look exactly. good on stage. Yeah, it did. yeah. It did. All right. So, uh, we're getting closer to making the points. There's still two, two very major stories from this week that we have to unfold. But first, there has to be like facts in order so you understand what's going on. I think if you've paid attention thus far in the show, you got to admit, a lot of understanding has been built. Like there's been just enough overlap between these topics where you're like, you can make it from one idea to the next idea. It's like, uh, you know, crossing a, a river with uh, the stones, you know, across the you keep your feet dry. That's the idea. Yep. All right. So let's keep our feet dry on this clip. Don't know why I said that, but it seemed like the thing to do at the time. Uh, first clip is brainwashed 
in Israel. This is a person who grew up in Israel. It's a one minute clip. And uh, she explains like how she got outside the Hasbara. Um, a real quick clip of 1948 Nakba survivors narrate how Israel stole Palestine. So we've seen the IDF guys and the Haganah guys brag about the torture, the rape, all the stuff they participated in back then. And they had a good time and they laughed when they told it. This is the, this is the other side of the story. This is the guys that lived in the town when they came to the thing and raped their wives and stuff. So you get to hear a couple survivors from the Nakba, which you're not allowed to talk about because it's hate speech in Israel. And if you want to have a life like the people in Israel have a life over there, then go ahead and have some hate speech crimes come into your country, too, because then it's a slippery slope. And anything they don't want you to talk about, it's just hate speech and, uh, you know, throw the baby out with the bathwater. And that's not a 10-7 joke. All right. Um, the next clip comes from Cyrus Janssen. I was impressed with this because his clip, his title was Hamas is, Hamas has destroyed Israel, but not how you think. And what he's going to show you is that Israel, by employing Gandhi's strategy of in order to end the oppression, you have to make it visible to the outside public. Like Hamas did their thing on 10-7, which was greatly exaggerated, hyperbolized, lied about, right? But they did this thing. It kicked off all this stuff. They just kind of sat back the whole time hiding in their tunnels or hiding in Qatar or whatever. And the world has learned a lot about the Israeli Zionist agenda for that area, the racism, the race-specific apartheid, the genocide, the ethnic cleansing, all this stuff, because of the commentaries on the Talmud from the second to the fifth century, everyone, or fifth to the second century, I should say. People were not looking you know? at this stuff six No one looked ago. at that stuff. Or what's the Torah? What's the Torah versus the Talmud? What's and the, I said, you know, the oral tradition versus the, the, the Masoretic tradition, you know, right. the, the Moses, right? So there's a lot. Of, no one ever looked at that stuff. And Jerusalem Talmud versus Babylonian Talmud. Yeah, that things. too. Right. And yeah, I've yeah. said it oftentimes. And I'll say it again. It's the Streisand effect wrecking into S Stockholm Syndrome. So this first clip is going to tie in the Stockholm Syndrome. And by the time you get to the end of this, you're going to see the Streisand effect. Let's go ahead with this media block. And it uh, it ends with a clip from the ha Bad Hasbro show with the comedian Matt Lieb that we showed earlier. It's got Aaron Mate's, I think, older brother, Daniel, and Zachary Foster, who we featured last week. And they're going to talk about how Palestine, again, it's a hate word, can't use it. It was illegal. And I wasn't aware of this history or that of the watermelon associated with it. Uh, so we're going to learn that. And then we'll be back because then we have these two last stories uh, to break into. I was born and raised in Tel Aviv. I served in my my uh, two years in the, in the military, as everybody else does. And I left Israel in 1991. Um, and I went to Australia. And it wasn't until 10 years after I moved to Australia that I started to realize that I was brought up on a false narrative of our history. I was brought up to believe that we Israeli Jews were always the victims, that we were the good guys, that we never did anything wrong, and that the reason that the Arabs, and the, there was no word for Palestinians back when I was a child, but the reason that the Arabs uh, were giving us a hard time is simply because they're anti-Semitic like everybody else. We were brought up to believe the Jews are never safe unless they live in an exclusively Jewish state only for Jews and only surrounded by Jews. And it took me 10 years in Australia to finally realize that what I thought was true wasn't quite right. And I met Palestinians for the first time as equals in Australia and members of uh, citizens of other Arab countries as well and realized they weren't actually my enemy. We were the bad guys in the story. And it was very hard at first to come to terms with it. In um, 2001, I renounced my Israeli citizenship. But even then, I don't think I quite understood the idea of settler colonialism and that that's, in fact, what we were. And they collected all the men and there. They shot them. They had their machine gun and they killed them, all of them. And they killed everyone. They opened fire for all people. Most of Khanunis men killed in that day. More than 700 people killed in that day. All of the children, they became orphans. My name is Nasri. Nasri Ahmed Hassan Ali Abdu. I was born in Yafa. Muhammad Khalid Abu Mahmoud. 
I was born in Yafa. Naif Muhammad Mahmoud Hajjaj. Born in Alma. Saeed Muhammad Al Isawi. I born in Al Jalazoun camp. My name Atif Karim. I born in Palestine in Hamidiyya. Mahmoud Muhammad Sultan. I born in Jaffa city in November 1944. My name is Adnan Abdel Fattah. I was born in the village of Burqa, Nablus, March 1945. So that makes me about three years, more than three years, older than the state of Israel, which was May 1948. I was born in our Biyara. Biyara means farm. My father and my mom and uh, the rest of the family of my father all living in the, the house together in our Biyara. My dad and mom were living in a small village, but it is about six to seven kilometers far away from the sea. And they were having about 40 kilo or four to six acres in their area. When I was three and a half years old, Ben-Gurion declared about establishing Israel in Palestine. When I was born, there was always a bit of conflict because always we see people being kicked from their homes or leave the homes, they come back to their home and somebody else took the place and they have no right in it. So when I was very little, I remember my father staying home all the time, most of the time, because what happened in 1948, there was a Nakba, people were kicked out of their houses in Palestine, and some were kicked out of their jobs in Palestine. In 1948, the Jewish settlers start bombing Jaffa from everywhere, and the people of Jaffa haven't any weapon to defend themselves. I remember that uh, the Israeli forces, they came to us and they bombarded us by planes and by tanks, by the Israeli forces. The people of Yaffa, they run from place to place under this pressure. They start to push us by force. In the beginning, they use the guns and they use tanks. But when we reach around the port, they start to bump us from plane. They started to escape to the beach of Jaffa, to escape by the sea, to Gaza Strip, and to Lebanon. And there is really Greek ships waiting to help them to escape to Gaza and uh, Lebanon. They separated the two groups, right and left. The people on the right, they later, under the force, they moved in direction of West Bank, and uh, some people of them stay in Qilia. When the Israelis occupied our city, our village, Kufarana, my dad was outside the village. He was with the fighters, with the resistance men of Palestine. My mother, with small children, they left the city, the, the village. When the Israeli go into Deir Yassin and Kufur Qasim and kill all the people and we get scared, they start to drop a Bible. They ask us to leave from here, from the village. And of course, the people get scared and left the village and go and they ask they leave for, for one week. After that week, you come back. And we didn't come back. Anyhow, we were going to Jordan. When we come back from the beach to our home, my father asked me to ask about what happened to our neighbors. And first home, Saadoni family, they, are, they killed the three brothers. And one of them, he held his child and he said to the soldier, to Israeli soldiers, please don't kill me for the sake of this child. He said, you and your child. His child leg cut from the end and he died. And when I go to their home, I saw their bodies still in the home. They go to the other homes, other homes. Most of Khanunis men killed in that day. More than 700 people killed in that day. All of the children there became orphans. It's a big massacre. They killed the men of Khanunis city, and they collected them in groups, every group between 30 and 40 person, and they are ordered them to 
look to the wall and they shoot all of them. There is auntie of my father. She live in the area of uh, Yaffa, but I don't remember exactly the town. The Jews came to the town and they killed everyone. They opened fire for all people. All people there pass away except two. Her, her brother, old one, and her son. Before I left Palestine, they were the Israeli scare us. They make Daria scene. They kill most of the people there. In Kufur Qasim, they kill all the people. The another village, uh, they get scared. The everyone, every father, he want to take his kids and go out till the war is finished. They, they came in the morning and they killed all the men. They collected all the men in, 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 in the area. And the, there is a big area in, 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 in Alma and they collected all the men in there and they killed all the people, all the men there. They, 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 they shot them, they, they have a machine gun and they killed them, all of them. In front of everybody, yes, sir. I was witnessing that. I was witnessing that, yes. My friend, Abdullah Hamouda, he was 12 years old at the time. He was in a group. His teacher, Mr. Alam Alami, beside him, he said to him when they ordered them to look to the wall, he said to his teacher, they will kill us. He said, don't be scared, come in front of me. And he put him in front of him and they start shooting him. Most about 35 persons killed, still Muhammad still alive. When the killers moving in their car, he tried to get up, his leg is broken. He can't get up and he's still moving on his back until he reaches their home and they, their neighbor fixed his leg until he go to the hospital. And he came to the, to the school with six and that still in my mind from that time, I can't forget. I still suffering until now from what happened to our people in Khan Yunis city. Israel's very existence has never been more threatened than right now. Not by Hamas, which lacks the means to defeat Israel militarily, but by its own actions. Not only is the nation suffering massive military losses in its difficult urban warfare, but Israel's extraordinary brutality in Gaza is uniting the entire world against it. Don't believe me? In a recent UN General Assembly vote, 174 countries, which represents 94% of the world's population, voted in favor of political self-determination for Palestine, while only four countries, including Israel and the US, voted against it. Last week, geopolitical experts from around the world gathered in Germany to attend the Munich Security Conference. The big takeaway from this conference is that Israel has become much more internationally isolated, including from friends and allies than they think. Israel now depends entirely on its one true remaining supporter and enabler of this war, which of course is the United States. But shockingly, even U.S. support is now quickly diminishing. Almost 60% of Americans, that's nearly three in every five people, support a ceasefire with a dwindling 19% opposed. And yet, incredibly, some Israeli leaders are now openly calling for an even wider war in the Middle East. Acting on intelligence about Hamas and hostages, Israeli special forces raided the main hostage hospital in southern Gaza last Thursday, despite international calls for civilian protection. This coincides with Egypt's concerns over Israel's planned ground offensive in Rafah, where 1.4 million displaced Palestinians are sheltering. In today's video, I'll reveal the chilling truth behind Israel's real long-term goal in Gaza and beyond, and how it actually has nothing to do with defeating Hamas. The truth will shock you. Let's break it down. The Israeli government argues that it is in a moral fight for survival against Hamas and therefore must take every measure, including the complete destruction of Gaza to survive. But the cold hard truth is that this is false. Let me explain. In all the years of Hamas rule in Gaza after 2007, Hamas has never captured Israeli territory, much less remotely threatened Israel's existence or survival. Frankly, it couldn't do even if it wanted to. Hamas has around 30,000 fighters, while the Israeli Defense Force has more than 600,000 
active and reserve personnel. Hamas likes an air force, armored vehicles, a military industrial base, and any geographical maneuverability outside of Gaza. In addition, Hamas launches many rockets, but almost all are intercepted or cause little damage. Simply put, Israel has vast military dominance and it's not even close. Importantly, October 7th was not the result of an upgraded or more deadly Hamas, but rather a shocking failure of Israeli security. Israeli leaders had ignored extensive warnings of an upcoming Hamas attack and inexplicably left the Gaza-Israel border severely undermanned. Even more astounding, they did so just days after Israeli extremists had stormed the Al-Aqaza Mosque complex, one of Islam's holiest sites. Hamas exploited Israel's security lapse by easily breaching the border on October 7th. By now, it's also known that the Israeli civilian deaths on that horrific day were in part also caused by Israeli aerial bombing and crossfire in the IDF's counterattack. But by refortifying the border with Gaza, Israel has easily stopped further ground incursions by Hamas. What's disturbing is that Israel's utterly disproportionate military dominance extends to civilian deaths as well. Just take a look at this disturbing chart. Between 2008 and 2022, Hamas and other militants killed around a dozen Israeli civilians per year, while Israel usually killed at least 10 times more Palestinian civilians. There was a spike in 2014 when Israel invaded Gaza with 19 Israeli civilians killed versus 1,760 Palestinian civilians. And of course, October 7th, with around 1,100 Israeli civilians killed versus a whopping over 20,000 and counting Palestinian civilians, mostly women and children, killed in Gaza. Now, the graph I just showed you was from January 3rd. As of today, the death count in Gaza has now crossed 28,000 innocent civilians. As such, there is simply no practical, geopolitical, legal, and much less ethical case for the destruction and genocidal brutality that Israel has inflicted on Palestinian civilians in Gaza. The narrative Israel is selling to its population that Gaza must be wiped out to ensure Israel's survival is being pushed by the same political class that let Israel's guard down in the lead up to October 7th. Simply put, Israeli leaders are seeking to cover up their blunders by obliterating Gaza. Now, if you think this is bogus and believe that Israel is engaging in a careful, precision targeting bombing campaign and doing its best to avoid civilian casualties, then let's simply listen to the direct quotes from Israel's top leaders. The whole Gaza Strip needs to be empty, flattened, just like in Auschwitz. Let it be a museum for all the world to see what Israel can do. Let no one reside in the Gaza Strip for all the world to see because October 7th was in a way a second Holocaust. That was Israeli Mayor Matula David Azulai. Or take Israeli's finance minister, Bazalo Somotrich, a self-declared fascist who calls for Gaza's population to be cut to 100,000 to 200,000 down from the current population of more than 2 million. And then there's Israel's defense minister, Yovav Gallant, who stated that Gaza won't return to what it was before. We will eliminate everything. Over the years, Israel has responded to Hamas rockets with periodic massacres, as in 2014, and more regular airstrikes. The Israelis even have a chilling name for their periodic killing, called mowing the grass. It is common knowledge that inside Israel, that Hamas long served as a low-cost political prop used by Prime Minister Netanyahu to prove to Israelis that a two-state solution is impossible. And it's actually crucial to not forget that Netanyahu has actually backed Hamas for the sole purpose of dividing and weakening the Palestinian Authority, which has always been trying to make a two-state solution work. Late last year, UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres summed up the current situation perfectly with the following spine-chilling statement. Gaza is becoming a graveyard for children. Hundreds of girls and boys are reportedly being killed or injured every day. Ground operations by the IDF and the continued bombardment are hitting civilians, hospitals, refugee camps, mosques, churches, and UN facilities, including shelters. No one is safe. If you're somehow still not convinced, then consider multiple outlets in mainstream media have been forced to admit just how extensive and indiscriminate Israel's carpet bombing of Gaza has become. Let's start with this groundbreaking article from The Guardian titled, How War Destroyed Gaza's Neighborhoods, Visual Investigation. Inside, you will find the most disturbing map that shows the damaged buildings in Gaza since October 7th. This is not Israel trying to eliminate Hamas. This is Israel trying to eliminate any future chances of normal life ever returning to Gaza. But how did Israel do this? 
I thought they were taking all the necessary precautions to reduce the loss of innocent civilian lives. Well, of course, this is the story we've all been sold, but the truth is revealed in this New York Times investigation, which opens with this chilling statement. During the first six weeks of the war in Gaza, Israel routinely used one of its biggest and most destructive bombs in areas it designated safe for civilians. The video investigation focuses on the use of 2,000 pound bombs in an area of southern Gaza where Israel had ordered civilians to move for safety. It later adds that since October, the U.S. has sent more than 5,000 MK-84 munitions to Israel, a type of 2,000 pound bomb. Or take this investigation by CNN, which shows disturbing footage of a 2,000 pound bomb being dropped on a Gaza refugee camp. It goes on to say that these 2,000 pound bombs are four times heavier than the largest bombs the U.S. dropped on ISIS in Iraq. Mark Garlasco, a former U.S. defense intelligence analyst and former U.N. war crimes investigator, verified CNN's report and said that the density of Israel's first month of bombardment in Gaza had not been seen since Vietnam. You have to go back to the Vietnam War to make a comparison. Even in both Iraq wars, it was never that dense. Munition experts have blamed the extensive use of these bombs for the soaring death toll in Gaza. But the fact that Israel deliberately used one of its most destructive bombs in one of the most densely populated areas on Earth is frankly disgusting. But now we get to the crux of this issue. Netanyahu has ordered the flattening of Gaza not to protect Israel from Hamas, but to forcibly push out its entire population by making Gaza completely uninhabitable. This will allow him to fulfill his long-standing mission to gain total Israeli control over the territory and more fundamentally, over all of greater Israel. That includes Israel of the pre-1967 war borders, plus Gaza, the West Bank, and East Jerusalem. Basically, in other words, all the land from the Jordan River to the Mediterranean Sea. Netanyahu gets the added bonus of clinging to power despite his grievous other failures. Greater Israel is home to roughly 7 million Jews and 7 million Palestinian Muslims and Palestinian Christians. Clearly, Israel can rule Greater Israel only by utterly dominating 7 million Palestinians or by driving them out of their homes by war violence, and extreme discrimination. This quest for greater Israel has led the nation to commit some of the gravest crimes against the people of Palestine, which is exactly what the International Court of Justice ruled when it confirmed that Israel is in fact plausibly committing genocide in Gaza. If you need further proof that this war really isn't about eliminating Hamas and instead preparing to dominate the entire future of Gaza, look at this new report, which broke last week and showcases how Israel has given exploration licenses for natural gas in locations that are considered to be within Palestine's maritime boundary in preparation for occupying these areas. Of course, this new development has raised concerns over potential violations of international law, but let's be honest, these concerns have been raised over Israel's treatment of Palestine for decades, and there has never been any serious movements to actually hold Israel accountable to these international standards. Israel's attempt to violently create a greater Israel will fail. The IDF is suffering massive losses in the brutal urban warfare in Gaza. And while Israel has killed more than 28,000 Gazans, which are mostly women and children, it has not destroyed Hamas capacity to resist Israel's invasion. IDF but like you know <laughs> you guys you guys know that you know it, 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 in the 1980s it, israel actually banned use of the word palestine in palestine yeah. right and in, in fact the the bank of palestine which was a bank in gaza was shut down when israel occupied gaza in 67 and when the bank was set to reopen uh, after you know a 14 year hiatus in 1980 81 the israeli military said okay fine We'll let you keep the name Bank of Palestine because it was grandfathered in, but 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 no other institutions or organizations or societies or companies could use the word Palestine in its wow. name because, of course, that would be endangering Israelis and Jews. Mm. And and you know, I just thought to myself, you know, guys, like Palestine, 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 yeah. like just take cover. Yeah, like, yeah. I don't. Yeah. Like, You're hurting me. It's, it's the can, it's the candy man of place names. <laughs> yeah, I know. Say it three times into a mirror, Watch and then you out. get to own someone else's home. You're gonna get smacked in the face by my saliva. Yeah, that's that's when the that's when the watermelon symbol took root, right? In the mm -hmm. 80s, as a as a as a way of getting around that.
Well, that, that, that's actually another great point. That was for a different reason, because they not only banned mm. the name Palestine, but they also banned paintings made from, or any artwork that used those four colors, red, green, black, and white. And in fact, Fatih Ghaban, who, who was just recently murdered by the Israeli military in Gaza last week, okay, after living for decades and decades and decades under Israeli military occupation, uh, finally uh, um, was, was murdered just a week ago. But in 1982... Fatih Rabban painted a painting using those four colors and sat six months in an Israeli prison for that. Wow. It's, it's, it's fucking crazy. And just like, you know, to me, it's just that you can draw such a clear parallel between any kind of fascist regime that tries to erase history, including the Nazis trying to erase Jewish history, um, you know, during the Holocaust. I mean, you know, not to quote a movie instead of something like historical, like a doc or something, but like it reminds me of uh, Eamon Gareth uh, in Schindler's List uh, talking about, uh, uh, you know, we're going to we're erasing Jewish history today. That history ends. It never happens like that whole scene. It just feels it just feels so disgustingly similar because you just see, um, you know, this delegitimization um, become so normalized that people will use arguments like there's no P in the Arab alphabet and not even like, like not even think about it, not even consider how stupid of an argument that is. Uh, they, they just, it just be, it becomes, it's just a part of the narrative, you know? It's it's not just the name Palestine. It's not just the four colors: green, black, red, and white. It's everything about Palestinian identity and Palestinian culture and Palestinian history. In the past five months, the Israeli military has obliterated every single historical and archaeological site in Gaza. Wow. Wow. They've de they've demolished the Gaza municipal archives. Uh, <sighs> they destroyed Salim al Raisi's uh, 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 antique shop, wow. which I was recently I was I had the fortune and privilege of being able to visit very recently, mm. um, and bought hundreds and hundreds of documents off him. Which, as yeah, far as I know, you were in Gaza weeks before October seventh, right? That's right. Wow. And, and bought about six hundred documents off of him, which, as far as I can tell, are the last rest, uh, vestiges of that archival collection, which wow. is uh, which was probably the the largest private collection of documents related to Palestinian history and all of historic Palestine was obliterated by the Israeli military. They're trying to erase everything. They, 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 they go into the archives and they conceal documents. By the way, documents that were previously open. They're yeah. going in purging the archives of any evidence that Israeli committed war crimes in 48 or in 67. Um, they destroy yeah. Palestinian homes uh, in order to, <clears throat> in 48, to prevent them from returning, to, pre to pre prevent people from even knowing that there were Palestinian villages here. Right. The, it's yeah. it's a it complete reminds, erasure of an entire people, and it's and it's very uh, it's calculated that way. I mean, they understand as the Nazis did that culture is a repository of memory, and the you know it reminds me of that line from The Wire. I like to use wire quotes on this podcast as much as possible because I'm trying to uh, butter Matt up. Uh, <laughs> you remember what you remember what Brother Muzon said to his mm. to his uh, bodyguard. You know, you know what yes, the most I dangerous do. thing is in America. Yeah, you know, and he says, you know. Basically, a Negro with a with a library card. Yes, you know, yes. and and the most dangerous thing to Israel is Palestinians' memory because their memory yes. is their connection to the land to which they belong, as opposed to Israel, which wants the the land to belong to them. Right. It's it, it's their connection to indigeneity and culture is uh, is a, it's a kind of <clears throat> architecture that allows memory to to transmit itself from Lador Vador, as we say in Hebrew, right? Mm -hmm. From generation to generation. Right. And they think somehow that someday the day will come where they can actually obliterate that. And it's, I mean, it's galling and gutting and horrific that what they're doing, but they, they're not going to succeed no matter what they yeah. do. Yeah. You, you are, uh, th there was a Nakba law passed, I believe it was 2011 in Israel. <clears throat> and I believe the law stated that you could not receive any public funding if you're, we are commemorating the Nakba, if your organization or society uh, was <clears throat> commemorating the ethnic cleansing of 750,000 Palestinians in 1948, you would be denied public funding. And <clears throat> in 2021, 22, Israel also declared six Palestinian NGOs terrorist organizations, mm -hmm. which turned out to be obviously false, right? This is just Israeli nonsense. In the EU, uh, a few months later, basically said, 
Actually, these are human rights organizations documenting human rights violations by, and, and terrorist actions by the state of Israel. Um, but it, it's all part of the same initiative, which is to erase Palestinian memory, to erase Palestinian civil society, to right. con press control, alt delete on the Palestinians. Good. Yeah. Pull it. Now, and <clears throat> there's a long history of that. And it's, the, it's, it's very similar of like what the U S did when they went into Iraq. Uh, let's take all the history and make sure that they have a, a fresh start on their history and it's all democratized. And, and, you know, so it's a sign of intellectual bankruptcy. Anytime you want to censor, let alone go destroy documents so that you can sanitize. Like that's, that's covering up a crime. It's covering like, I mean, <clears throat> I don't know, Tony, am I overreacting to it? <laughs> no, I mean, it's not an overreaction, but tragically, this is actually more par for the course of history than it than it being sort of an anomaly. Um, you know, shout out to Senna, um, who you know presented her history and what her family went through uh, in Greece, being forced out of uh, Greece to go to Turkey, and during basically a British prince coming over and declaring that he is now the king of the island. It's a whole mess and it's a very convoluted history, but that's basically what happened. And yeah, that's where Prince Philip. That's King Charles's dad came from Greece. I'm pretty sure back in the day. And it's interesting. He was because, quite older. Than and Queen that's what they did too. was they erased the history. They erased, and she said very specifically, they erased the the culture. Did like the the it'd be like um, the rituals and sort of um, of our culture. You know, get it, erasing maybe July Fourth or maybe if you're religious, Easter Sunday or something like that. It'd be like the normal things that are make up the culture for hundreds of maybe not thousands of years. They systematically erase it, including the language. So by the next the, the next generation, it's you know, they're completely instantiated with a totally different narrative, totally different language, totally different cultural perspective, and that's done on purpose. So unfortunately, I'll just say this is more par for the course historically speaking. You look at like the movement of nations and imperialism and and civilization and warfare. This is what is to be expected. The conquerors typically completely destroy any remnants of the the one's culture um unfortunately so it's it's, this, this is and this is what's so tragic right now is um you know israel there's you know 174 countries only four countries voted in you know, of course one abstain one abstain though year. right right here um, right here they abstain <laughs> and but it's interesting because at the end of the day it, it, again john mearsheimer whoever has the leverage in the international world is the one who has the power it doesn't so like it's just like it's essentially an anarchism of of leverage in the international scene so it's like who has it really comes down to might makes right military power of military and, power. and money well, yeah a, that's exactly that's right all there. it is military and money and, and and right sense. now america is fully decaptured by israel or one in the same at this point and um you know unless someone's going to stand up like one of the BRICS nations is going to like stand up both monetarily and uh, militarily. Nope, this is not going to stop. I just don't see unless there's a major regime change in America. But no Trump is 100 percent on board now. with Israel, as far as I understand it. So it's genocide. Trump, it plays into Israel for Trump to get elected as much as it is for a progressive. Well, maybe not as much for well. But they have we, both parties completely deep captured. So I don't think they're worried about the. That's uh, what I wrote down in this card. Election. Of military and money, deep capture of the world. So yeah, we're on the go. same page, dude. There we're vibing at four in the morning. <laughs> All right. So uh, we have three more major stories. I'm afraid we're only going to be able to get the two. But we're going to try our hardest and see what we can do. This uh, next setup right comes that rhyme. Yeah, uh, It comes thanks to uh, the Ryman Meister comedy shyster Michael Rappaport. And we've been covering his saga, looking for apartheid the past couple oh, is weeks. He still looking, still bro. Looking. We have found the apartheid. Oh, it's in this episode, and what you're gonna see here. Not good, it, but at least he found it. He made a video this past week, which is a perfect introduction to this. The one of the biggest stories of the week, and um, in there, there's a quote, and it's a nod towards, like a hat tip toward Scorsese's uh, film, which I have not seen. But it is where this section gets its title. And this section is titled The Killers of the Flower Massacre Moon. Yeah. We're going to start it with Rappaport. There's going to be a reference. And then we're going to go to what has become known as the Flower Massacre, 
where uh, Israel tried to deliver 30 trucks of aid and then ended up shooting the hungry people by mistake. It's a funny way to help them. And then we're going to get to the even funnier way that the United States tried to come in the day after and bail out their good buddy, best friend. But let's first go to uh, the Oscars again. Uh, a little nod to the little gold man who's a it's a Templar it's a Templar soldier. He is a sword and a shield. This is a Templar idol might, that might they worship. Hitler. Thou shalt not worship idols. I thought. Anyway, here's Rappaport doing something that he's never going to get invited to do, uh, and so he decided he wanted to host the Oscars and and see if he has like maybe a one sided take on this. And oftentimes uh, it can be quoted that. Uh, Zionists, you you know who they are because they're the they're the Jews who aren't funny. So let's go to Michael Rappaport. <laughs> I stole that from Russell Dobler. It's like Do woke Dissonance. comedian. That's Russell's yeah, like... quote. That's Russell's quote from <laughs> Do Dissonance podcast. He hosts Jimmy Dore show. That's funny. Uh, I just want to make sure credit where credit is due. <laughs> Here's Rappaport. Shit. Here he is. This is real. Not real. Ladies and gentlemen, your host for this evening, Michael Rappaport. Yes. Yes, welcome to the 96th Academy Awards. Good evening to the millions of viewers at home and the 134 Israeli hostages who are watching us from the Hamas tunnels in Gaza. You guys have a lot in common with the beautiful audience we have here tonight. Neither of you have eaten in almost four months. <laughs> Next year, I'm sure the hostage diet will be bigger than Ozempic. I can't believe it's already been four months. Four months, which is actually the length of the first cut of Killers of the Flower Moon. <laughs> I love you, Marty. You, come on, you're the best. I love you. Anyway, I know you beautiful people are thinking about the hostages in Gaza all the time. You just won't speak up about them. If Hamas would have attacked Israel and kidnapped all the dolphins, you'd be wearing dolphin helmets and throwing tuna fish at the podium. And God forbid Hamas would have raped the gender pay gap. Oh, man, Julia Roberts would have ran into Gaza herself with an AK-47. <laughs> Julia. But I'm sure the hostages understand your silence and they forgive you, Hollywood. They know that speaking up for them could result in you losing some key fans in the demographic of 18 to 25-year-olds. Oh, yeah, I know. You don't want to mess around with those notorious, scary Gen Zers, huh? They're far more dangerous than Hamas. They can kill you on TikTok, then kill themselves because they don't get enough likes. I know, it's frightening. No one wants to be canceled on TikTok. It's a scary, scary place. But it has been a really, really exciting year for Hollywood. So we decided to add some very exciting categories to tonight's ceremony. <laughs> Who will win Best Actor Who's Made Millions on playing a stereotypical neurotic Jew with back hair yet still won't show some solidarity award? Yes. And when you finally say something political, it's about the legalization of pot. What the fuck, man? You got to be on crack. Pick a drug, Seth Rogen. Ooh, did I say Seth Rogen? I'm sorry. So I'm kidding, Seth. You're awesome, and your ceramics are fantastic. Museum quality. Get ready, MoMA. And who will win the coveted best unsupportive actress wearing a black dress to protest sexual misconduct, but is too scared to wear a yellow ribbon tonight award? That's right, sexual misconduct. You know what I'm talking about, right? What the hell do you think is happening to the female hostages now? Hamas makes Harvey Weinstein look like Peter Pan. It's a problem, guys, huh? And of course, who will go home tonight with the best actor who plays a dead Jew to get an Oscar, but will say nothing about actual Jewish babies that are still alive in captivity award? Yeah, by the way, the loser has to give back his fake nose. You guys don't deserve our schnoz. Yeah, what's the problem? Hey. hey, get off of me. Come on, what is the problem? We apologize for this interruption. Um, Will Smith, if you're here, would you please get on stage and give us a hand? Eyewitnesses and the Hamas-run Palestinian Ministry of Health say that more than 100 people were killed in what is being described as a chaotic incident as IDF soldiers opened fire as people were trying to get food from aid trucks. CNN's Jeremy Diamond is gathering new details. He's been picking up some new reporting. Jeremy, bring us up to speed here. 
Well, first of all, Kate, I think it's important to note that the aid situation, the humanitarian situation in northern Gaza is just so, so desperate. And that seems to be part of what led to this scene. Hundreds, if not thousands of people surrounding some of these uh, aid trucks that were able to enter northern Gaza. Some of the very few aid trucks that have actually been able to make it in there. And you can see in this video by the Israeli, uh, from the Israeli military uh, the crowds of people around these uh, trucks. But what appears to have happened is that the Israeli military opened open fire on some of these people who are surrounding these trucks. Uh, an Israeli military official telling us that the crowd approached the forces in a manner that posed a threat to the troops, and they say that those troops then responded with live fire. Now, eyewitnesses on the scene have told us that Israeli tanks as well as drones opened fire on this crowd. Um, and that following that, there was a chaotic scene. Uh, it, some of the drivers of these A trucks apparently tried to get away uh, amid the, this gunfire and, and killed uh, several additional people. We were told that 104 people were killed in this incident, 760 people injured, according to the Palestinian Ministry of Health. It's not clear yet how many of those were killed by Israeli gunfire versus by uh, these trucks and, and the ensuing chaos. Uh, but our eyewitnesses on the ground indicate that it was the Israeli gunfire that prompted uh, some of those trucks to flee the scene and in the process uh, run over uh, some of these individuals. But we are still working to gather additional details. The Israeli military says for its part that the incident is under review. And they are also saying in a statement that Gazan residents surrounded the trucks, looted the supplies being delivered, and that during the incident, dozens of Gazans, they say, were injured as a result of pushing and trampling. This was clearly more than just pushing and trampling. And we have eyewitnesses making very clear that the Israeli military did indeed open fire on these individuals uh, as well. Uh, now, we should note that this is only happening because of how desperate the humanitarian situation is in northern Gaza. Very few aid trucks have actually been able to make it in there. The World Food Program recently suspended aid deliveries to northern Gaza, saying that it was too unsafe. Part of that has to do with a lack of coordination with the Israeli military to get those trucks into a war zone safely in a way that they are not targeted. And it also has to do with the fact that the Israeli military in the past has targeted uh, police officers who have been uh, around those aid convoys. Uh, and so there is very little security for these. You combine that lack of security, you combine that with the fact that people are on the brink of famine in northern Gaza, and then the Israeli military also being on the scene. And this is the situation that appears to have arisen. Eyewitnesses and the More than 100 Palestinians have been killed while waiting for food aid in Gaza City. These images are from that attack in the southwest of the city. A journalist told the BBC that Israeli tanks opened fire on a crowd who'd come to collect supplies. A large number of people had been gathered waiting for food when the incident happened. The Israeli military issued these aerial pictures of the incident. It says dozens of Gazans were crushed and trampled as they surrounded the aid trucks. Separately, groups had fired after feeling threatened by the crowds near the aid point. Let's have a listen to that statement from the Israeli Prime Minister's office. The trucks were overwhelmed and the people driving the trucks, which were Gazan... Uh, Gazan civilian drivers uh, plowed into um, the crowds of people, uh, ultimately killing, my understanding is, tens of people. Now let's have a listen to an account from a Palestinian who was there. After they stopped shooting, we went back to get our aid. By the time I got flour and some canned goods and took it down from the truck, they shot at us. They shot me and the truck driver left and ran over my leg. I lost my nerves. If you want to get us aid this way, then you might as well not bring anything. What has already happened to us is more than enough. We went to get flour for children. We have been eating animal feed for two months and even that ran out. What are we supposed to do? Where are we supposed to go? Now this all comes as we've received the latest figures on the numbers of Palestinians killed in Gaza since October. Now, more than 30,000 people have been killed in the territory, according to figures from the Hamas-run health ministry there. Now, this graph from the BBC Verify team charts the rising number of people killed in Gaza from Israeli strikes, which were sparked by the Hamas attacks on southern Israel on the 7th of October. 
I'm now inside Ashifa Hospital following the massacre perpetrated by the Israeli occupation forces against innocent and starving Gazans who rushed to Ar Rashid coastal road believing they could get their hands on some food aid near Nabul Sirandabad. The entrance and corridors of the hospital are overpacked with victims, the morgue filled with dozens of dead bodies, yet many more dead bodies remain lying on the road. The medical staff stand helpless amid this influx of victims. As we speak, more victims are still being brought to the already overwhelmed hospital. Let's listen to some eyewitnesses. We headed to Al Rashid Road, hoping to get some flour for our children, but then the Israeli tanks advanced. They opened fire randomly on everyone on the road. Dozens were killed and hundreds injured. I simply went there hoping to get some food for my young children. We've been starving for more than 140 days. Very little aid is entering the Gaza Strip, and nothing is reaching the north. It was the first time that I went there to wait for aid. I took a bag because we don't have flour at home. As soon as the trucks entered, Israeli tanks advanced and started shelling. I was injured. Israeli tanks opened fire. Dozens were killed and hundreds injured. We appeal to the whole world. We cannot feed our children. Any aid delivered is soaked in our blood. May God punish those responsible. It is known to the whole world that the north of the Gaza Strip has been starving for months. It is beyond description. This man has a family of 12. As soon as he grabbed a bag of flour, an Israeli soldier shot him in the chest. Seeing him clinging to the bag of flour, the Israeli soldiers shot him again on the other side of the body. He is lying here before you. The Israelis alleged to be with humanity. They showered us with bombs, missiles and shells, open fire randomly on any moving person. They are killing and starving us. Ongoing massacres, slaughters wrecked by the Israelis on innocent Gazans, a multitude of war crimes. Let's go ahead and move on to some breaking news, uh, very disturbing coming out of Israel this morning. Let's go ahead and put this first element up on the screen, guys. So the reports are that at least 104 Palestinians who were waiting for food aid were killed and 760 wounded after being shot at by Israeli forces in Gaza. Um, this is obviously horrifying news. We know the levels of starvation and desperation that have become completely endemic in the Gaza Strip. Um, there is not a person there who is not undergoing severe food shortages and having to go without meals. Um, nutrition, it, malnutrition is now extraordinarily widespread and pervasive among young people. So you have a huge number of people waiting for and attempting to uh, get food off of these aid trucks. And Israeli forces, according to Al Jazeera and other reports, shooting dead at least 104 Palestinians waiting for food aid and wounding at least 760. Now, the IDF has responded. Um, we can go ahead and show this video that they put out, and I will go ahead and tell you what they are claiming happened, which is at odds with other evidence and reports from on the ground. They say early this morning, during the entry of humanitarian aid trucks into the northern Gaza Strip, Gazan residents surrounded the trucks and looted the supplies being delivered. During the incident, dozens of Gazans were injured as a result of pushing and trampling. The incident is under review. As I said, this accounting by the IDF of claims claiming that the injuries were sustained by pa desperate Palestinians looting and trampling over one another, is uh, undercut by additional video from the scene. This is courtesy of Al Jazeera, where you can actually hear the IDF gunfire um, uh, surrounding this food truck and resulting in the deaths of many Palestinians. Let's take a listen. <laughs> So, Sagar, obviously, you know, you have an incredibly desperate people 
literally starving to death in certain instances, trying to get whatever food they can. Um, food truck deliveries have been uh, further curtailed and limited, especially as the uh, Israeli government has allowed those protests to continue, which have been blocking aid going into the Strip. The ICJ ruling, they actually demanded that Israel increase humanitarian uh, supplies. They have gone in the opposite direction. And so now, especially in northern Gaza, you have just an absolute desperation. And you also have prior reports, too, of the IDF firing on these aid convoys. So this is not even the first time that it's happened, but it is appears to be the time that has had the most horrific and deadly results. I mean, regardless ahead, of it. whether they were fired. All right, so we're about to dig into these claims because when the IDF and uh, official statecraft propaganda meisters say that they did not fire on the convoy, it's sophisticated rhetoric. They're not saying they didn't fire at the crowd. They're not saying they didn't fire at the Palestinians or the hungry, starving people mobbing them. They say they didn't off. They didn't fire on their own convoy. It's their convoy. They have a thirty vehicle convoy. That's they very ambivalent of them, dude. They're, even this is really there, sneaky. The That's their, policy, yeah. yeah, this is very hawk like what they're doing. So we're gonna see if they can survive these moves. But I wanted to, uh, I wanted to point that out that they're gonna use this phrase over and over again. They did not attack the convoy. They didn't shoot at the convoy. IDF, uh, you know, all the, all these sort of things. But. Um, inconvenient to these facts that were just put out there because all these news agencies, they it's like these people died, but you know, we don't know what they, they got trampled. Like it was a concert and everybody was like, so pressed up against each other. They, they asphyxiated and suffocated, right? That's not what happened. A hundred people didn't get run over. I'm about to show you footage that shows like the, that aerial footage that Israel's so proud of, where it makes everyone look like insects, and I'm going to show you. Yeah, that I was going to say well. that. Oh, my first response, like at that, is a very it's, damning. It's chopped and cut, but if you just watch which of these dots is moving, that stops, and then you see all these dots that stop moving, which are dead people on the ground. They're like 20 yards from the convoy. They're not under the wheels of any convoy. All the dead people are being shot. You can see it in the footage that the IDF released. Reuters admitted it on the morning of. So I was just over here. I was searching my Twitter feed because there's lots of stuff on Twitter. So I, I was looking, where's my Reuters post? Here's an interesting one along the way. Israeli military opens probe into reports of October 7th friendly fire. Look, they that's hellfire missiles on their own places. Uh, there's a lot of evidence of that uh, along the way. Here's some Elon Levy. This is from the day of. Um, he's like blood libel. Those poor people were killed when they were crushed in a stampede and in some cases run over by Gazan truck drivers as they try to get out, right? This is the propaganda meister. We watched him earlier, right? Generation Z, Generation Zionist. This is his take. He didn't know that Ben Gavir had already admitted to it right here. Here's it. Here's in Hebrew. Total support must be given. Uh, the IDF soldiers were endangered by these people seeking food. And this is another clear reason why we must stop transferring this aid, which is, in fact, aid to harm the IDF soldiers and oxygen to Hamas. So Ben Gavir had already admitted it. Reuters had already admitted it. They had a whole story on it. It's pasted in here someplace. And, you know, if this was a longer show, we could find it. But again, last last week, we found that uh, censored Reuters article on Palestinian leader Arafat, who was murdered, assassinated with polonium. And then there's a whole bunch, if you go up to the top, if you were to do such a search, there's a whole bunch of interesting Rothschild Reuters <laughs> articles up here at the top. But that's not what we're here for. There's also some Jimmy Savile, Mark Thompson type stuff in here. I mean, I, I, my whole art, my Twitter is an archive of the research and documents and evidence. And it's not necessarily for people to read day to day, though, if you were to try to read it every day, uh, it's quite an archive. So there's that example, uh, giving food to Palestinians uh endangers the idf so here's the ben gavir statement in bigger text so you could see it if you wanted to screenshot it and then there was also this okay so this is the convoy in blue squares and these red squares are motionless people on the ground who in earlier frames were moving around as you can see they are not near the wheels of the convoy and uh there's more footage of this and there's also this piece if we were to watch it full screen See how they kind of made it look like it's like ants and insects. Oh yeah, yeah, that's perp. That I imagine well, if not right? purposeful, it certainly uh, supports a, the way in which they view the people. It's a feature, not analogy. a bug, Tony. That's how they say it over there. 
And like the impersonality for those that are Manning, look how many people Thrones, you see. I yeah, mean, just, it is, but it looks just, like an ant colony. Let me just so like if you're someone, let me just rewind the, it back so you can see that that part because it's like you see it close up right here. That's obviously like a bag of flour at the middle. But look at the zoom out. Now watch another zoom out and watch another zoom out. There's a lot of people looking for food, bro. Yeah, yeah. Look at that. That's that's really that's a lot of people. It almost looks like is this thermal? Is this uh infrared? Is this uh uh what type of footage is this? Maybe uh it must be capturing at some frequency. Yeah, I mean yeah, anyway, to to that's drone footage. There's thermal a convoy. signatures given off. This is where you're course, gonna see. There's people. so much evidence you can see around from the hmm, Yeah, and there's a whole bunch of analyses on this. You can see right there. There, I do see some people under the wheels and stuff when it's getting right there, but those are not the people over here. And when they all start to run, that means there's gunfire going off. So there's that. And the comment was, "This footage is designed to make Palestinians look like insects, right. that insects was my and not people." The IDF has the most advanced image capturing equipment on the planet. They film and send this out to make you hate Palestinians and be indifferent to their deaths yeah, or even be happy about it. They want to show it as a mass cluster that looks exactly like an, a bug, particularly an ant infestation in your house. They don't want to make them look like humans that you know share in the same universals that you do, the same sort of uh, embodied nature. So they don't want to show that at all, make it personal in any way. Of course, they're going to show it in this very impersonal, this view, uh, zoomed out aerial view. Um, very, very devious. It's so evil. Just like, like unconscionably evil. But this is surprising at this point. This is footage from on the ground. So what you're seeing is like FLIR. It was probably FLIR on a drone. And then this is like some footage on the ground while it was going down. And I mean, it's some crazy shit going on with starving, hungry people who have been waiting a day or so to get the, the food delivery. And so, yeah, the IDF, they doubled down on their Hasbara and uh, they they denied, 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 but they denied in conflicting ways after they had already confirmed, confirmed, confirmed. And then the world started waking up a little bit more. Like, it's not just the people who see, it's the people who are on the fence and they're like, wait a minute. Me think thou dost doth self-defense too much, something like that, right? And the other aspect is I think that flower massacre video is going to end up being like the collateral murder too. Remember how Julian Assange pissed off the world so he could sit in the cage? It was the collateral murder video that they leaked about the them murking those Reuters journalists back in the day, right? Well. We got a little special something to play you out tonight based on that theme. So the groundwork has been set. You've heard the official stories and narratives put out. And uh, again, they, they don't want to associate the dead people with the IDF shooting people, though they admit the IDF was shooting and that there were people there, but they say there were two different incidents. And again, it's a bunch of whole slicing and dicing and Julianning of the words like they were buying stuff from Ron Popeil on some late night ad, ad you know, commercial show. They're, they're they're at it, chopping it up. All right, so now we have a next. Did we? Did I paste the next block? Let me look. No, I didn't. I have to make one copy paste here. All right, so this next block, we're gonna hear. Here's the IDF spokesman. Here's the propaganda meister. Here's the conflicting stories. Here's Christian Amanpour being incredulous and given given some feet so there's like three or four english speaking idf uh israel zionist propaganda meisters elon levy being the foremost but the other ones are like spokesmen for the idf and stuff like that you're gonna see examples here of the conflicting stories and the the official narrative starting to break down and then the next story is about how all the other narratives that they used to justify the genocide ethnic cleansing and apartheid also breaking down so um yeah, it's almost like uh, Israel's got Palestinian envy. Let's check out this next clip, and I'm going to press that for LD. These next clips coming up, we have Israel Defense Forces, IDF official statement regarding the humanitarian convoy in Gaza, and try not to laugh because it's real people being killed, but this guy, is, he's a clown. He should be on tour with Rappaport. CNN presents IDF spokesperson, 
about firing on civilians seeking aid. Again, Wolf Blitzer has not quit yet, and he is not very bought into this war. Uh, next, from Richard Medhurst, uh, Israel carries out the most sadistic massacre, opens fire on Gaza aid. He's going to have a little analysis of that footage. And then the last piece in this media block is Christian Amanpour, top Netanyahu advisor, responds to daily Gaza aid incident. And Mark Regev, he's going to give you the Hasbara. So go get your Wellingtons on because it's about to get deep. This morning, the IDF coordinated a convoy to 38 trucks to provide additional humanitarian assistance to the residents of northern Gaza. This humanitarian aid came from Egypt, went through a security screening at the Kerem Shalom humanitarian crossing in Israel, and then entered Gaza for distribution by private contractors. As these vital humanitarian supplies were making their way towards Gazans in need, thousands of Gazans dispensed upon the trucks. Some began violently pushing and even trampling other Gazans to death, looting the humanitarian supplies. The unfortunate incident resulted in dozens of Gazans killed and injured. Here are the facts. At 4.40 a.m., the first aid truck in the humanitarian convoy started making its way through the humanitarian corridor that we were securing. Yes, F was securing the humanitarian corridor so that the aid convoy could reach its destination in northern Gaza. Our tanks were there to secure the humanitarian corridor for the aid convoy. Our UAVs were there in the air to give our forces a clear picture from above. During this humanitarian operation, at 4.45 a.m., a mob ambushed the aid trucks, bringing the convoy to a halt. As you can see in this video, the tanks that were there to secure the convoy sees the Gazan being trampled and cautiously tries to disperse the mob with a few warning shots. When the hundreds became thousands and things got out, out of hand, the tank commander decided to retreat to avoid harm to the thousands of Gazans that were there. Here you can see how cautious they were when they were backing up. I think as a military man, they were backing up s securely, risking their own life, not shooting at the mob. The Israel Defense Forces operate according to the rules of engagement and the international law. No IDF strike was conducted towards the aid convoy. I want to repeat that. No IDF strike was conducted towards the, the aid convoy. On the contrary, the IDF was there conducting a humanitarian operation to secure the humanitarian corridor and allow the aid convoy to reach its designated distribution point so that the humanitarian aid could reach Gazan civilians in the north that are in need. We have been conducting a humanitarian operation of this kind for the last four nights without any problem. It's the first night that we had this kind of event. This humanitarian aid was coordinated by Israel for the people of Gaza. We want humanitarian aid to reach the people of Gaza. We are working around the clock to make, it, to make this happen. Israel puts no limits no limits on the amounts of aid that can go into Gaza. We are working together with humanitarian organizations and the international community to help them solve the issue of aid distribution inside Gaza. It is a problem. This morning, humanitarian aid made its way to the northern Gaza. There was no IDF strike on this aid. I repeat, there was no IDF strike on this aid. 
On the contrary, the IDF was conducting a humanitarian operation. That's why we were there. Because our war is against Hamas, not against the people of Gaza. We are in a war that we did not start. We did not seek. Hamas started this war when it massacred and kidnapped Israeli civilians on October 7th, and then went back into Gaza and hid behind the Gazan civilians, using them as a human shield. We recognize the suffering of the innocent people of Gaza. This is why we are seeking ways to expand our humanitarian efforts. This is why we are conducting humanitarian operation like this, like the one we conducted this morning. Joining us now from Tel Aviv himself, the IDF spokesman, Lieutenant Colonel Peter Lerner. Colonel, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, I want your perspective. How did this incident happen? It's an awful incident, as the entire world is now seeing. Why did IDF forces, first of all, open fire on hungry Palestinian civilians simply in desperate need of food? Well, we have to understand, first of all, that the reality is quite different. The IDF coordinated access for humanitarian goods that are in dire need in the northern Gaza Strip. This is precisely the convoy that went in, over 30 trucks, and indeed, this is the, the, the activities that we've been conducting over the last week or so in order to get more goods into the northern Gaza Strip for the needs of the people up there in, in northern Gaza. In the early hours of this morning, we understand that the, the convoy passed through the Israeli positions uh, and continued to move forward and continued to move north. Um, as they move forward, a amount of people, um, a huge amount of people, as we clearly shared in the visuals that we distributed, um, stormed the, and stampeded the, the truckloads. As they climbed upon, they were pushing, they were shoving, people were trampled and also run over, as uh, Jeremy Diamond rightly pointed out. And, and this is the, the, the reality of the, the mass casualty event that transpired afterwards. Um, in a separate event at a different location, further, further south, um, out uh, away from the convoy, indeed, as Jeremy rightly pointed out, um, uh, people approached the forces that, first of all, fired warning shots in the air. And we have to keep in mind, this is a combat zone, and our forces are confronted with explosive devices that Hamas terrorists have attached to the tanks, RPGs, weapons, all different types of attacks. So when people uh, that are perceived as a threat continue to move forward towards the forces, despite the warning shots, the threat is still perceived. And indeed, there's a handful of people that have been killed in this incident uh, or wounded that we're not uh, entirely certain of, of the figure, but it's a tragedy that is developing. We are operating in order to maintain operational activity and conduct our combat on one hand, and maintain the ongoing flow of humanitarian goods, humanitarian supplies on the other. Let me interrupt you for a moment, uh, Colonel, because as you heard, eyewitnesses on the scene, they strongly dispute the IDF, the Israel Defense Forces account, the account you're pre presenting right now. They say the Israeli military opened fire first on people near the trucks, causing them to panic and the truck drivers to simply drive away. What evidence, if any, do you have, Colonel, to support the IDF account? Well, we distributed um, extensive video footage sharing um, the process and the movement of the trucks as they were moving forward, as they continued to go, as they plowed through some of the people. Nothing to do with our forces at this time. Um, of course, I will say we're continuing to investigate, continuing to inquire in our after actions activities. This is continuing. Uh, we're continuing to look into it. But this is the facts. This is what we know at this time. Because the drone video that you released, and we've been showing it, to our viewers here in the United States and indeed around the world, doesn't show trucks driving into the crowds. It also doesn't show Israeli forces open, opening fire. Do you have other video, Colonel, of those incidents? And if you do, will you release that video? So I've been following CNN quite extensively. Unfortunately, you're only showing a small fraction of the video footage uh, that, we've sh that we've shared. Um, you know, there are a couple of minutes there and you see the trucks moving and the people swarming the truckloads stampeding, trying to take the goods um, and loot the goods off of the trucks, that the humanitarian assistance, it's international assistance that was being supplied in the northern areas of uh, uh, the Gaza Strip, um, precisely for the, for the requirements and the needs of the people. Unfortunately, this is a situation 
that we are facing and we are um, understanding that, that there is a dire situation. The humanitarian aid needs to arrive in its place. Um, and you know, the, the reality is, as we push forward, that we will continue to coordinate and facilitate the access of humanitarian goods. Those trucks that were bringing in this desperately needed food, Colonel, wh where were they from? Were these UN trucks? Uh, what kind of trucks were providing this, this food for the folks in Gaza? Um, the understanding and the information that I have at hand is that it was international aid uh, by governments that was supplied and that came on in private truckloads to move north. Um, I've also received in the last few minutes one report that actually um, gunmen within, within the northern Gaza Strip opened fire and killed one of the drivers, actually. So we're still investigating. There's still more information coming in. We'll keep you posted and we'll make announcements accordingly. The UN says more than half a million people in Gaza right now, and I'm quoting now from this UN statement, these people are, quote, one step away from famine, half a million people. Critics have accused Israel, as you know, of using hunger as a weapon of war. Colonel, how do you respond to that charge? We need to do everything in order to alleviate the humanitarian situation. The IDF is coordinating with the international players, with governments, there are uh, access points from Rafa and from Kerem Shalom, where hundreds of truckloads of, of supplies are coming in every single day. They need to be distributed. They need to reach the people that are in dire need. And I would add, we're also coordinating airdrops from the sky, whether it's from um, different governments. And I also heard that this morning, uh, I saw that there are the US and Canada are also considering that. I'm sure that we can facilitate more access. There is no limit on the amount of humanitarian aid and supplies that get, can get into Gaza. We are facilitating that and coordinating that. We have been almost for five months. We need to get the aid to the people that actually need it. This uh, really horrible incident today comes as the Palestinian Health Ministry now says more than 30,000 people have been killed in Gaza, the majority of whom are women and children. So here's the question. Why is Israel not doing more to limit these casualties? Um, so let's correct ourselves just one second there. It's the... Hamas Ministry of Health. I wouldn't trust the ISIS Ministry of Health. I wouldn't trust the Al-Qaeda Ministry of Health. I don't trust the Hamas Ministry of Health. In this war, we've killed up to now over 12,000 terrorists, uh, Hamas terrorists, Palestinian Islamic Jihad terrorists in combat or in precision strikes. Indeed, it is a deep tragedy that civilians are caught up in this war. It's a war Israel never asked for. It was a war Israel was surprised from on the 7th of October when Hamas decided to launch a war against Israel. Look at some of the screenshots that the BBC uh, uh, provide us with here. They say these people in red are, are motionless people on the ground, okay, that have been executed, that have been killed by the Israelis. And it's just the beginning. It's just the beginning. Um, the IDF, the Israelis won't release the full footage, okay? And then here, if you look at if you look at the um, uh, yeah, the video released by the IDF is not one single sequence. It has been edited into four sections. So basically, the Israelis have cut out um, important parts from the video where you don't see the people being massacred, but you see them afterwards as they're lying motionless on the ground. Because when someone's looking at that, it's, it's more difficult to understand. I mean, just looking at this footage, you know, if, if, if they hadn't put any circles or a legend on it, it's difficult to know what's going on, right? But when you can see the, the tracer rounds being used, uh, tracer rounds light up in the dark, um, uh, you know, the, the infrared camera might pick that up. The satellite imagery might pick that up. The drone footage uh, um, might show that. And then, of course, you would see people who are moving then suddenly become motionless. It becomes much, much easier to see what's going on. But the Israelis think that by releasing a few bits that they can kind of, you know, show, oh, look, we're being transparent. We're showing you what happened. We didn't do anything wrong. You should see the disaster on CNN. Look at this interview, how, how Amanpour uh, catches him in a lie and he doesn't know how to get out of it. I think the first question, if you could answer, is... Who were these aid, who, who was this aid being driven in by or for? The UN and the normal, you know, known aid agencies said that they had nothing to do with it. Do you know who it was? I know the following, that in order to help alleviate uh, the food shortage in Gaza, 
that we authorized in a convoy of, I think, some 30 trucks uh, entered uh, Gaza last night, headed for the northern Gaza Strip. And uh, uh, this shows that Israel is interested in seeing aid and foodstuffs reach the civilian population. Unfortunately, uh, 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 we saw a situation where there was a mass uh, casualty tragedy where it looked like the uh, civilians were storming the trucks. A mass casualty tragedy. What kind of fucked up English is that? You mean a massacre? Uh, uh, trying to, to, to take the food uh, um, out of desperation. Uh, and uh, and uh, people, uh, a, a crowd was pushing and shoving and, and people were killed. I can't tell you the exact numbers. I don't, as you know, don't trust the numbers put out by the Hamas-controlled Ministry of Health in Gaza. Uh, there were reports that maybe the drivers were, were driving over parts of the crowd. It, it, it appears to be... Oh, well, the, you know, you don't, you don't trust the Hamas numbers. That's excellent, right? Because you have your own drone footage, which, which we're looking at on the screen. So why don't, you, why don't you count them for us, then, if you don't trust the Hamas uh, ministry, right? I mean, I think we can all agree that that's, that's the easy solution, right? You don't trust them, then count it for us, would you? Or just give us the video. I'll count it myself. be a, a tragedy, but I can tell you Israel was not involved directly in any way. When you say not involved directly in any way, what do you mean? I mean, you enabled these convoy, this convoy, as you said, and your forces are there on the ground and open fire. They said it themselves. What does that mean, not in Joining me now is Mark Regev. He's special advisor to the Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. Welcome back to the program, Mark Regev. Um, as I said, there are disputed timelines. Either the shooting was first and then the stampede, or the stampede was first and then the shooting. But the facts are the facts. There are dead and injured. I think the first question, if you could answer, is who were these aid... Who, who was this aid being driven in by or for? The UN... And the normal, you know, known aid agencies said that they had nothing to do with it. Do you know who it was? I know the following, that in order to help alleviate uh, the food shortage in Gaza, that we authorized in a convoy of, I think, some 30 trucks uh, entered uh, Gaza last night, headed for the northern Gaza Strip. And uh, uh, this shows that Israel is interested in seeing aid and foodstuffs reach the civilian population. Unfortunately, uh, it, 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 we saw a situation where there was a mass uh, casualty tragedy where it, it looked like the uh, civilians were storming the trucks uh, uh, trying to, to, to take the food uh, um, out of desperation. Uh, and uh, and uh, people, uh, a, a crowd was pushing and shoving and, and people were killed. I can't tell you the exact numbers. I don't, as you know, don't trust the numbers put out by the Hamas-controlled Ministry of Health in Gaza. Uh, there were reports that maybe the drivers were, were driving over parts of the crowd. It, it, it appears to be a, a tragedy, but I can tell you Israel was not involved directly in any way. When you say not involved directly in any way, what do you mean? I mean, you enabled these convoy, this convoy, as you said, and your forces are there on the ground and open fire. They said it themselves. What does that mean, not involved in any way? So the, this was, we, well, we allowed the aid to come in. We were involved that way. That, that's our policy, to allow food to go into Gaza for the civilian population. But in the incident of people storming the trucks and the way the truck drivers behaved and, and people getting squashed and pressed and uh, uh, apparently be, there being a mass casualties, uh, Israel was not there on the ground. Okay, but they did open fire and people were killed. So I'm completely confused by what you're saying because they admitted, so the IDF spokesman said it, said it on our air, that's that they opened fire. That's a, that's a separate incident, okay. not connected to the tragedy with the trucks. Uh -huh. and that was that was, that was was different place, different time, right. in, in the general location, but not the same incident at all. And all right. I, have to, I have to tell you that we are not aware that the IDF fired caused casualties at all. Mm -hmm. Well, I can tell you that a journalist who CNN works with on the ground has a different view of it, but maybe there were other incidents. That, obviously, you say are, is under review, and we will hope to get further clarification. But here's the thing. So Israel is the only force in charge of security by your own announcements, by your own volition, by your own uh, actions over the last you know, five months or so there. It is, as everybody is saying, Israel's responsibility, therefore, if you let these trucks in, 
to provide security. And this obviously comes in the context of so little food going in that people are desperate, as we've heard from the international forces. So first, aren't you the only law enforcement people in the Gaza Strip right now? Unfortunately, Hamas has not yet been completely destroyed, and I okay. should have been clearer. In, that, in the first incident uh, of the truck being uh, swamped by civilians, there was gunfire, but it wasn't Israeli forces. There weren't Israeli forces on the trucks or around the trucks. Uh, that was Palestinian armed groups. We don't know if it was Hamas or other armed groups, but there definitely was fire. That we do know. Okay. So my question again is, Israel is the only law enforcement operation on the ground as you wage this war. Therefore, if you allow these trucks in, who do you expect to provide the security for them? Because every convoy needs security. I mean, I've covered this from, you know, time immemorial, back from Bosnia to Somalia and elsewhere. It all requires discipline, organization, and coordination, and uh, security. Who do you think should have been responsible for security in the convoy that you allowed in? So, so it, it's, it's a difficult question, and we're grappling it with, it with it, and we're talking to uh, the international community, to the aid organizations, to the United Nations, to other partners who are relevant in this conversation, because, of course, we want to see the aid safely uh, reach the people. Now, it's quite possible, as you know, Hamas has been stealing aid. That's been documented. We've heard people in Gaza complain about this. So is it possible that, uh, that people uh, in Gaza don't trust that this aid that, that, that the international community is giving to the people of Gaza is actually reaching the people of Gaza and not being siphoned off by the terrorists. That could be one of the reasons to explain what's going on. I mean, I told you it was going to get deep. That guy takes it deep, 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 deep. So within like 48 hours of all that good stuff happening, uh, the United States and King of Jordan and other people were dropping aid packages into Gaza. And it's a minor part of the story, but it's a good follow-up to the Killers of the Flower Massacre Moon because that whole situation didn't have to go down like that. And when he says Hamas are trying to get it, like Hamas is the government of those people. Why, like, So they're not just a terrorist organization. Uh, you know, That's only the Zionist definition of them. So there's a lot of Hasbara and a lot of bullshit, and we could get into what Elon Levy and a whole bunch of other people, Ben Gavir, uh, said about this thing. But it's a major event and a turning point in this five-month war because, like Gandhi said, if you want to end the oppression, you have to make the brutality visible to the rest of the world. And, you know, when all those countries are already voting on that side, all we have to do is make it visible to, like, the people on this side. This is the country that voted against it. If we don't create the media to show people the knowledge, to give them comparison and contrast, they're not going to have a chance to outgrow the Hasbara, to outgrow the Amtsprache, to outgrow the backing of genocide and ethnic cleansing, being on the wrong side of history. It seems pretty simple. Is it that complex? Is it complicated like they say, Tony? Uh, it's only complicated when people introduce lies. Ooh, a little Hasbara. I love how Amon Poor says things like, like, she's such a savvy journalist. You can learn a lot from watching her. I don't always agree with her, but I can always learn. She says things like, yes, but the thing is, she just nails that dude. And he's like stuttering the whole time. He was like, Amon and ah, he's not usually that Hamas, shaken. But like, it, not even the IDF spokesperson said anything about a, armed Hamas militants. I guess he just didn't get the memo, and so he was like, I just gotta make something up that sounds like it's Hamas. So they did I'll not attack the, the yeah, they didn't I'll attack the back. convoy. Right? He, he's made it clear they didn't attack the trucks. They attacked the people who come into the trucks for the food. Right. right? Just and these, he had to say yeah. they were provoked by these supposed militants and all this sort of nonsense and the fact that the, of course the video of was edited what's what a surprise you know we had this issue with the the rocket um you know what two or three months ago at the what rafa hospital not rafa hospital which i forget the al shifa the, there's many hospitals they hit them yeah all. that was yeah that one's done now but originally uh that remember that whole sequence of like trying yeah. to determine where the rocket was fired from and the fact yeah. that 
you look at the timestamp of the the video itself and the well, IDF they, side, and it was just what a mess, man. They show you like Hamas makes That's its own bad. rockets. Israel can't even make its own rockets. They're not even that creative. They just buy them from Uncle Sam. I mean, let's just face it. So, like, you got Uncle Sam 2,000-pound bombs coming over there. And you got some dudes making, like, fermented sugar fucking stuff you make in the backyard of science projects. Yeah. It's so like it's much big a deal. Book sort of stuff, you know? I'm not it's... saying it doesn't do damage when it makes it through the Iron Dome. I'm just saying it's not on the fucking same schedule. No, like it's, it's not, not the even same. the same game. It's not level. proportional. It's not proportional. I think we've heard that term. It's not like proportional. And in that it class, might be like a major league baseball team playing a little league team. That's not very good. Like the bad news bears. Yeah. It's that type of thing. That now, the other part that they analogy. try to make a big deal is Hamas numbers. Those are Hamas numbers. It's like that scene from Wolf of Wall Street where McConaughey's like, those are rookie numbers. Let's take the AI and let's get McConaughey to say, those are Hamas numbers. That would be hilarious. We want that for the soundboard. All right. So Hamas numbers. Why are they like, why does the BBC use Hamas numbers? Why does CNN use Hamas numbers? Why in the rest of the past wars for the past 60 years have they used like, or not, going back to the you know early 2000s, why have they used Hamas numbers? Because the IDF doesn't like keep to keep track accurately of the number of people they murder. It's bad for business. So they can always dispel it and say those are Hamas numbers. However, that guy claimed that they killed 12,000 Hamas militants. BB just claimed that they had killed 10,000 Hamas militants and he got debunked. So I'm pretty sure if they can't prove 10,000, they can't prove 12. I'm pretty sure that's how that math works. And because they make these claims that they know how many militants they kill, but they don't know how many civilians they kill, I call bullshit. I am not convinced. And when Wolf Blitzer in that clip said, he said the hate, the hate speech term, he said, what's your evidence? Did you hear him question the guy? As soon as those guys get their hands on, oh, we can say who, people who question the evidence and the, the like, what is the realism of the story? That's a hate crime now. Man, they've got it made. They already do that in Germany, by the way. No. If you were to say, what's the evidence on certain topics? They yeah. do like well, obviously the big ones one, too. Hol Holocaust denialism. Um, well, I don't know what is... you're talking about with that. I'm not saying I agree with. I'm just saying that I'm just. I'm, no, I'm literally saying that in Europe, there's a law against that. There is. So there hey, is yeah. a law, and I believe in Canada as well, and Florida, I think too. <laughs> well, we were supposed to have a First Amendment, but what what the American government has done is extradited those to the various countries that um, uh, are attempting or have prosecuted people who have supposedly violated that law. I don't know much about those details, though. It's, that was a long time ago researching that stuff and i never I, that's a rabbit hole that's not necessarily worth going down but nonetheless it does exist and it does sh it paints a very uh dubious picture as to why they would go to such great lengths to but i'm not quite i'm not quite it's just what do they have to hide in that regard i mean they're so nervous about everything i mean the way in which they spin these lies and the way in which people and immediately, immediately to go to the trope of anti-Semitic, anti-Semitic, anti-Semitic for almost anything. This is something Norman Finkelstein, again, his parents, uh, I believe, survived the Holocaust. He often would say that everything was just a um, ref uh, reference back to the hall. Every single tragedy, every single event at the dinner table, at the it becomes like a psychological traumatic event that just carries on and carries on and carries on. And just the 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 emotional weight of even just mentioning having someone you know, absurdly challenged the Holocaust, rightfully so, um, causes such an emotional dis distraught or such an emotional visceral reaction from collective Jewry that there's now laws and there has been for many decades now laws instantiated against that as sort of a, you know, as, as uh, sort of like a reflection or reaction, rather an emotional reaction to what they experienced. And so it's like, it's, and that's very damning because, you know, it, I'm not, it's not necessarily a, a, an indictment against the Holocaust necessarily itself, but it is show how much, how much they have not as a, as a, as a collective sort of religious identity and, 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 and the people have uh, found ways to, um, what's the word I'm looking for, but deal with that trauma in a constructive way. 
And instead, it's been very much seemingly projected over the past 70 years now on to the Palestine-Israel conflict um, the, or the Palestinian and West Bank situation with the occupied territories, rather. And I see a lot of like this this unprocessed trauma from what they experience and this projection of that and the, and the gaining control of, you know, making sure you can't talk about it in European nations and in America, making sure the politicians are very much controlled to all, you know, unilaterally seemingly support Israel, whether Democrat or Republican that we've seen over and over again. To me, it just harkens back to this unprocessed trauma. Um, and then the, the guilt that they, that keep they lay on that. Yes, generation they, after generation exactly. after generation at younger and younger ages at more and more hyperbolized stages. And then they so, project the guilt onto like the Germans and the other nations to say, OK, put laws in place and policies in place to make sure that no one questions again. this and never happens again. And like mm -hmm. even if it's coming from a legitimate place, it ends up having a, a worse effect to the ideas of debate, freedom, truth, honesty and 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 honest self-reflection on what causes these tragedies it doesn't and do how to mitigate justice them. to the victims of the Shoah. Correct. So to make sure that this Shoah keeps on the road, I want to point it out like this. In the past five months, have we or have we not noticed a pattern of claims that are severely hyperbolized later to found, find out they're not really what they were told to be. Something was there. And it shouldn't have been exaggerated because the something that's there was already like substantial enough. Correct. Right? Exactly. That might this have happened right. in the past. Am I allowed to ask? It's a, question a reasonable like that? question. It's a reasonable uh, question. How about this? Asking for a friend, what would it be like hypothetically if the Nazis had some sort of sophisticated self-protective mechanism that prevented them from being criticized for being Nazis. Would the Holocaust still be going on asking for a friend? Right? Because these are the things that you might consider once you understand what's unfolding on those Palestinians. That's why some people analogically associate the, um, the occupied territory since 19, really since 1948. And then obviously 1967 as being the largest and continuous open air concentration camp in history. So you're right, yes. it's been continuous over the course of decades and decades. If we look at it from that standpoint, obviously with the economic embargo in 2008 with the, the rise of Hamas, supported by the Likud party, and that pretty much, that to me is when it really becomes very conspicuous as being an open-air concentration camp. Yeah. All right, so the next uh, mini clip block, just to make sure it's in a time capsule, is uh, 2.5 million starving people could now fight over not aid trucks for the flower, but parachutes falling from the sky with 38,000 meals. Less meals than is made by the busiest McDonald's in the world, which I believe is Pushkin Square. I tweeted it earlier this week. So uh, again, not the most we could be doing as taxpayers. Like we just sent all those bombs to our side. Israel doesn't even want us sending aid because they don't want us keeping their enemy alive. Don't make 2.5 million people or 1.5 million people in this airdrop case fight over 38,000 meals. That's cruel and unusual punishment. And you're making them scurry for like packages from the sky while usually they get shot at. So it's it's like some sort of Hunger Games meets like the Running Men type of situation. But let's go ahead and take a look at this block and then we'll be right back because we got at least uh, to talk about two more stories, even if we can't cover them in full. The U.S. has joined an international operation to airdrop desperately needed supplies into Gaza. The Pentagon says three Air Force planes carried out the first drop of more than 35,000 meals. The Biden administration says Israel supports its intervention to bolster existing efforts by Jordan and other nations. The U.N. is warning that famine in Gaza is almost inevitable unless aid deliveries increase significantly. Our next report contains images that some viewers might find distressing. Consoling each other. The boys have survived an Israeli airstrike in central Gaza. Many others did not. But the fighting in the Gaza Strip isn't the only danger Palestinians face. Disease and famine have become a major threat. Children are most at risk. Starvation has now taken the lives of several children. 
So the official records yesterday or this morning said there was a 10th child officially registered in a hospital as having starved to death. Um, a very sad threshold, similar sad as the 30,000 deaths we reached all over Gaza. The, the unofficial numbers can unfortunately be expected to be higher. And the toll is climbing. Qatari network Al Jazeera broadcast this footage from Gaza City on Friday when scores of Palestinians were killed as they surrounded an aid convoy. The Hamas-run health ministry and survivors accused the Israeli army of opening fire on the crowd. Israel said limited shots were fired near the aid convoy, but insisted that most of the dead were trampled or run over by the aid trucks. A UN team has visited Al Shifa hospital on Friday. It reported having seen a large number of gunshot victims. The incident has amplified the demand for more aid to be delivered without delay. Neighboring Egypt and Jordan recently airdropped essential items in Gaza. Now, the U.S. says it will deliver humanitarian aid via parachute, while President Joe Biden pushes Israel to improve other routes. We're going to insist that Israel facilitate more trucks and more routes to get more and more people the, the help they need. No excuses, because the truth is, aid flowing to Gaza is nowhere nearly enough now. It's nowhere nearly enough. Innocent lives are on the line and children's lives are on the line. I and mean, we won't stand by and let until they until we get more aid in this reading. Biden has also signaled a ceasefire deal between Hamas and Israel could be reached soon, which many here hope would be a lifeline amid destruction and loss. Let's bring in Mike Martin. He's a war. I think they spent more money on Obama's hot dog party, according to Stratfor, than they paid on this drop. According to Stratfor, I think that was a pizza party. Well, they flew in pizza. <laughs> they flew in pizza and supposedly spent a half hour, you know, having special relationships with pizza. But that was Stratfor. Isn't this also weird, being the way that Hamas invaded with the the paragliders? be delivering food five months later and yeah, toned up it's one of the concepts we had explored a couple weeks ago so. a little bit like that so it's no different than a convoy it, they're running to the food packages the surprise surprise yeah because they're desperate and they're starving like any other human any human would do across but the world in a extreme circumstances they, they are. wouldn't wait for the food trucks to get to the parking lot therefore the idf shot them that makes sense. Yeah, something smells like a Trojan horse at that event. Yeah. See how much they can press uh, and get away with it to see if they can do it in a larger scale. That's that's what that whole event seems to be. Right, go ahead, cut the to theory. this next clip, LD. This is how America should look at this situation. We don't do anything illegal. You cannot take us to jail. If you are not involved, please go. Shalom, my friend. We bless you. You're in my country. You come to the United States, you can say whatever you want to say. That is a free world, yes? You're not in the United States. You're in Israel. I understand. You cannot say whatever you want to say here. Yes, you can. It's legal. It is legal to preach about Yeshua. We preach at Damascus Gate. The police said it's okay. 
We preach at Jaffa Gate, the police say it's okay. Please stop. I respect you, respect me. doesn't have to respect you. Huh? doesn't have to respect you. That is the right thing. Are you Jewish? Do you want to honor God? That is the godly thing to do. We respect one another. The godly thing to do is to kill you. The godly thing is to kill me. That's right. That's yes? what the Torah says. The Torah says to kill us. The Torah says that idol uh, people who worship idols such as yourself, when there is a Sanhedrin, to kill us. Yes. Okay. That's what the Torah so says. So we know how the Jewish people feel about Christians, yes? That you Christians discriminate are, against Christians. Christians are idol worshippers. You discriminate the against Torah Christians. The Torah says that Christianity is idol worship. Let me Bro, for the record, uh, this here uh, Oscar thing is an idol, too. You might want to talk idol, to some of your folks about it. Idol worshippers. Jesus there. Christ. Man. I mean, it is. I mean, that is true. Oh, it, sorry. I mean, was that but it's like the pot calling the kettle black. I mean, it's like, well, okay. Uh, what as the As the guy at the garage in Ferris Bueller's day off before he stole the Ferrari said, uh, whatever man <laughs> yeah that's yeah, exactly <clears throat> these appeals to religion i think i've done we've done enough over the past couple weeks you know showcasing the dubious nature of all religions but particularly uh the abrahamic faiths in regards to their historical historical claims not talking about maybe the deeper concepts that can be or the a historicity of their claims it is extreme a historicity mm. extreme it's more extreme like just enough to kill people over mythology and nothing else and mostly appropriated from sumerian and babylonian angry mythology. harvest god said what yeah right exactly he owes you land okay all right so uh there's and the romans uh, rewrote it and said there's a jesus here and they so turn the other cheek and make sure the romans get what they get oh, sorry. the 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 time has come in this episode episode oh, the time has come in this episode at 5 a.m to make tough choices about what to include in this episode so two major stories that we have left we got to flip a coin i flipped the coin and i went with uh the story that i'm not going to tell you about right this second so the story i'm going to tell you about right this second uh we started covering it last week it was the aaron bushnell story so uh Israeli soldiers drag eight-year-old from home. That was just context from a couple of years ago for the story of why someone like that might feel that way. War for profit. Ryan Dawson on Judge Napolitano. Uh, he talks about it at the end of the inter interview. Uh, Gray Zone also talks about it in a critical way, not praising it. So we're not going to praise it. We're not even going to give it uh, story time, but we're going to tell you about the stories that were worth checking into if you're interested. Uh, Aaron Bushnell's Protest reflects a deeper crisis in U.S. military. Breakthrough news. That was interesting uh, coverage. And then genocide, genocide denial streamers by Noah Sampson is a clip. It's hard to watch. It goes on for about a half hour. We had it queued up and we were going to play a few minutes of it. but We don't have time for this uh, tonight's time capsule. It's for anyone who doesn't think there's genocide going on. He shows you all the official sources and evidence and it's there kind of as his support of saying uh, Aaron Bushnell is pointing out something's wrong and was trying to get someone's attention. We may disagree with how he went about it, but there's a lot of evidence to the claim. And there's also like downside to his story other than uh, how he went out. You know, he's a collectivist communist supporter and such. And he's part so of a bunch of, it's either him or the other one part of, communist and or and or anarchist groups seems to be and ideologically sort of imbued with of uh, this this a lot of these idea this idea of sort of misappropriation of guilt if you will and so it's it's a messy story i hate to say it like that it's it's unfortunately uh it's not it's there's a lot of gray to that story it's not right which is why i would recommend these clips and you can go check it out on your own time and these will be yeah. provided in the the show notes but uh our next block is going to cover many of the hyperbolized or straight out fictional claims made on 10 after 10 7 as a result of 10 7 in uh defense of their self-defense in their defense of ethnic cleansing in their defense of the apartheid in the defense of the genocide ongoing many of these claims have crumbled under scrutiny and it's i mean i guess it's fortunate that not, there wasn't p like smashed pelvises Oh, pelvises uh, and the the breasts thrown around like footballs and all these other things that were made up by Zaka and other groups that hopefully we'll get a couple minutes to like give you a little insight into where these things are coming from and who what agenda is being pushed by these people 
But uh, Gray Zone, as usual, did the muckraking, started getting some good sources together. Mondo Vice also had some calling attention to like, hey, can these things really be going on? And then uh, as things turn out, as it trickles downhill, Democracy Now! and The Intercept get great big stories out of things that, you know, Max Blumenthal and Aaron Maté worked hard to figure out on their own. And independent journalism doesn't always get credited the way it should. But on the flip side, we're at the upper end of the stream. We have to wait for it to go downstream to reach bigger audiences. But the people who actually read the books, do the research, call attention to these things in a smaller production value way are what inspires like intercepts just waiting around to catch big stories that other people are just, <laughs> right. Caitlin Johnstone had uh, this great quotes, basically like, you know, it's edgy to steal from the gray zone and like the, the intercept doing this is it's an homage. Cause like mimicry is like the, the sincerest form of flattery type of thing. Right. And it's not, it's also because they don't have the skills to do it. And then they kind of like wait for someone else to figure it out. And they're like, Oh, look, look at this. And, uh, you know, many such cases out there of those sort of things. I just like, like in the past week, things that I've been saying for years are not getting out there. Did they hear it from me? No. But that fact is now out there in the public. Now we have that in our public narrative and conversation that these are real things that can now be talked about among people so we can understand and get our liberty back and get some peace in this world. Because we're not going to solve the problems of this war Unless we understand, like we're not going to get to the peace if we don't understand the mechanisms of the war and who's doing it and for what, what purposes they might be doing it. So the first story we're going to go to, we're going to do credit where credit is due. Let's go to the gray zone and then I'll show you the, like the shined and polished, like uh, presentation of democracy now and the intercept and Ryan Grimm's going to make an appearance, but we don't, mm. we don't include him in tonight's episode, but I did leave Jeremy Scahill because he does interesting work from time to time, and uh, it's worth considering. But again, credit goes Max Blumenthal, Aaron Mate, Gray Zone, yeah. muckraking yeah, journalists. Job. Not doing an easy job out there. It's a very thankless job, but it's also very important. Yeah, think how much work it was for them to have to go and find out all the uh, um, <clears throat> false accusations associated with the rapes and whatnot. He had to go and you know uh, and try to audit all of those claims and that was yeah they're very know, that, serious. the new york times and i forget the specific author but the new york times i think it's been since retracted studious they're like very that. studious yeah. and they serious academics and they are a not kidding you'll get that pun in yeah, a few they minutes. are definitely not kidding a not kidding a not schwartzing no let's let's check out the uh the story from a not schwartz and the idf intelligence unit within the new york times Sound the truth. Well, there's a new update in the uh, fraud of a story that the New York Times put out in late December, uh, accusing Hamas of weaponizing sexual violence on October 7th. And as we showed at the Gray Zone and as Electronic Intifada showed with their reporting and Mondo Weiss as well, and other voices, uh, this story was a fraud. It was a complete fraud. Uh, there's no forensic evidence to support any of the claims and the claims from the witnesses are all undermined by either their own statements or the available evidence. And our reporting, our debunking of the story led to a major controversy. It forced people at the times to confront the fact that their paper had put out a fraud. And this fraud was clearly done to whitewash the Israeli genocide to, to, to justify, to, you know, serve as a justification for the genocide, because how could we possibly have a ceasefire with these uh, rapists from Hamas and also to distract from the actual real crimes unfolding before our eyes with our support. And the latest in this came when a Twitter user who uh, is known as Z squirrel. It's an anonymous account, but who has been very, very vocal in speaking out against this story. Um, pointed out that one of the authors of it, uh, whose name is Anat Schwartz, liked posts on Twitter calling for Gaza to be turned into a slaughterhouse, uh, among many other such posts. Um, Zizkar also revealed that this person had no journalistic experience. Uh, and I mean, there's many more revelations about her conduct, which we can go through. She but... also liked posts repeating the 40 beheaded babies hoax. And... Uh... Yeah, 
This was by the Israeli Foreign Ministry. She liked it. <laughs> 40 babies murdered. I remember blowing this one out of the water at the time. And yeah, so it's the, funny. I actually looked into Anat Schwartz's background much more superficially because I, I was more focused on exposing the contents of the article, all of the demonstrably false testimonies, the dubious witnesses who are changing their story again and again, the lack of evidence, along with Jeffrey Gettleman, the lead author's own background as someone who's previously fabricated quotes and had been caught doing it. So I just saw that Anat Schwartz had identified herself on Instagram on her bio as storyteller. <laughs> and she had some kind of presence in the like liberal Zionist scene in Tel Aviv. But uh, among many liberal Zionists, they turned genocidal after October 7th. So this isn't surprising. She needs to address why she liked these posts. And that hasn't happened yet. And I would think that the easiest excuse would be um, and, I, and, I, and I assume that like they're not so stupid that they haven't thought of this, that a not Schwartz would just say, well, <clears throat> I was liking them as a placeholder uh, for a future investigation. But uh, I don't know if that's plausible. A not Schwartz also happens to be a former military intelligence in Israel, someone who works for Israel's public broadcaster, Khan News is just deeply embedded in Israeli society, shares the anxieties and yes, the genocidal zombie-like racism of so many Jewish Israelis. And why did the New York Times hire her? Because she was a gateway to the witnesses that they wanted to compel into participating. Actually, I uh, think it's important to point this one out. I, I don't have it in the notes, so I'm pulling it up. Um, but one of the key figures in this Jeffrey Gettleman hoax investigation uh, was interviewed by Ynet. Yeah, here it is. Was interviewed by Ynet, the Israeli, well, like Israel's most popular newspaper. And they were the person who filmed the so-called girl in the black dress, Gal Abdush, uh, who had been found dead in a state of rigor mortis with her dress kind of, small dress kind of hiked up um, with burns on her head next to her destroyed car. An image, interestingly, the New York Times didn't show in their article, but they wanted this video so they could do some kind of open source investigation into it and try to prove their claim, which was then discounted by family members of Gal Abdush in public, that she had been raped by Hamas. And so I think this is more scandalous even than a not Schwartz liking genocidal rants. This is the translation. How did they reach you from the New York times? <clears throat> this is the video, the person who shot, shot the video through the Instagram story. They called me again and again and explained how important it is to Israeli Hasbara. They really invested in it. It was important for them to know every detail, blah, blah, blah. In other words, Anat Schwartz, an Israeli former military intelligence officer working in Israeli media, hired by the New York Times to do Jeffrey Gettleman's legwork, was telling other Israelis that they need to go ahead with this story to help Israel's Hasbara, meaning help Israel make the case for its genocidal assault in Gaza. That to me is the scandal of this latest chapter in the exposure of this bogus investigation as one of the worst acts of journalistic malpractice since Judith Miller's reports on WMD for the New York Times. And according to Ryan Grimm of The Intercept, uh, the New York Times is cutting ties with, I'm not Schwartz, uh, but I predict that the accountability will stop there. They're not going to retract that scam of an article that she worked on, even though we now have confirmation that she did it with the clear aim of helping Israeli Hasbara and played a key role in the story. Um, Gettleman relied on her so-called reporting. Yeah. Um, the Daily Beast has reported she's under investigation. I believe what Ryan's saying here. Um <clears throat> 
he previously got some sources in the New York Times to reveal that the New, <clears throat> the New York Times had canceled its daily podcast uh, as the result of internal staff uproar and fallout. Well, he, he didn't say it directly. He should have credited us, but because of the work we've been doing, they saw that the article was bogus. So yeah, you're right, Aaron. It's a completely superficial response. The response should be actually to punish Jeffrey Gettleman, the lead author, and New York Times leadership. There should be fallout at the leadership level because they've been protecting this investigation. They authorized it, and they are the they are pro-Israel. They're objectively pro-Israel. Yeah. So what we're seeing here is something that reminds me of the Abu Ghraib scandal when this poor girl from West Virginia who got caught up in it as a prison guard at Abu Ghraib, Lindy England, got blamed for the entire Bush administration's on the like on paper torture policy. And that's what they're gonna do with Anat Schwartz. And then they're gonna keep the piece up, which should be retracted. There's not gonna be a serious investigation. This is like James Fry level forgery. This is like, one of the great journalistic scandals of our times at, of our time. And one of the reasons why they're able to protect and insulate themselves at the New York times is because everybody else did it. Everybody else got in the act. The guardian did it. Yeah. The Washington post did it. Remember the Washington post headline testimony after testimony shows mass rape on October 7th there. And then the testimony didn't show that it was, and then they're sharing all the same testimony. Haaretz did it. Yeah. I think that was a Haaretz headline. Haaretz did it, attacked us, and then, you know, in bits and pieces showed that it wasn't, there was no evidence. Yeah. The Nation magazine, a columnist of the Nation magazine called us, called you and I rape denialists. Uh, the Intercept um, parroted the, the sexual violence claim, said it was, said that even that some activists were celebrating as justified resistance. It's just ridiculous. And of course, fake um fake. but I, you know i, I want to correct something this was on democracy now today in reporting on the intercept uh reporting that the times is investigating a story the democracy now described this uh, gettleman's article as widely criticized it wasn't widely criticized it was widely parroted yep. it was narrowly criticized by a small group of niche <laughs> independent journalists us electronic intifada mondo weiss there also was that statement from a, a Middle Eastern feminist collective. I forgot the exact name, but that came out pretty much immediately too. Uh, Mehdi Hassan others, promoted the article. Uh, I, Mehdi, I'm not surprised to hear that. Uh, Peter Beinhart. Peter support, Beinhart promoted the article. article. Um, people like that did. So it wasn't widely criticized. It was widely parroted. And a few of us who take you know, our job seriously as independent journalists, we debunked it because we're not intimidated by stories like this, which is in the most cynical way, weaponizing one of the most sensitive allegations you can lodge was the sexual violence. But it was such a transparent scam that, you know, uh, it was easy to debunk. And um, anyway, not that I expect to be credited for it, but just, you, it's, you can't say it was widely criticized. It was, it was widely parroted. And people, unfortunately, too many people sat on the sidelines and just didn't step forward to debunk it. I think because they were intimidated by the gravity uh, of the allegation and the consequences that you get when you challenge Iraq WMD esque scams like this. Yeah. Uh, it, it instantly screamed God, WMD deception, but as and it came after. This is democracy. Now democracy now.org the war and peace report. I'm Amy Goodman. The New York times is reportedly conducting an internal investigation to identify the source behind leaked information about its coverage of Israel and Gaza. According to Vanity Fair, the internal investigation follows a report in The Intercept about the Times shelving an episode of its podcast, The Daily, over doubts regarding the accuracy of a highly controversial blockbuster New York Times article published at the end of December alleging Hamas members committed widespread sexual violence, weaponized it on October 7th. Vanity Fair reports that in recent weeks, management of The New York Times have questioned at least two dozen staffers, including producers of The Daily, the podcast, in an attempt to understand how internal details about the podcast's editorial process got out. 
Democracy Now! asked The New York Times about the internal investigation. The paper's international editor statement, quote, we aren't going to comment on internal matters. I can tell you the work of our newsroom requires trust and collaboration, and we expect all of our colleagues to adhere to these values, end quote. The New York Times article at the center of the controversy was published December 28th. It was headlined, Screams Without Words, How Hamas Weaponized Sexual Violence on October 7th. In it, The Times reported they had found evidence of systematic sexual violence orchestrated by Hamas, and that their two-month investigation, quote, uncovered painful new details establishing that the attacks against women were not isolated events, but part of a broader pattern of gender-based violence, October 7th, unquote. However, not long after the highly publicized article was published, major discrepancies began to emerge, including public comments from the family of a major subject of the article, contradictory claims from a key witness, and criticisms over a lack of solid evidence in the overall investigation. Then news emerged last week that one of the three authors of The New York Times piece, named Anat Schwartz, had liked multiple posts on social media advocating for violence against Palestinians, including one that called for turning Gaza into a slaughterhouse. Anat Schwartz is an Israeli filmmaker who had no prior reporting experience before she was assigned by The Times to work on the major investigation, along with Adam Sella and veteran Times reporter Jeffrey Gettleman. On Wednesday, The Intercept published another in-depth investigation that further questions The Times article and the reporting process behind it. It's headlined, Between the Hammer and the Anvil, the story behind The New York Times' October 7th expose. And the two Intercept reporters who wrote it join us today. Jeremy Scahill is a senior reporter and correspondent at The Intercept. He's joining us from Germany. And Ryan Grimm is The Intercept's bureau chief in Washington, D.C., where he joins us from. We welcome you both to Democracy Now! Jeremy, let's begin with you. Can you lay out first the significance of the New York Times article that's at the center of the controversy, and then talk about your latest piece that looks into how it all came about? Well, Amy, in early December, uh, you had the death toll skyrocketing in Gaza. You had uh, a number of nations, including those that are allies with Israel, starting to speak out about uh, the death toll among uh, women, children, the elderly. Um, and part of a pattern of what we've seen uh, throughout the course of these five months of scorched earth attacks against Gaza is that whenever Israel perceives itself to be losing the narrative war, or when it needs to uh, remind the public uh, of its perception that Israel is the only victim in this story, um, they unload a new round of, uh, of attacks against a, a variety of, uh, of individuals uh, or organizations that um, are working in Gaza or living in Gaza, human beings. Um, we saw that with the uh, attacks against UNRWA, uh, we saw that with the attacks against Al Shifa and other hospitals. And in early December, uh, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu and his government really began an intense propaganda campaign uh, to convince the world that Hamas um, had engaged in a systematic campaign of rape aimed at Jewish women uh, and girls. And then they launched this, uh, this fake criticism of uh, feminist organizations, saying that they had all systematically failed to stand up and denounce this um, systematic rape regime that had been intentionally implemented by Hamas in the October 7th attacks. And on the day that Netanyahu made his most prominent uh, statement about this, uh, President Biden was at a fundraising event in Boston. And he issued, he uh, made a statement uh, at his speech that echoed what Netanyahu said and said the world, you know, can't turn away and, and ignore this. Um, well, what was happening uh, at that very moment was that the New York Times, with one of its most prominent international correspondents, Jeffrey Gettleman, he had recently um, uh, hit the ground in Israel, and um, he was working. Gettleman uh, enlisted the help of two individuals um, that were going to work with him there, and Gettleman had proposed three uh, lines of investigation, and one of them was uh, sec the issue of sexual violence. And the two individuals that Gettleman was uh, working with 
Um, one of them is a, a very young person who's uh, only recently gotten into journalism, Adam Sella. And he had uh, mostly been like a food journalist and has a background in looking at agricultural issues, et cetera. He had started to uh, write some freelance pieces that were dipping into the waters of, uh, of politics and the, and the conflict, but uh, a, a quite inexperienced reporter. And then the other was someone with no reporting experience outside of making some uh, documentary films, and that is Anat Schwartz. Um, it's unclear uh, how Anat Schwartz in particular um, got involved with this project. And as you mentioned, she had early on in the uh, Israeli attacks against Gaza um, liked a, a tweet that actually was cited by the International Court of Justice um, as a potentially uh, a statement of potential genocidal um, incitement. She also liked a tweet from the Israeli government uh, promoting the uh, debunked uh, uh, allegation that 40 babies had been beheaded on October 7th, which uh, is entirely false, um, as well as another tweet that said we must uh, just refer to Hamas as uh, as ISIS. Um, and so they they start off on this investigation. And our understanding from sources is that the overwhelming majority of the interviews and reporting that was being done on the ground was being handled by um, Anat Schwartz and Adam Sella. And we uh, we discovered a, a podcast interview with Anat Schwartz in Hebrew uh, that she gave, where she it's a shocking um, a podcast in how much detail she offers about the process that they used when they were reporting it. Um, and just to to put it in a nutshell, she describes how uh, the first thing that she did was start to call around to uh, what she describes as all of the Israeli hospitals that have facilities that are called room four facilities. These would be the, the intake places uh, where people uh, who have been victims of uh, sexual uh, crimes, including assault and rape, uh, et cetera, uh, where they would be examined or their cases would be referred. And she said that not a single one of them uh, reported that they had any reports of sexual uh, assault or rape on October 7th. Uh, she then um, started calling around to uh, rape crisis hotline and describes how uh, she had this, what she described as an intense conversation with the manager of the rape crisis hotline in that part of Israel, where she was dumbfounded when he was saying he didn't have any calls reporting sexual assault or rape. And uh, she's saying, how is this possible? And um, then she starts talking, she goes to a holistic a uh, therapeutic center that was established um, at a, a former high-end retreat center outside of Tel Aviv, um, where mostly people from the Nova rave, uh, where there were uh, attacks and where a couple of hundred people were, were killed. It was a place where people could do alternative medicine and yoga, relaxation therapy. I mean, people who were highly traumatized. And she goes there, and her characterization was that she sensed what she called a conspiracy of silence among the therapists, because none of them were, were telling her, yes, we're treating people who were raped or had um, experienced sexual assault. And, and so when she went through all the official channels, the places where you would reach out to see if you're, if you're exploring, if there's a pattern here, what, what then happened is she starts to uh, look at who's been interviewed about alleged rapes during the October 7th attacks and ends up then going and re-interviewing a handful of people who already had made assertions that they witnessed uh, rapes. And some of these people uh, had told varying versions of their stories, which in and of itself is not necessarily mean that they didn't witness something. I mean, these are people that were in the midst of an incredibly violent episode. Um, but more central to that is that some of the people that the New York Times relied on to assert that there was a systematic, intentional campaign of rape weaponized by Hamas were people that have no forensic credentials, no crime scene credentials. Uh, these were people that um, are not legally uh, permitted in Israel to determine rape, um, that they relied on these individuals to make this claim uh, that, um, that there was a systematic rape regime implemented. And some of those people, Amy, um, have well-documented track records of promoting very incendiary narratives about uh, atrocities that occurred on October 7th that were flagrantly false. Just two examples. One of the, the most prominent or ubiquitous figures that has emerged in Israel's narrative that Hamas committed systematic rape is an architect from New Jersey named Sherry Mendez, who is living in Israel now and is a, a member of the Israeli Defense Forces rabbinical unit 
Um, and she was deployed to uh, prepare women's bodies for burial uh, in, in, in the bases where Hamas attacked military facilities. Um, and she's been quoted widely saying that they saw widespread evidence of, of rapes, uh, rape and that she personally saw it. She described um, broken pelvises, um, not just among uh, you know, soldiers, but among grandmothers and children. Um, but Sherry Mendez also uh, was quoted by the Daily Mail as saying that a pregnant woman had a fetus cut out of her body and that the fetus was beheaded and then the mother was beheaded. Um, this is entirely false. Uh, we've gone through all of the official uh, records that Israel has put out on people who died that day. There was no pregnant woman um, killed that day. That's been thoroughly debunked. Um, she also relied on Yossi Landau, a senior official at Zaka. Zaka has, uh, Zaka has been, it's an ultra-Orthodox private rescue organization. Um, it's been exposed by Haaretz, the newspaper in Israel, as one of the leading promoters of false information um, and also uh, that they contaminated the crime scenes by moving um, evidence around that actual professionals could have done. They also have promoted the beheaded baby stories, et cetera. So the New York Times, they can't find anyone uh, who works in the rape crisis centers, at the hospitals, among therapists um, that are, are coming forward and saying, yeah, we, we saw this or we have documentation of this. So they go to people who already were known to have promoted false information, and then they start relying on their testimony to paint this tapestry, this notion that there was a systematic rape regime. And in the New York Times article, they do not ever disclose that their key witnesses um, have serious credibility problems. Um, so this is, at a minimum, we are looking at a New York Times piece that uh, failed to inform its readers about severe credibility issues uh, among some of its premier witnesses, quote unquote, that it put forward in the I wanted story. to go. Okay, so let's bring it full circle. Let me ask this question, asking for a friend, of course. Uh, could this war have gone on for five months as it has without a ceasefire if those claims about 10-7, about the rapes, the beheaded babies, all these things weren't in circulation, wide circulation among the people supporting the war? If you took away those lies, would they still support the war? And if not, now you know why those lies are there. a little bit more to that story he mentioned zaka and candace owens had uh, written something here about hollywood and child abuse and i said speaking of look at these two articles in the zaka founder as related to the research of Aaron Maté and Max Blumenthal et al. on the origins of the hyperbolized claims 40 beheaded babies etc of 10-7 an investigation into the numerous allegations of rape and sexual assault against the founder of Zaka. So the people making the accusations that the Hamas did it, they actually do these things themselves. So let's open up that tab. And let's open up that tab. We're going to take a look at these stories. Before suicide attempt, Zaka founder was said to have faced arrest within days. For what? An investigation into the numerous allegations of rape and sexual assault against the founder of Zaka. So this emergency service is providing the false evidence to the public, lapped up false accusations of Hamas weaponizing sex, when in fact he practices and maybe they practice these things themselves. Here's another article. Founder of Zaka Relief Service. Dies at 61. He attempted suicide last year after accusations of rape and pedophilia surfaced in daily high rats. What's this one? If you look here, there's a whole bunch of stories on this. If we go over here, here's Mondo Vice. Zaka is not a trustworthy source for the allegations of sexual violence on October 7th. Zaka is one of the leading organizations alleging Hamas atrocities on October 7th, but the organization's volunteers have systematically given false testimonies and continue repeating them to journalists on behalf of the Israeli government. So without Zaka, would uh, all those people be starving right now? All those children be going without food and sustenance? Intercept says, American media keeps citing Zaka though it's October 7th atrocity stories are discredited in Israel, right? So there's there's a lot of news on this topic 
that people really aren't out there taking for consideration before they vote for unconditional support, kill them all for, you know, all these things that we've played in the clips over the past many, 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 many weeks. What did you think of that uh, last salvo there, Tony? Yeah, it was, um, you know, I'm, again, really uh, appreciative of of Max and Aaron and their diligence and the work they've put in to exposing, uh, and not just, obviously, then also the work of The Intercept, um, you know, to help expose this even further and show get into a little bit of the, in, the potential intent, intentions of these individuals, who they are, you know, do some general grammar of these and these authors that you know supposedly did this research into the mass rapes and all this sort of stuff and doing a more than thorough debunking because it's probably going to be something that's going to have to be referenced in the future um as people sort of look back on in these you know on this event sort of or these events in hindsight uh with hopefully a more objective lens and can see the conspicuous Hasbara uh for what it was and actually be able to provide uh you know, better understanding and commentary on it right now. I think, unfortunately, to Max's point, they, I mean, the article basically what they're going to do is they're going to straw man what was her name, Nina something. They're going to straw man her, tear her down, oh, uh, keep the keep the article up, and not and so, Schwartz, yeah, and not Schwartz. They're yeah. make they're making her a scapegoat. They're making and her it's a scapegoat Gettleman on who's purpose. making her a scapegoat. Oh, my mom. And that way they can keep the the most important thing is for the ignorant individuals on many there are more than many like that article still up they'll see it they'll still believe it even if they read it six eight nine months later and that's the goal the goal is to keep the article up just quietly discredit one of the authors and walk away so therefore it's there's something always there that makes it seem like those claims were justified when in fact they aren't and it's been thoroughly debunked but how would you know that? You know, Max Blumenthal and the Gray Zone aren't exactly going to be the first hits on a search engine. So no, they don't have the production budget that like the Intercept has because they got like the Intercept. Ryan, might get, be, Ryan that Grimm gets be, it right. from Pierre Omidyar. That's yeah. Intercept, and then he like Jimmy Dore explained it one time. Like Ryan gets checks from three different billionaires. That's how he rolls. Bezos is one of them, and uh, there was another one I forget. It doesn't matter right now. Jimmy had a but, field day with good old Ryan back in the day during COVID. The other thing is the lead author is on, on those stories is uh Pulitzer prize winning author, Jeffrey Gettleman, who is the guy in the clip. If you watch the extended clips of any of those, you'll see the clip of him on the panel. And he says, uh, it's, we don't really need evidence. We're journalists. We don't look for evidence. We just report what people tell us. And then everyone has a shit fit over like, what are you talking about, bro? So there's a whole bunch of clips on those. We don't have time to put into this show, but we do have one last little, commentary to like put a shine and polish on the whole topic we have jimmy Dore, and he just found out that the new york times hired fake journalists to spread hamas propaganda and it might be a little bit funny and then we'll come back we'll close out the show but uh i just thought since we got this far let's get this last clip into the time capsule for this week because this is an evergreen show it's in a world-class education on the ongoings of the week and uh, if you watch it in the future, you will be severely educated on the ongoings and you'll understand what happened before you uh, started paying attention. All right, let's go to this clip with Jimmy Dore and uh, Kurt Metzger's there too. So you remember, you remember the story we did about the New York Times? They did a front page story and it's the headline we gave it was New York Times lied about October 7th rape story because they lied about it. Uh and they said we don't need evidence i mean you got to give them to him on that at least right yeah, I, I think it's been borne out repeatedly so here's the story here's the story uh screams without words sexual violence on october 7th uh screams without words sexual violence on any without any actual victims <laughs> Really so not. what happened was is that at the is the person they said was raped their family came back and said no they weren't no she wasn't yeah it wasn't and Hamas debunking it the family who the said family, why are you just throwing the family our daughter yes. was raped by the way the paper of record lied about an October seventh rape story well if you can't even believe the paper that has lied us into every major war in the last <laughs> one hundred years that I'm just <laughs> like you know, wait they got this one wrong wow. Uh, this is an important story. Of course, they got it wrong. So, 
Now, the people to the story here is the people who wrote this story, a front page story at New York Times. This is like their first foray into journalism. They got to write it on the front page of the New York Times. So that's the scandal here. So here, I'll show you. It says, the Screams Without Words New York Times article co-authored by Anat Schwartz about mass rape has been systematically debunked by many. How did Anat, who had no journalism experience, and her 24-year-old co-author, <laughs> Adam Sella, her <laughs> nephew by marriage, right. come to lead a front-page investigation? That's the question here. Um, what do you think, Kurt? You think... <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I, uh, it's a hate crime I to think ask. maybe she used the Schwartz. <laughs> Focus your feelings. Let the Schwartz flow through you. So, Asha K caught this. She said, "Excellent question. How did Anat, who had no journalism experience, and her 24-year-old co-author Adam Stella, her nephew by marriage, come to lead a front-page investigation?" I will try to answer. Her first article in the New York Times was on November 14th, 2023. Uh, Are you saying she's a not even a reporter? <laughs> <laughs> so M Mundo Weiss did a story on this. And here's what they say. The latest questions are centered around Anat Swartz, an Israeli who co-authored several of the paper's most widely circulated reports, including the now well-known and scrutinized December 28th article headline, Screams Without Words. How... So, boy, this really is, leaves me with that feeling of uh, having just bought a DVD player on 42nd Street from a guy that said, Sony Guts. Yes. So first, she has apparently never been a reporter, but is actually a filmmaker who the Times suddenly hired in October, right after October 7th. A, t a filmmaker in Israel. Yes. So that's like a gangster rapper in Sri Lanka. Who gives a shit? You would expect the paper to look for someone with actual journalistic experience, especially Why? for a story as sensitive as this one, written during the fog of war. Surely the paper had enough of its own correspondents on staff who could have been assigned to it. Yeah, but none of them... And take your nephew and go and make an article for the paper. <laughs> Bring your cousin, let him help. She doesn't need to be a, a reporter. She was a filmmaker. Her. Yeah, when this when that doesn't work out, I'm sure Disney will hire her to direct an, another three hundred million dollar film for them. Just do it. Make it do your films and make a rape story for the paper and bring your nephew to help. Next, the reason this is unbelievable. This is a front page of the New York Times. Could they be more discredited? Next, the researchers found that Swartz had not hidden her strong feelings online. There are screenshots of her liking certain posts that repeated that the 40 beheaded baby hoax story and that endorsed another hysterical post that urged the Israeli army to turn Gaza into a slaughterhouse. As if it isn't. As Boy, if it isn't. I'm just glad Barry Wise already resigned from the New York Times and didn't have to, <laughs> and didn't have to write this herself. This ethical dilemma which I'm sure she would have said, I can have to step down after this and, and story that sounds like a chain letter. So she liked, she liked stories that said, turn guys into a slaughterhouse and called Palestinians human animals. Well, that's nice. Well, that's nice. That's nice. Uh, just this morning, more evidence emerged online. Swartz apparently also serves in the Israeli military intelligence. She's doing very well. She's in the intelligence, and she's writing the rape stories for the paper with her nephew. She was born in Haffa and grew up in Ramal Afel. I don't know what that is. She graduated from Thelma Yellen High School of the Arts, majoring in lying in theater and served in the IDF in Air Force Intelligence. She does a lot of secret stuff she's not supposed to talk about. Wow. But I said, take Joe, take Joey with you and do, uh, do the thing with him. He definitely put the sad in Mossad. <laughs> uh, let's pause here. What? This is what Bondaway says. Let's pause here. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. Pausing. There's a picture of a blowjob. There's a picture of a... <laughs> What would happen if the Times suddenly hired a Palestinian filmmaker with no journalistic background who had recently published liked posts, publicly liked posts that called for pushing Israel Jews into the sea to co-write several of its most sensitive and contested reports? Well, I don't think anything about that. Michael Rappaport believes they do that, probably. Uh, if anything, they're against Israel. 
I will we don't have well, Kurt. The good news is we don't have to speculate. Oh. The Times fired Palestinian photojournalist Hossam Salam in 2022 after one of the pro-Israel media watchdog groups protested about his social media posts. After Anat Swartz's online history became public, she locked down her accounts and then deleted much of the incriminating content. That'll work. I think that'll work, right? The old tale of Lorenz? The old tale. Come on. Come on. It really is crazy when I think about the amount of, like, I definitely felt and felt no guilt or, like, I'm bad for feeling it of, you know, these Muslims are, like, kind of primitive. They do kind of crazy shit like that. And then all of a sudden you notice, oh, I know some real similar stuff coming from my pals that I'm against these other people with. Real similar. Real similar. Sometimes much worse. Here's what Mondo Weiss says. The New York Times imposes strict rules on its reporters to maintain the the appearance of objectivity. The keyword there, the appearance. Not actual objectivity, but the appearance. Do they word it that way? That's how they worded it. Or does well, DB yeah. the New York Times word it? They call it their style book, I bet. Reporters are not supposed to attend demonstrations of any kind, wear campaign buttons, or post opinions on social media. By hiring Anat Swartz, the paper clearly violated its own guidelines, and it should publicly explain and apologize. Wow. Well, um, let me guess. A family member owns something at the New York Times, and it's ne- seeing as, as her and her nephew teamed up for this one, I'm guessing there's some more family members involved. Uh. So Esha K does it. She goes in 2017, Anat directed a documentary that was originally titled Dream Israel, but later changed to La Promise. <laughs> La Promise. La Promise. La uh, the ups hey, and you downs. know, uh, when I was 19 years old on a St. Patrick's Day, I got hammered and directed traffic. Can I now write an article on the front page of the New York Times? Well, that depends. What's your last, what's your last name? I'm as qualified as Annette Schwartz is. But are you qualified? She apparently joined <laughs> Vault AI in 2020, which just seems like a data mill and uh, it's a clickbait place. Okay. Wait, Vault AI has the technology to uncover Hollywood's secret sauce. Is this about Epstein? <laughs> of course, her our, and she's joined an in artificial intelligence. Her intelligence is artificial. After Vault AI, she did a short film in 2022, Soviet Life, Zoya Cherskovsky. Okay, so that's two. And then now... Let's get to her co-author, who also didn't write before October 20. These people were not writers. They didn't write. They didn't. They're not journalists before. And then all of a sudden, the October 7th Hamas attack happens, and New York Times puts them on the front page. Okay, well, it's not the weirdest thing in the world. I remember one day, all of a sudden, Hannah Gadsby was considered the greatest living comedian for two years straight. <laughs> and uh, everybody was like, what are you, crazy? This is the future of comedy. So, I mean, it happens. I, I don't I don't know who that is. Adam, well, come on. I barely know who. I think I saw five seconds of what's her name. You don't know the comedy of an autistic lesbian who looks like Andy Kindler, who was the biggest thing in the world for two years. <laughs> I, I miss a lot of stuff, man. And she, that's definitely one of the things I missed. I did see, I think she did about, the. she was supposed to be curating something at a at an, at a museum. Yeah, pull it, pull and it, she pull she it, came it, out. It. It's un- <clears throat> I don't know who she is either. And I wish her well. Uh, we do have uh, in latest live report, Israel military reports that it was you, the reader, who blew up the hospital in, re- in response to some of that Hasbara that we saw earlier, <laughs> where the IDF has uh, concluded in, in an initial review of the unfortunate incident where the Gaza civilians were trampled. We heard about that earlier. And also uh, California Congresswoman, called for a ceasefire in Gaza and APAC countered by giving her opponent a hundred million dollars. How would Dr. Evil say that APAC's the only foreign lobby that doesn't report where the money's coming from. I'm sure that's not a problem in our constitutional Republic in this country. And we don't need to pay attention to that. Kurt and Jimmy tearing it up right there. They, they get it. That they, so they know that it's a not funny. <laughs> I couldn't resist. I had to. I had to chip in. I had to chip in. Do my part. It's what I can do. LD, who do we have to thank for tonight's uh, fest- festivities? In addition to the Grand Theft World members, and uh, all the other people that make it possible behind the scenes, Cody, LD, Tony, everybody that. Uh, 
participates in making Grand Theft World go around. Yeah. Uh, well, thanks to tonight's Rockfin tippers, we had Risha M. There was five dollars. Said, I just thought I'd thank you for all your hard work. Thank you, Risha. Had Tina Hagen threw in five dollars. Thank you, Tina. Uh, Risha M. Again uh, is asking, how do we, how do we get the evangelicals to wake the hell up? I look at them like the Jim Jones cult these days. I'm one of the very few who can test their Facebook platforms, and it's like no one says shit on the Rothschilds, fo- uh, Rothschilds posts on Facebook. Yeah, the Christian denominations, most of them are, <laughs> you know, hijacked by a, a false narrative associated with the ahistoricities associated with the Bible. So, you know. But I believe if they speak English and they have comprehension skills, they can be saved over time just the conspicuousness of showing the dehumanization of that area will be enough to maybe have them appeal to aspects of the new testament that you know <laughs> can help us understand the universality and the, the shared humanity that we have together that jesus sort of you know insin- not just insinuated but supposedly stated so maybe we can go back to that and not the tangent too much but isn't there a thing where Jesus is supposed to come back? Like he's supposed to return and <laughs> oh, imagine man. his surprise when there's like no Bethlehem. There's like, all, it's all ethnically cleansed. If Jesus were coming back today, he'd be in like Rafa in the tent city, bro. <laughs> yeah, he would like, I, I don't know. And there's Christian Zionists who want to manifest that. There's all this, you know, uh, ancient Probably. time has Bara going on that we need to like, pfft. let's think about today. And tomorrow, because the past is in the past. Keep going, LD. Sorry to, for the interruption. Now, um, so thanks, Risha. We had T Can uh, five dollars says thanks, GTW. I've been listening while working. Jenny Butcher ten dollars uh, for your exhaustion. Uh, thanks, T Can and Jenny. And, Thank you. Uh, Matt. I started at noon sixteen hours ago. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Matt Green, five dollars. Tough out here for us medium smart folk. And uh, yeah, thank you, thank, thank you everybody. everyone. Much appreciated. Hey, to Matt Green, uh, lots of us medium smart folk around. If you just glean ten percent of what we're laying down in each episode, you're getting a world class premier beyond PhD level education on world events such that you cannot get from watching mainstream media. And uh, as Forrest Gump said, that's all I have to say about that. <laughs> LD, I want to thank you for, uh, for making this possible. And Cody, I thank you for showing up tonight and helping us with the stream. Tony, as always, uh, I appreciate the insight and the reflectivity, not reflexivity. We're not talking about Karl Popper. The reflectivity that you can provide and insights that are valuable to the audience on the flip side. So, likewise, I always appreciate the dialectic, helps us elucidate and bring out the best in each other. So, it also helps us focus on our day jobs during the week as we help people solve problems in various ways. yeah. Yeah. So, tonight, to play us out, remember when I said that the IDF fleer footage makes people look like insects, right? That's like, collateral murder part two and you might have said to yourself what was collateral murder part one and that's the video of the reuters journalists being assassinated by helicopters and it was captured on video and it was leaked once upon a time by uh, a lesser known organization called wikileaks and an intrepid journalist called julian assange and it might be one of the reasons, one of the many, many, many reasons that they, them, those who can be easily named, wanted to put him into Belmarsh prison and set an example. So we are going to revisit my commentary on collateral murder, part one, the original footage from, from WikiLeaks in the context of the U.S. military being used to advertise NFL football. And uh, this comes from a pilot episode of a series we did called what you've been missing. And this is circa 2011. So uh, thank you all for tuning in and not dropping out. Here is uh, here are the roots. 
with Masters of War and Collateral Murder to play us out. I edited this, so uh, it's you know it's a piece of history here for us. Peace. Thank you, neighbor. This last clip was sent to me by longtime viewer Travis Doss via email. Quote, Yo, Grove, you need to quit with the negativity and make some inspirational documentaries like the one attached. These guys are heroes. Well, Travis, thank you for sending a little sarcasm to my inbox, and to show you what I mean, I've souped up the video to make these heroes look a little more super. It is in this network's logo and the shield of the National Football League, the colors red, white, and blue, and that is not by mistake. Nothing is more patriotic than a big-time National Football League game and the national anthem playing before it with a flyover overhead. Come, you masters of war. You that built the big gun. You that built the death planes. You that built all of the bombs. You that hide behind walls. Behind the desk says, I just want you to know I can see behind your masks.
conspiracy is the story of history. It's the story of plunderers taking care of people who produce. They claim to take care of them through government, which doesn't give you anything. It doesn't take away first. So it's not creating something out of nothing. It's very real what they're doing. They're taking your rights or taking some people's rights and adding more to someone else's rights. If you haven't heard about our Grand Theft World community membership, here are a few of the things you've been missing. A mobile app where you can access replays of the Grand Theft World podcast and show notes. Access to the Grand Theft World community on Discord, where we crowdsource news and resources, and you can contribute to the show. The opportunity to participate in the Grand Theft World bi-weekly town hall. Exclusive content from Richard Grove, including behind-the-scenes footage and future access to unpublished material. 93 episodes of the Peace Revolution podcast, and the Grand Theft World newsletter delivered straight to your inbox each week. If you want to stay ahead of the great game, visit us at GrandTheftWorld.com, click or tap the button in the top right-hand corner, and join a vibrant community of researchers blazing a new path to truth. We'll see you there. Constellation, big props to Maria Broadcasted, that's where I'd hear And get hooked on the name of Richard Grove What he's saying is hypnotic Synchronicity came out like chronic All in full stride, compadres around all sides Seeking sources to provide solution The heavy-handed knowledge is Willie saying The peace revolution never known I was missing the blessing The heaviest session recorded and revealed The ultimate history lesson in this quest And I'm a Midwestern who's rocking it dope Subscribe to media produced by tragedy and hope and if you didn't know the gift and here's what you've been missing and listening is where conviction is revealed in descriptions in a brain model don't come all hollow but full throttle and dive in the deep end so history doesn't repeat and make it complete catch grant that world every week with richard and tony chop it up with the homies and i ain't talking about that public school baloney in a sec you should know me quoting gotta win the flow that i'm growing and lb's bearded is showing the time capsule stack of stats is open so spread it around, the show is ready to pounce Audience that abounds, seeking out what's profound I know it is challenging fallacies in the balance When a forensic story in it, boring men while exhorting in Examination, contemplation, meditation, revelation, celebration Destinations planned, targets arrived Autonomy crew of souls that survive Broke free from the nine to five and we doing it live Hey, with hope in our flow, where consciousness grows As opposed to, you don't have to think about it dude Cause it's a comedy show that be bombing truth woe Trying to make uncommon truths be more commonly known That it's a grand theft world that I'm living in Ain't no reptilian skin, just some normal humans who love to sin From their banking powers they aim to win Deceive and betray all men, they could make it everyone slaves at them It's a grand theft world that I'm hearing at This guy's like a pyramid, but those tuning in they be feeling that Revealing that, things ain't what they seem so I'm fighting back And digging jack, obtaining knowledge, wisdom and art Artifacts, 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 yeah, neglected aspect, that's what they lack, yo, trivium course, it'll deal with that, huh, be a rebel, bring the logic back, cause it's a grand theft world that they rolling out, got the growth model out, tracing Rockefeller dollars, straight to clouds, SEC connections are hard to doubt, but most go the common route, walking with their head in the shroud, yo, it's a grand theft world that I'm peering at, disguised like a pyramid, but those tuning in, they be feeling that, revealing that, things ain't what they seem, so I'm fighting back, and digging jack, obtaining knowledge, wisdom, and artifacts, artifacts, you should know, 
This is not a video game. This isn't Grand Theft Auto, folks. This isn't a video game. This is Grand Theft World. All right, LD. It's a Grand Theft World that I'm peering at in the sky like a pyramid. For those tuning in, they'd be feeling it. Revealing that things ain't what they seem, so I'm fighting back and digging Jack, obtaining out of wisdom and artifacts. If you need a single location to get cutting edge information and keep up with the rapidly changing world around us, tune into Grand Theft World, where a forensic historian and a logic professor break down the week's news in depth and in context. There's a ton more there, so go check it out. And don't forget to get your Freedom Vault on the homepage.